devastating effects of the pandemic. Corruption across national borders has negatively impacted the peace, stability, and growth of many developing economies. It has deprived national governments of resources needed to upgrade livelihoods and alleviate poverty. This has also contributed to the rise of irregular migration with far-reaching implications for the countries of origin, destination, as well as the host countries. Nigeria therefore underscores the need for solidarity and synergy among member states to stem the tide of illicit financial flows and ensure the unconditional repatriation of proceeds of corruption to countries of origin. Mr. President, the reason for the Durban Declaration and Program of Action to vigorously combat racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance has sadly not been achieved 20 years after this important milestone. It is therefore imperative for states and other stakeholders to demonstrate real commitment to the effective and comprehensive impl implementation of this important document as a strident reminder of our commitment to the global fight against racism and racial discrimination, including the spread of fake news, hate speech, and incitement to hatred and violence. Nigeria strongly condemns all forms of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, and reaffirms its unequivocal commitment to the effective implementation of the Durban Declaration. Mr. President, I also wish to take this opportunity to reiterate Nigeria's commitment to the promotion and protection of human rights and fundamental freedoms in accordance with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The promotion and protection of human rights are key elements in the march to sustainable peace and security, as well as the attainment of the Sustainable Development Goals. Nigeria will continue to uphold the tenets of democracy and the principles of the rule of law and good governance. Mr. President, as I conclude, may I also underscore the importance of avoiding the politicization of human rights issues and the doublespeak that's found often in the international human rights system and their advocacy. They are not synonymous with the ethos of multilateralism, and they are largely counterproductive to the time-honored principles of human rights. We remain assiduously committed to sincere international cooperation and respect to the sovereign equality of all nations as enshrined in the United Nations Charter. Nigeria will continue to deepen its commitment to multilateralism and promises to remain seized with the promotion and protection of human rights across the globe, particularly in its engagement with the Human Rights Council. I thank you for your kind attention. Muchas gracias. Um, we have now in the list the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic that was here just minutes ago. Um, so we will move to... Could I ask, please, if the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Czech Republic I don't see him, so agora então gostaria de dar a palavra a sua excelência a senhora just a moment please. um momento por favor Então, gostaria da palavra, Sua Excelência, a senhora Adalisa Albertina Xavier Reis Magno, Ministra de Assuntos Estrangeiros e Cooperação do Timor-Leste. Bem-vinda. Tem a palavra, senhora. Desculpe, o microfone, por favor. Sua Excelência, Presidente do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, Dr. Frederico Vilegas, distintos colegas e embaixadores, minhas senhoras e meus senhores. 
e com particular honra que participo no segmento do alto nível da 49ª Sessão do Conselho de Direitos Humanos, em nome da República Democrática de Timor-Leste e desejo desde já congratular o Sr. Embaixador Frederico Villegas pela recente eleição como presidente deste Conselho. Antes de iniciar a minha intervenção, manifesto a profunda preocupação e tristeza que Timor-Leste sente ao acompanhar a situação atual na Ucrânia. Como uma jovem democracia que experienciou e testemunhou as consequências da ocupação, Timor-Leste reconhece que a guerra não traz benefícios, pelo que encoraja todas as partes do conflito a estabelecer um diálogo diplomático, de forma a que seja implementado um cessar-fogo imediato. Durante este difícil período, apelamos ao respeito pelos direitos humanos e pelo direito internacional humanitário. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, a Constituição da República Democrática de Timor-Leste, que assinala os 20 anos de existência no próximo dia 20 de maio, reflete a importância e a singularidade da proteção dos direitos humanos. Relembro também que, durante a luta pela independência, o povo timorense experienciou graves violações dos direitos humanos, pelo que foi irrefutável o apoio da comunidade internacional. É assim imperioso sublinhar a atenção e o trabalho da Comissão para a Situação dos Direitos Humanos de Timor-Leste desde 1992 até 2005. Deste modo, a Constituição, as leis, as políticas e a política externa do meu país refletam toda a nossa história sem nunca descurar a essência dos direitos humanos e das liberdades liberdades fundamentais. Timor-Leste tornou-se um exemplo de um país que enfrentou com sucesso os obstáculos de transição à paz e à justiça, preservando o respeito inabalável pelos direitos humanos. Os direitos humanos, a paz, a segurança e o desenvolvimento estão profundamente interligados e reforçam-se mutuamente. Como o defensor do ODS-16, Timor-Leste está focado na contribuição para a promoção da paz sustentável e a concretização da Agenda 2030. De igual modo, tenho, tenho ainda a honra de salientar a mais recente participação do meu país no terceiro ciclo do Mecanismo da Revisão Periódica Universal em janeiro de 2022, como exemplo do nosso compromisso para com os mecanismos de direitos humanos. Minhas senhores e meus senhores, Timor-Leste reconhece que não podemos falar de direitos humanos sem colocar especial ênfase nos direitos humanos das mulheres. Entre os esforços do, do governo na promoção da agenda da igualdade de gênero, Destaco a existência da Secretaria de Estado para a Igualdade e Inclusão e a adoção de várias políticas, tais como o Plano de Ação Nacional sobre Mulheres, Paz e Segurança e o Plano de Ação Nacional sobre Violência Baseada no Gênero. Importa sublinhar ainda que as mulheres representam 40% da composição do Parlamento Nacional de Timor-Leste no que respeita também às prioridades da agenda nacional, importa evidenciar os esforços nacionais e progressivos para um sistema de proteção infantil que garanta o respeito dos direitos das crianças e aumente a sua participação em todos os aspectos da sociedade. No quadro do cumprimento deste desiderato, destacam-se os programas de promoção e facilitação do acesso ao registro de nascimento, o acesso à educação e a combate à violência contra crianças, incluindo a elaboração do Código da Criança que proíbe castigos corporais. De uma forma complementar, em 2021, 
Timor-Leste criou o Instituto de Defesa dos Direitos da Criança, que sucedeu à Comissão Nacional dos Direitos da Criança. No mesmo ano, Timor-Leste endossou a declaração da Escola Segura, que visa proteger a educação em conflitos armados. Na resposta dada a alterações climáticas, Timor-Leste está empenhado em integrar os direitos humanos nas leis e políticas ambientais, bem como envolver a sociedade civil nos processos de tomada de decisões ambientais, com o objetivo de construir resiliência a partir dos efeitos catastróficos das mudanças climáticas. Minhas senhoras e meus senhores, não poderia deixar de realçar a temática da pandemia da Covid-19, que evidenciou a fragilidade de três direitos básicos, o direito à vida, o direito à saúde e o direito à liberdade de circulação. Permitam-me vangloriar os esforços do governo de Timor-Leste que, que, com os vários parceiros, implementou medidas de combate à pandemia da Covid-19, observando sempre os princípios da necessidade, proporcionalidade e não discriminação. De igual modo, o Plano de Recuperação Econômica de Timor-Leste, adotado em 2020, contém uma estratégia que dá prioridade às pessoas e ao respeito pelos direitos humanos. À luz do exposto, é possível concluir a importância da solidariedade internacional nesses momentos de fragilidade. 20 anos após a restauração da sua independência, Timor-Leste cresceu e consolidou-se com um país firmemente empenhado na promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos. E, portanto, com a confiança de poder servir e contribuir para o trabalho do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, que Timor-Leste se candidata a membro do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos para o período de 2024-2026. Ciente dos desafios, o meu país tem um forte compromisso com a promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos e com um papel fundamental que o multilateralismo desempenha. Caso Timor-Leste seja eleito pela primeira vez como membro, esta eleição irá contribuir de uma forma distinta para o trabalho do Conselho de Direitos Humanos, assim como reforçar a visão do Conselho de ser um órgão representativo da diversidade dos países que o compõem. Timor-Leste conta com o vosso apoio. Obrigada. Muito obrigado, Excelência. And now I give the floor to the distinguished Foreign Minister of uh, the Czech Republic. I invite him to address the Council. His Excellency, Mr. Jan Lipatsky. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor to address the Human Rights Council for me for the first time. Priorities of the new Czech government indisputably lie on the side of the protection and promotion of human rights, both at home and worldwide. I would like to express special thanks for the work carried out by High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet and her office. The Czech Republic has and always will support her independence and the comprehensive human rights mandate. I wish to reaffirm that the Czech Republic will continue to provide voluntary financial contributions to the High Commissioner Office, and I hope that others will follow suit. Mr. President, we attach great importance to supporting adequate and timely responses to human rights violations and abuses wherever they occur. We believe that it is the core business of the Council. All country situations should be treated on equal footing without discrimination. Given the extraordinary circumstances, allow me to address the human rights situation of our utmost concern in Ukraine. 
Slava Ukraini! Glory to Ukraine! Can be heard these days all over the civilized world that is witnessing an unprovoked, unprecedented military aggression of Russia against Ukraine. A flagrant violation of international law and the core principles of the international rule-based global security. We all admire the impressive bravery of the Ukraine people fighting back against Putin, Putin's Russia. Ukraines are not and should not be alone. The Czech Republic and other countries are stepping up their support to Ukraine. Drastic times call for drastic measures and concrete deeds and actions. Political statements are no longer enough. Russia and Belarus have been systematically fighting all people who made a choice of liberty, dignity, and democracy. This is true for inside their own countries, as well as for the so-called close neighborhood. The Czech Republic has always advocated for democracy and expressed support and solidarity with people fighting for it. Now, more than even before, we don't stop repeating that we are standing firmly by the Ukraine people. We deplore loss of human lives, and we are denouncing all human rights violations on the Ukraine territory by the Russian military. According to the latest figures from the Ukraine Ministry of Health, Russian occupation forces killed 352 civilians, including 14 children. Conducting an offensive operation in Ukraine, the Russian occupiers use methods of combat prohibited by international human, humanitarian law, such as wearing uniforms of the Ukraine military police, stealing ambulances and police cars, or using children and women as a human shields. In many cities and towns, apartment buildings and infrastructure facilities have been massively damaged by occupiers shelling. In places like Kyiv, Kharkiv and elsewhere in Ukraine, every night people sleep in shelters, women give birth in metro stations, while trying to stay safe from Russian bombs and rockets. Leaders, their associates and military commanders of Russia and its closest ally and collaborators, Belarus, must be Account, held accountable. Vladimir Putin and Alexander Lukashenko will lose this war. We hope that the Russian and Belarusian government will be then once again held, once again be led by people who believe in democracy and human rights. Mr. President, the Czech Republic is grateful to you and the whole Bureau for steering the Council towards a prompt and rightful reaction to that full-scale horrifying assault of Russia on Ukraine. We call on Russia to end the unjustified attack, end the violence, withdraw its forces from Ukraine, and start respecting international law and human rights law. With that in mind, the Czech Republic has supported the Ukraine initiative to call an urgent debate on Russia attack on Ukraine and establish an independent international commission of inquiry to investigate all alleged violations and abuses of human rights. While we are mostly preoccupied with the situation in Ukraine, we must also not forget our human rights situation of concern, of concern around the world. In China, fundamental freedoms such as freedom of expression and freedom of religion or belief are being severely restricted. We are seriously concerned about the human rights violation against minorities, especially in Xinjiang, Tibet, and in Mongolia. We urge the Chinese authorities to close down the political education camps, and we call for an immediate release of all human rights defenders, journalists, and lawyers who have been detained for exercising their basic rights. In Cuba, Hundreds of people are being detained simply for expressing themselves freely. Many of them have already been harshly sentenced. Such actions by Cuban government to repress, punish, and intimidate all forms of dissent and public criticism are unacceptable. 
We are also seriously concerned about the situation in Venezuela, Myanmar, and Afghanistan. The Human Rights Council must continue addressing these situations. Ladies and gentlemen, let us never forget why we are here. Not for procedures, not for speeches. We are here to try our best and help people in this world who were not fortunate enough. Whose human rights are violated? Whose human rights we have to fight for? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Y ahora tengo el honor de darle la palabra a Su Excelencia Mario Adolfo Bucaro Flores, Ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de la República de Guatemala. Tiene la palabra. Señor Presidente, es un gran honor dirigirme al Consejo de Derechos Humanos en nombre del doctor Alejandro Yamatei, Presidente de la República de Guatemala y al haber sido nombrado recientemente como Ministro de Relaciones Exteriores. Expreso mi satisfacción por la elección del embajador Federico Villegas como presidente de este Consejo y ofrezco nuestro restricto apoyo a las labores que dirige. La Constitución Política de la República de Guatemala es categórica en establecer que el Estado garantiza y protege la vida. El gobierno asume esa protección y asegura la promoción plena y la vigencia y la defensa de los derechos humanos para que sea la guía en la toma de decisiones en los distintos ámbitos de la acción pública. Han transcurrido dos años desde la toma de posesión del doctor Alejandro Yamatei y me complace compartir con ustedes los logros que hemos alcanzado a pesar de los distintos desafíos estructurales que han sido causados por esta terrible pandemia del COVID-19, así como todo lo que tenemos planificado para este año 2022. Se han orientado esfuerzos tan importantes en el diseño y respuesta a las necesidades de nuestra población para generar el desarrollo en nuestras comunidades, particularmente en los sectores más vulnerables de nuestro país, lo cual incluye a mujeres, niños, niñas, jóvenes, personas de edad y poblaciones indígenas y migrantes que son parte importante de nuestra sociedad. La migración es un derecho, para Guatemala es una prioridad, especialmente la atención integral y el fenómeno migratorio que tiene especiales consecuencias que necesitan políticas especiales para atender esas causas que generan la migración irregular, incluyendo en ese sentido el Plan de Desarrollo Integral para El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras y el sureste de México. Guatemala es un país de origen, tránsito, destino y también de retorno, pero nuestros principios siempre han estado enfocados en el pleno respeto a los derechos humanos y especialmente a la de nuestros migrantes. Independientemente de la condición migratoria que tengan, y es por ello que hemos ampliado el fortalecimiento de nuestros servicios consulares e identificado vías regulares de migración, programas de trabajo temporales que brindan esperanza a nuestros connacionales y en especial a muchos hermanos que también migran por nuestro paso por Guatemala. Vivir en armonía e igualdad es indispensable para nuestro gobierno, el cual promueve los derechos y el desarrollo de los pueblos indígenas con un enfoque multicultural, intercultural y en el espíritu que ha llevado a cabo a través de los distintos procesos de capacitación, participación ciudadana y, por supuesto, respetando los saberes ancestrales y los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y, en especial, nuestra identidad cultural y la cosmovisión maya. Hacemos un llamado a todos los estados a comprometerse con la plena implementación de la Declaración de Naciones Unidas sobre los derechos humanos de los pueblos indígenas, especialmente con la resolución correspondiente ante este Consejo. Continuaremos trabajando e impulsando medidas para potenciar su participación en el sistema de Naciones Unidas y que sus derechos sean reconocidos universalmente. Asimismo, Guatemala se congratula por la creación del Foro Permanente sobre los Afrodescendientes y reitera su apoyo a la necesidad de elaborar una declaración universal que promueva el pleno respeto de los derechos humanos. Señor Presidente, las terribles consecuencias derivadas de la pandemia del COVID-19 nos han presentado nuevos desafíos. La cooperación y la solidaridad internacional son imprescindibles para derrotar esta pandemia y así contrarrestar el riesgo de perder décadas de avance 
en materia de desarrollo humano y para que nadie se quede atrás. Los retos son oportunidades para crecer. Seguimos luchando y nos sentimos alentados cuando el apoyo de la comun comunidad internacional se manifiesta. Guatemala agradece a todos los países amigos que han brindado asistencia incondicional para vacunar y atender a nuestra población. Por esa razón, nuestro país siempre ha manifestado una vocación hacia el multilateralismo como uno de los ejes centrales del cambio como símbolo del desarrollo. Guatemala no se detiene y hemos impulsado un plan nacional de reactivación económica el cual busca fomentar la inversión extranjera y el comercio exterior, en especial la atracción de turismo hacia nuestro país. Señor Presidente, Guatemala concede gran importancia al fortalecimiento del Estado de Derecho. El gobierno es respetuoso del orden jurídico nacional e internacional, garantizando la separación y la independencia de los poderes del Estado. Asimismo, mi país mantiene y respeta sus compromisos como miembro fundador de las Naciones Unidas y plenamente comprometida con el fortalecimiento de los órganos que componen este sistema tan importante y continuará trabajando en una política abierta de cooperación con los mecanismos de este Consejo y el sistema interamericano. Quiero destacar también que Guatemala aprecia la colaboración y el acompañamiento recibido por la Alta Comisionada de Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos. La oficina fue establecida en el país hace 17 años a solicitud de nuestro Estado con el propósito de fortalecer la institucionalidad nacional. Señoras y señores, no puedo dejar de mencionar la situación que hoy vive el país hermano de Ucrania. El gobierno de Guatemala condena enérgicamente el reconocimiento unilateral por parte de Rusia a las llamadas repúblicas separatistas de Ucrania, siendo una acción que viola los principios del derecho internacional y la integridad de Ucrania, así como el uso de la fuerza militar en territorio ucraniano. Guatemala, como un país de vocación de paz y respetuosa al derecho internacional, hace un llamado para privilegiar la diplomacia, para evitar una escalada del conflicto que amenace el resguardo y el mantenimiento de la paz y la seguridad internacional. En este particular, quiero destacar que las poblaciones involucradas se han visto afectadas por esta escalada bélica. Insistimos en la importancia de buscar una salida pacífica a esta terrible crisis que debe resolverse bajo el respeto de la soberanía, la integridad territorial y los derechos humanos y la seguridad de todos los países. Finalizo reiterando, para Guatemala la prevención es esencial para evitar la violación de los derechos humanos que en cualquier parte del mundo puedan estar siendo afectados y así lograr que el multilateralismo sea eficiente, relevante y necesario a través de los mecanismos de Naciones Unidas, valorando el reconocimiento y los retos que tenemos por delante. La cooperación, especialmente la unidad de nuestros países, de los Estados miembros, permitirá que podamos superar los nuevos retos que tenemos en este siglo XXI. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Su Excelencia. Now I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. G. L. Beris, Minister for Foreign Relations of Sri Lanka, to address the Council. Mr. President, Sri Lanka is an active participant in the multilateral framework to realize the promotion and protection of human rights. Fundamental rights are embodied in our Constitution, progressively advanced through our democratically elected organs of government and enforced through our independent judiciary. Despite multiple challenges we have faced from terrorism, we have restored peace, security, and the rule of law throughout our country. Our democratic traditions and independent institutions ensure free and fair elections at regular intervals through universal adult franchise. We will further advance the considerable progress we have made in post-conflict recovery and healing. For this, Mr. President, we have put in place domestic institutions for reconciliation, accountability, and social justice. Through this council, we have completed three mutually beneficial universal periodic reviews, engaged in constructive dialogue 
with the treaty bodies, welcomed special procedures mandate holders, and held frank and open discussions with domestic and international interlocutors. We have benefited from the considerable expertise available with the United Nations on human rights, including through its technical cooperation and capacity building programs. Through the UN country team, we value the ongoing support to our domestic processes on reconciliation and achievement of sustainable development goals. Through this cooperative interaction, and in line with our domestic framework and international obligations, we continue to ensure the promotion and protection of human rights and social justice for all our citizens, irrespective of ethnic and religious identity and political affiliation. Mr. President, despite the economic setbacks due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we continue to ensure our people's right to development. Sri Lanka has improved its global rank by seven positions according to the latest SDG report. We appreciate the contribution made by our civil society partners through their extensive grassroots level outreach and undoubted expertise. As a developing member state of the international community, we brace ourselves to face the further adverse economic consequences of crises such as the pandemic and the unraveling conflict in Europe, which will impact on our efforts to achieve the sustainable development goals. Mr. President, we are today in a period of review of the work of the Council. We reflect on whether the Council has been successful in overcoming the credibility gap that led to the downfall of its predecessor commission. The multilateral architecture for the implementation of human rights was progressively developed in the last decades. Consensus was forged on key principles which we consider sacrosanct, such as that the promotion and protection of human rights should be guided by the principles of impartiality, objectivity, and non-selectivity based on the sovereign equality of member states. UNGA Resolution 60 stroke 251 and HRC Resolutions 5 stroke 1 and 5 stroke 2 also decided that the working methods of the Council shall be transparent, fair and impartial and shall enable genuine dialogue. In March 2021, the Council voted on Resolution 46 stroke 1, which was tabled without the consent of Sri Lanka as a country concerned. The consideration of this matter polarized and politicized this forum in a startling departure from the mandate which the UN General Assembly originally conferred on this Council. Operative Para 6 of this resolution refers to a so-called evidence gathering mechanism, a measure that was strongly opposed by a number of countries. Such initiatives create disharmony both in the domestic and in the international arenas. It creates obstacles to reconciliation efforts, breeds hatred by reopening past wounds, and polarizes society. Mr. President, member states have mandated this council and its secretariat with a truly extensive array of helpful working methods to assist governments in the promotion and protection of human rights. Sri Lanka has participated actively and constructively in those aspects of the Council's work that have been productive and beneficial and which have helped to ensure that our people live safer, longer, and more dignified lives. We reject, however, those that are punitive, politicized, divisive, unhelpful, and initiated due to extraneous reasons. Mr. President, as, is, as elsewhere in the world, we endeavor to strike a just balance between human rights and national security when dealing with terrorism. Sri Lanka is convinced that counterterrorism legislation must secure and protect the rights of persons subject to investigation, detention, and trial, and must not restrict democratic freedoms such as the freedom of expression. With these objectives in view, I recently presented a bill in the Parliament of Sri Lanka 
which is an initial step in amending the Prevention of Terrorism Act, uh, 43 years after it was promulgated, we take particular objection to the use of voluntary funding, which has the necessary consequence of undermining objectivity and detachment. Against this background, Sri Lanka once again reiterates its view that the evidence gathering mechanism established under Operative Para 6 of Resolution 46 Stroke 1 is unhelpful to the people of Sri Lanka, will polarize Sri Lankan society and adversely affect economic development, peace and harmony in my country at a challenging time. It is an unproductive drain on member state resources at a time of severe financial shortfalls across the entire multilateral system, including the High Commissioner's Office. Mr. President, on the 4th of March, the Council will meet in an interactive dialogue on Sri Lanka. I look forward to sharing with you some thoughts on the written update on my country, Sri Lanka. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Your Excellency. E agora, tenho a honra de dar a palavra à Senhora Esmeralda Mendonça, Secretária de Estado para as Relações Exteriores da República de Angola. Tenha a palavra, Senhor. Senhor Presidente, Excelências e Ilustres Representantes dos Estados-Membros, é com elevada honra e privilégio que participo neste debate de alto nível dada a importância que a República de Angola atribui aos trabalhos do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, bem como o reconhecimento, a promoção e a proteção destes direitos e princípios a nível global. Excelências, em conformidade com a Declaração Universal dos Direitos Humanos, a Carta Africana dos Direitos Humanos e dos Povos, a Constituição da República de Angola, promove e de defende em primeira instância os direitos e as liberdades fundamentais, a consolidação do Estado Democrático de Direito, a paz e o desenvolvimento. No, no âmbito do dos esforços contínuos para a salvaguarda destes princípios, o governo angolano tem dirigido um programa de reforma da justiça que desencadeou o processo de revisão parcial da Constituição, e assinalou algumas alterações com vista a fortalecer o Estado democrático e de direito, reforçar os princípios da separação de poderes e interdependência de funções entre os órgãos de soberania e permitir o respeito pelos direitos fundamentais, como o do sufrágio universal direto, livre, igualitário e secreto. Esta medida vem de forma significativa a reforçar o sistema judicial angolano e responder melhor à necessidade de justiça social, construção de um espaço democrático aberto e participativo para todos os cidadãos, numa altura em que o país se prepara para acolher as quartas eleições gerais, pela primeira vez contarão com a participação dos angolanos residentes na diáspora. O processo vai igualmente permitir que estes cidadãos exerçam de forma aberta os seus direitos. Senhor Presidente, no quadro dos direitos humanos, importa-nos salientar que Angola lançou, em abril de 2020, a sua Estratégia Nacional dos Direitos Humanos 2020-2022, assim como o Plano de Ação nacional, tendo a questão dos direitos humanos sido elevada à categoria de segurança nacional. Apraz-nos sublinhar que, tendo em vista o sucesso da Estratégia Nacional dos Direitos Humanos, o Executivo tem cooperado com a sociedade civil, o que, o que resultou no aumento de organizações não governamentais viradas para a matéria tendo passado de 300 para 800 nos últimos cinco anos. É com agrado que partilhamos aqui que em menos de dois anos de vigência da estratégia foram implementadas mais de 80% das ações programadas no mesmo plano para o presente período que permitiu a criação de 171 comitês locais de direitos humanos 
responsáveis pela, proteção, pela promoção, proteção e defesa dos direitos humanos que foram enquadrados nas diversas províncias, municípios e comunas do país. Em conformidade com a, o Programa Mundial para a Educação de Direitos Humanos das Nações Unidas, o Executivo tem levado a cabo uma estratégia nacional pelo meio da qual assinou com 15 universidades do país protocolos para o ensino dessas matérias nas universidades e outras esferas da vida nacional. Angola, neste campo, lançou recentemente o Prémio Nacional de Direitos Humanos que visa reconhecer as iniciativas de relevo de pessoas singulares ou coletivas que se tenham destacado na promoção, proteção e defesa dos direitos humanos por forma a melhor sensibilizar a sociedade sobre a importância deste tema e no âmbito do qual se enquadra a iniciativa presidencial denominada Plano de Reconciliação em Memória das Vítimas dos Conflitos. De, de, de Sua Excelência João Manuel Gonçalves Lourenço, Presidente da República, que inclui um pedido público de desculpas e de perdão à nação pelos trágicos acontecimentos que enlutaram milhares de angolanos no passado. O Executivo angolano tem igualmente orientado outras ações no âmbito da igualdade de género, inclusão dos grupos vulneráveis no, no sistema de ensino, por forma a pôr fim às taxas de abandono escolar e adotado políticas de municipalização dos serviços de saúde com reforço na, constru na construção de centros de saúde, hospitais e outras unidades sanitárias. Senhor Presidente, a consolidação dos direitos económicos, sociais e culturais é uma das prioridades do governo angolano e, neste âmbito, o nosso país tem promovido vários programas com vista a oferecer maior dignidade às famílias e às suas populações e prevenir situações de vulnerabilidade, permitindo a redução da taxa de pobreza, com maior destaque para o Programa de Fortalecimento de Proteção Social de Transferências Sociais Monetárias, denominado CUENDA. Este programa visa criar políticas de apoio às famílias em situação de pobreza ou vulnerabilidade no país por meio de transferências monetárias, inclusão produtiva e apoio às iniciativas económicas das famílias residentes nos municípios, que, conjugado com o Plano Integrado de Intervenção nos Municípios, denominado PIM, centrado na concretização de ações e programas de desenvolvimento integrado, dão resposta aos desafios causados, particularmente com a pandemia da Covid-19. Senhor Presidente, Finalizamos reiterando o compromisso de Angola com o Conselho de Direitos Humanos e o Alto Comissário de, Comissariado das Nações Unidas para os Direitos Humanos, assim como a Agenda do Desenvolvimento 2030. Muito obrigada. Muito obrigado, Sua Excelência. Uh, e agora lhe dou a palavra à Sua Excelência. El señor Faisal Megdad, ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de la República Árabe Siria. Tiene la palabra. A seguir, Raíz Mejlis Hukulansá, a Seidat Wassada. Tuminu el Jumuría al Arabía Suria bil Hiwar el Banna, el Ladi Ahtarimu, Jususiyat el Dual o el Mujtamaat. وتنوعها الثقافي والحضاري وتؤكد على أهمية اطلاع مجلس حقوق الإنسان للدور الذي توافقت عليه الدول الأعضاء في الأمم المتحدة عند إنشاء هذا المجلس القائم على الحوار البناء في تناول حقوق الإنسان بوصفها منظومة حقوق مترابطة وغير قابلة للتجزئة في كافة الدول دون تمييز وعلى التعاون التقني لمساعدة الدول على بناء قدراتها وفقا لأولوياتها الوطنية 
ومن المثير للأسف أننا لا نزال نشهد اضطرارا إصرارا من الدول الغربية على استغلال المجلس وآلياته لفرض معاييرها المزدوجة في التعامل مع حقوق الإنسان وعلى اتهام الدول ووصمها بانتهاك حقوق الإنسان واتخاذ تلك الاتهامات ذريعة للتدخل في شؤونها الداخلية وتؤكد القرارات المسيسة التي تستهدف سوريا بذريعة حقوق الإنسان أن الهدف الحقيقي منها هو توفير الغطاء للدول التي تمارس العدوان والاحتلال وتدعم الإرهاب وتستخدمه ضد الدولة السورية وللتذكير فأن بريطانيا التي تقود المبادرات حول سوريا في هذا المجال أنفقت أربع مليارات دولار على حملات التضليل الإعلامي الذي يستهدف سوريا وفقا لما كشفت عنه وسائل الإعلام البريطانية ومن هنا فإننا نأمل بأن يعيد المجلس النظر في هذه الممارسات وبأن ينهي عمل الآليات المسيسة التي أنشأها دون موافقة الدول المعنية والتي تعمل بولاية شبه مفتوحة تنفيذا لقرارات مسيسة وغير توافقية يتم تمريرها في المجلس استنادا إلى حملات من التضليل الممنهج ضد سوريا فالجمهورية العربية السورية تواجه منذ عام 2011 حرب إرهاب ممنهج تم توظيفه واستخدامه من الخارج للنيل من استقرارها ووحدة وسلامة أراضيها واحتلال أجنبي واحتلال أجنبي لأجزاء من ترابها الوطني وفي ظل الاحتلال التركي والأمريكي تواصل المجموعات الإرهابية المسلحة وميليشيات قسد الانفصالية ارتكاب جرائم وانتهاكات جسيمة وممنهجة لحقوق الإنسان خدمة لمصالح مشغليها وداعمها ناهيك عن ممارسات الاحتلال التركي وتنفيذه لسياسة تتريك وتغيير ديموغرافي ممنهج على الأراضي السورية واستخدامه للمياه كسلاح وأداة للابتزاز السياسي والعقاب الجماعي للسكان وقد شكلت هذه التحديات ولا تزال تداعيات جسيمة على حقوق الإنسان في سوريا وهي تداعيات يزيد من وطأتها فرض الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية والاتحاد الأوروبي تدابير قسرية أو حادية الجانب على الشعب السوري وسرقة المياه والموارد الطبيعية والاقتصادية لحرمان الشعب السوري من ثرواته الوطنية وقد أدى تشديد وتوسيع نطاق التدابير القسرية الأحادية لسيما خلال جائحة كوفيد-19 إلى استخدام المواطن السوري في لقمة عيشه وانتهاك حقوقه الأساسية وفي مقدمتها حقه في الحياة والصحة والغذاء والتعليم والتنمية وحول وحول تلك التدابير غير الأخلاقية إلى إرهاب اقتصادي يسعى لإطالة أمد الأزمة وعرقلة جهود التعافي وإعادة الأمار ومنع عودة المهجرين إلى وطنهم وديارهم في ظل هذه التحديات الجسيمة تستمر الدولة السورية في تحمل مسؤولياتها وواجباتها للحفاظ على السيادة الوطنية وتحرير الأرض السورية من الاحتلال الأجنبي ومكافحة الجماعات الإرهابية المسلحة والحفاظ على أمن وحياة مواطنيها وتلبية احتياجاتهم الأساسية وتأكيدا لحرصها على الوفاء بالتزاماتها الدولية وإيمانها بالتعاون الدولي استنادا لميثاق الأمم المتحدة أنجزت الجمهورية العربية السورية مؤخرا مناقشة تقريرها الوطني الثالث في إطار آلية المراجعة الدولية الشاملة وتعكف حاليا على النظر في التوصيات التي وجهت إليها وقد سلط تقريرها الوطني الضوء على جهود الدولة السورية ضمن الإمكانيات المتاحة في مجال إعادة تأهيل المناطق المحررة من الإرهاب وحماية حقوق مواطنيها وتلبية احتياجاتهم الأساسية والتصدي لجائحة كوفيد-19 وتحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة وتأمين بنية تمكن المهجرين السوريين من العودة بشكل طوعي وكريم إلى وطنهم وديارهم ويسوفون أن هذه الجهود لا تزال تواجه بمواقف تقدم الأجندات السياسية على الاعتبارات الإنسانية وتسعى لخلق أوضاع معيشية ضاغطة على السوريين من خلال حصار اقتصادي يمنع عنهم الغذاء والدواء 
وموارد النفط والطاقة وفرض مشروطية سياسية على الوكالات الإنسانية التابعة للأمم المتحدة وعرقل التعاونية مع الدولة السورية الرامية للتغلب على التبعات الاقتصادية والمعيشية للأزمة والانتقال من الإغاثة إلى التنمية السيد الرئيس إن سوريا عازمة على تطهير أراضيها من بقايا الإرهاب ومن الاحتلال الأجنبي ومواجهة أجندات وممارسات ميليشيات قصد الانفصالية التي تهدد بدعم سياسي وعسكري أمريكي وحدة سوريا أرضا وشعبا وهي مستمرة في الوقت نفسه في مسار المصالحات والتسويات الذي يحقق تقدما ملحوظا في مناطق مختلفة من سوريا بفضل 21 مرسوم عفو أصدرها السيد الرئيس بشار الأسد رئيس الجمهورية العربية السورية منذ عام 2011 وتاحت للآلاف من السوريين الاستفادة منها والعودة إلى ممارسة حياتهم الطبيعية وهي مستمرة في اتخاذ التدابير اللازمة لتسهيل عودة المهجرين إلى بلدهم تنفيذا لمخرجات مؤتمر عودة اللاجئين واجتماعات المتابعة التي عقدت بدمشق كما أن سوريا ملتزمة بعملية سياسية يقودها ويملكها السوريون بتسهيل من الأمم المتحدة ودون تدخل خارجي أو شروط مسبقة وفي ظل الاستعدادات الجارية لعقد الجولة السابعة من الاجتماعات التي ستعقد للجنة الدستورية في جنيف فإنني أجدد التأكيد بأن اللجنة هي سيدة نفسها وصاحبة القرار الحصري بتقرير مسار عملها والنتائج التي يمكن أن تخلص إليها وبأن نجاحها يتطلب الالتزام بمرجعياتها وبعدم التدخل الخارجي في شؤونها من قبل أي طرف كان واحترام الحق الحصري للشعب السوري في تقرير مستقبل بلده ختاما تؤكد الجمهورية العربية السورية حقها الثابت في استرجاع الجولان السوري المحتل ورفضها القاطع للإجراءات الوحادية التي تتخذها القوى, القوى القائمة بالاحتلال إسرائيل لتكريس احتلالها وتصعيد ممارساتها الاستيطانية وتؤكد سوريا أن ممارسات الاحتلال وإجراءاته الأحادية لاغية باطلة ولا أثر قانونيا لها باعتبارها انتهاكات لقرارات الأمم المتحدة بما فيها قرار مجلس الأمن رقم 497 لعام 1981 وتجدد سوريا إدانتها للانتهاكات الجسيمة والممنهج لحقوق الإنسان التي ترتكبها قوات الاحتلال الإسرائيلي وقطعان المستوطنين الإسرائيليين في الأراضي الفلسطينية المحتلة بما فيها القدس الشرقية وفي الجولان السوري المحتل ولممارساتها العنصرية التي تنتهك قرارات الأمم المتحدة بما فيها قرار مجلس حقوق الإنسان وتؤكد دعمها الثابت لحق الشعب الفلسطيني في إقامة دولته المستقلة وعاصمته القدس على حدود الرابع من حزيران لعام 1967 وضمان حق اللاجئين بالعودة تنفيذا لقرارات الأمم المتحدة ذات الصلة ودعمها لتحرير ما تبقى من أراض لبنانية محتلة وشكرا E agora tenho a honra de dar a palavra à senhora Helena Mateus Quida, ministra da Justiça Constitucional e Assuntos Religiosos do Moçambique. Sua Excelência tem a palavra. Sua Excelência Presidente do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, distintas delegações, ilustres representantes da sociedade civil, minhas senhoras e meus senhores, Excelências. Antes de mais, permitam-me, em nome do Governo da República de Moçambique, e em meu nome pessoal e da delegação que me acompanha, saudar calorosamente Vossa Excelência e todos os membros do Buró do Conselho de Direitos Humanos, pela forma excelente com que tem dirigido os trabalhos desta sessão. Expressamos igualmente o nosso apreço à Alta Comissária dos Direitos Humanos, Sra. Michelle Bachelet, e toda a sua equipa pelo valioso trabalho que tem realizado em defesa e promoção dos direitos humanos no mundo. Excelências, no passado dia 4 de maio de 2021, Moçambique foi avaliado pela terceira vez no âmbito do Mecanismo de Revisão Periódica Universal 
MRPU, na 38ª sessão do Grupo de Trabalho, em sede do diálogo interativo entre pares que culminou com a adoção do relatório de recomendações ao terceiro ciclo do MRPU durante a 48ª sessão no Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, realizada em setembro de 2021. Das 266 recomendações formuladas pelos Estados-membros, 236 foram aceites e 30 anotadas pelo meu Governo. No seguimento desses compromissos, o Governo moçambicano tem procurado empenhar-se de modo a cumprir da melhor forma possível a implementação efetiva não só das recomendações formuladas no âmbito da MERPU, mas também de outras recomendações supervenientes dos relatórios das temáticas dos direitos humanos no exercício da luta pela garantia e proteção dos direitos dos cidadãos plasmados na nossa Carta Magna ou Lei Mãe. Neste contexto, Moçambique tem em vista a realização das seguintes ações. A nível do governo, a criação do Grupo Interministerial dos Direitos Humanos e do Direito Internacional Humanitário no quadro das ações do MRPU, cujo instrumento normativo aguarda a aprovação pelo Conselho de Ministros. No âmbito dos princípios voluntários sobre a segurança e direitos humanos, a criação do Grupo Nacional de Trabalho integrando instituições do governo, setor privado e a sociedade civil, com vista a promover o diálogo multissetorial vinculado à implementação dos princípios voluntários. Ainda no domínio do MRPU, já está em curso a mobilização de esforços com vista à elaboração de um plano de ação nacional para a implementação das recomendações do terceiro ciclo do MRPU 2020-2025. Excelências! A realização da Mesa Redonda, os princípios voluntários sobre segurança e direitos humanos em Moçambique, abriu uma nova página na história do exercício de direitos humanos e cidadania no país. Foi um marco inequívoco de promoção e facilitação do diálogo aberto e interativo entre os atores das instituições do Estado, das organizações da sociedade civil e do setor empresarial, na implementação efetiva dos princípios voluntários sobre segurança e direitos humanos em Moçambique, com vista à melhoria da governação corporativa em matéria de direitos humanos, com enfoque na província de Cabo Delgado. Com este desiderato, Moçambique pretende colocar à disposição das Nações Unidas a sua modesta e humilde experiência na prevenção mediação e resolução de conflitos com recurso ao diálogo, ferramenta que constitui o suporte da sua excelência, Felipe Jacinto Nunes, Presidente da República de Moçambique. Excelências, para terminar, permitam-nos manifestar a nossa profunda satisfação pela participação nesta sessão, reafirmando o nosso forte e inquestionável compromisso na promoção e proteção dos direitos humanos, os quais constituem a missão deste importante órgão do Sistema das Nações Unidas. Estamos cientes de que, apesar dos esforços acima descritos, ainda existem desafios para a criação de um ambiente favorável para o exercício de direitos humanos e cidadania na plenitude em resultado dos compromissos e obrigações assumidos, através da ratificação dos direitos internacionais e regionais sobre os direitos humanos e o direito internacional humanitário. Pela atenção dispensada, muito obrigada. Muito obrigado, Excelência. And now I have the pleasure to give the floor to Her Excellency Miss Yvonne Dalsa, Minister of Justice of Namibia. You have the floor. Thank you. Mr. President, Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is a great honor to address the 49th session of the Human Rights Council on behalf of the Republic of Namibia and to join this hybrid high-level engagement in person. We are meeting at a time when states around the world continue to grapple with the devastating impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. While remarkable progress has been made in the development of effective vaccines, vaccination rates remain severely low in much of the developing world. Namibia is therefore pleased to note that part of the discussions at this session will be dedicated towards finding answers on how to ensure equitable and affordable access to vaccines for all countries. Namibia particularly looks forward to hearing best practices 
on tackling misinformation which perpetuates public apprehension and vaccine hesitancy. It is commendable that notwithstanding the challenges presented by the pandemic, the Human Rights Council continues to respond to a myriad of global human rights issues promptly and adequately. These efforts to promote the universal respect for the protection of all human rights reaffirms the indivisible, interdependent, and interrelated nature of human rights as sacrosanct. Namibia therefore extends our sincere gratitude to the Office of the Human Rights Commissioner for Human Rights and other stakeholders for the remarkable efforts undertaken during these difficult times and look forward to open dialogue in the spirit of mutual trust when addressing the issues facing us as a global community. Mr. President, during our tenure, Namibia actively engaged with the work of the Council. We did so in a spirit of cooperation with members and observer states, as well as our important non-state actors. Currently, Namibia is a core group member of the sponsors on the right to adequate housing and on freedom of opinion and expression, and will continue to constructively participate on resolutions and other initiatives that align with our human rights obligations and priorities. Mr. President, the Universal Periodic Review remains a priority for Namibia. We consider the mechanism a unique platform for constructive dialogue between states. In May 2021, Namibia underwent its third cycle review. We accepted over 80% of the recommendations received, which reaffirms the commitment of the Namibian government to improve the human rights of all persons within its territory. We were, where we have lapses, we intend to accelerate improvement. This includes, and with assistance of the OHCHR, the development of a national recommendations tracking database. The right to life and human dignity are twin rights of global significance. Their promotion and protection guards our human existence. This is the reason for Namibia's consistent appeal during our participation in the UPR working group sessions that states reconsider the imposition of the death penalty. In particular, we recognize the strides made in some countries to reduce the number of executions and to place moratoriums on the imposition of the death penalty where applicable. Mr. President, Namibia recognizes the important role special procedure mechanisms of the Council plays in the protective mandate. It contributes to enhance human rights protection and promotion and provides important information that guides states interventions. We have therefore, during the third cycle review, accepted the recommendation to consider issuing a standing inv invitation to all special procedures and mandate holders. To date, Namibia has had four visits from special procedures and mandate holders. A scheduled visit from the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples was disrupted by the COVID-19 pandemic. The rescheduling of this visit is in the pipeline. Mr. President, as states, our collective aim is to promote and protect the human rights of all people, irrespective of origin, ethnicity, or race. Namibia's metaphoric reference to the Namibian house is intended to buttress that no one should be left out. It is therefore appalling and unacceptable that people continue to suffer racial and systemic discrimination around the world in the era of a global human rights culture. Namibia therefore remains committed to the full implementation of the Durban Declaration and Program of Action, which embodies the firm commitments made by the states to, the, to rid the world of the scorches of racism, xenophobia, and related intolerances at the national, regional, and international level. We must jealously guard against attempts to undermine the legitimacy of the DTPA as one of the main instruments to combat the pandemic of racism around the world. Mr. President, as a country that played a pivotal role in shaping the women, peace, and security agenda at the United Nations, Namibia has adopted the National Action Plan in this regard and established the International Women's Peace Center in our capital, Vintuk. It is this firm view that we, as part of a core group of states here at the Human Rights Council in 2020, recognize that the Women, Peace and Security Agenda is essentially about redefining the role of women and girls in conflict and post-conflict situations and increasing efforts to protect them. 
Noting the progress made thus far, more can and must be done to enhance the participation of women, girls, and the youth in political decision-making processes and peace-building efforts. The representation of women within the high-level structures of the United Nations would provide good impetus for countries to follow suit as it will sample the importance of our collective duty to ensure full universal participation and gender equality. Challenges of gender-based violence and sexual violence continue to seriously impact the implementation of policy, legal and social mechanisms to advance the human rights of women and girls. Namibia reaffirms its unwavering commitment to support all efforts aimed at the elimination of all forms of gender-based and sexual violence, ensuring women's full and effective participation and equal opportunities for leadership at all levels of decision-making in political, economic, and public life. Mr. President, climate change, environmental deg degradation, and pollution remains among some of the most pressing challenges the world is confronted with today. They pose a serious threat to our and future generations, and this impacts on all of us, and Namibia is no exception. We are vulnerable to the impacts of climate change. In recent years, we have consistently experienced floods, droughts, felt fires, and increased human wildlife conflict. These have had adverse effect effects on our communities, the economy, infrastructure, and the environment, which invariably affects our development priorities in the country. Namibia is therefore committed to goal 13 of the sustainable development goals, particularly the implementation of climate change mitigation mechanisms, to fast track the recommendations of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Namibia set up the Environment Investment Fund to oversee the mobilization and usage of climate action financing intended for green projects in the country. Namibia is also extremely pleased with action of this Human Rights Council at its 48th session, which established the first ever special rapporteur on climate change and human rights and recognized that access to a healthy environment is an important human right. In Namibia, access to a healthy environment is, is, is a constitutional imperative. The state has a very clear role to play for, among others, the maintenance of a healthy ecosystems and to sustainably develop the natural resources of Namibia for the benefit of present and future generations. Additionally, Namibia has made significant progress in incubating renewable energy assets in the form of green hydrogen and ammonia as part of its energy transition through green industrialization. Mr. President, the devastating impact of corruption on human rights is undeniable. The fulfillment of human rights obligations and meeting the aspirations of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development will contribute greatly to fight against corruption. With a goal to protect public resources aimed at improving lives and livelihoods, Namibia is making steady strides towards curbing corruption in public offices. Namibia remains deeply concerned about the negative impacts of unilateral coercive measures on the enjoyment of all human rights. We therefore once again call on sanctioning countries to remove the illegal sanctions imposed on Cuba, Iran, Venezuela, and Zimbabwe. There is simply no justification to maintain these sanctions as it inhibits the ability of sanctioned states to effectively promote and protect human rights, especially in the face of a pandemic where livelihoods have been disrupted and the right to life itself is at stake. Mr. President, the responsibilities of businesses to respect human rights have increasingly come under scrutiny over the past few years as their desire to maximize profits often overlook human rights considerations. Therefore, the work of the Intergovernmental Working Group mandated to develop a legal binding instrument on transnational corporations and other business enterprises is critical and we should all throw our weight behind it. Namibia, as per our state practice, will keep on with its constructive engagement in this process. We will also continue to support all initiatives aimed at making the right to development a reality. Mr. President, His Excellency Dr. Hage Kengob often remarks that Namibia is a child of international solidarity, midwifed by the United Nations. As a country 
that knows too well what it is to be denied the right to self-determination. We continue to advocate for the realization of this right for all peoples who still live under illegal occupation. In this light, Namibia remains committed to the cause of the people of Palestine and that of the Saori people of Western Sahara. As a living testament of what international solidarity can do for a people, we call on the international community to work to realize the right to self-determination for the people of Palestine and the people of Western Sahara. We further call on all states to denounce and refrain from supporting apartheid by Israel against the Palestinian people. We echo the call that the International Criminal Court's investigations into the alleged international crimes committed in the occupied Palestinian territory must include apartheid as a crime against humanity. In closing, Mr. President and distinguished dignitaries, allow me to emphatically underscore Namibia's commitment to the promotion, protection, and fulfillment of human rights. True to our pledges, when we joined the Human Rights Council in 2020, Namibia will continue to make positive contributions to the debates of this August House during and outside of the ordinary sessions. I wish you effective deliberations and fruitful engagements during the session. I thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Your Excellency. Y ahora tiene la palabra Su Excelencia, el señor Abdulatif bin Rashid al Sayani, Ministro de Asuntos Extranjeros de Bahrein. Tiene la palabra. La Rahman Rahim, Maali, el Sayyid, Virrico, Virgas, Reis Mejis Hakuk al Ansan. سعادة المفوض السامي لحقوق الإنسان السيدة ميشيل باشلي أصحاب السعادة السيدات والسادة الحضور الكرام السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته يسعدني أن أعبر لكم سعادة الرئيس عن تهانينا الخالصة لانتخابكم رئيسا للمجلس متمنيا لكم وأعضاء المكتب كل التوفيق والنجاح في أعمالكم ويطيب لي في البداية أن أشيد بجهود المفوضية السامية لحقوق الإنسان وعلى رأسها السيدة ميشيل باشلي السيد الرئيس لا تزال الحروب والصراعات مستمرة في منطقة الشرق الأوسط منذ أكثر من عقد مخلفة الملايين من القتلى والجرحى واللاجئين والنازحين حارمة ملايين الشباب من التعليم والرعاية الصحية والمأوى والسلام والأم ليصبح السلام من أهم الحقوق التضامنية لبناء عالم يسود التسامح والمساواة والأمن في تحقيق حياة أفضل وبيئة سليمة خالية من الصراعات والنزاعات المسلحة والإرهاب والتعصب ومن هذا المنطلق تعمل مملكة البحرين على دعم الجهود الرامية إلى دعم السلام في المنطقة والعالم وحفظ السلم والأمن الدوليين وإنماء العلاقات الدولية بين الأمم وتحقيق التعاون الدولي استهداء بميثاق الأمم المتحدة والمواثيق الدولية والإقليمية ذات الصلة وانطلاقا من النهج الحكيم لجلالة الملك حمد بن عيسى آل خليفة ملك مملكة البحرين لترسيخ القيم والمبادئ الإنسانية النبيلة كالتسامح والتعايش السلمي والإخاء والتعاون والسلام بين شعوب العالم ومن خلال تأسيس الآليات والمبادرات الكفيلة بتحقيق تلك الأهداف السامية مثل إنشاء مركز الملك حمد العالمي للتعايش السلمي وتأسيس جائزة الشيخ عيسى لخدمة الإنسانية وإصدار إعلان مملكة البحرين وإنشاء كرسي الملك حمد للحوار بين الأديان والتعايش السلمي في جامعة سابينزا الإيطالية وتعتز مملكة البحرين بجهودها المتواصلة لحماية وتعزيز حقوق الإنسان انطلاقا من المبادئ التي نص عليها ميثاق العمل الوطني ودستور المملكة والتشريعات النافذة والتزام منها بالمعاهدات والاتفاقيات الدولية المعنية بحقوق الإنسان وحرصا على بناء مجتمع تسود فيه مبادئ دولة العدالة والقانون والمؤسسات والعمل على تعزيز منظومة حقوق الإنسان والنهو بسجل المملكة الحقوقي السيد الرئيس أن الظروف الاستثنائية العالمية التي نتجت عن جائحة فيروس كورونا كوفيد 19 والآثار السلبية التي خلفتها وضعت دول العالم أمام اختبار صعب تجاه توفير الوقاية اللازمة لضمان حماية الإنسان والحفاظ على صحته وسلامته 
وفي إطار توجيهات جلالة الملك المفدى حرصت حكومة مملكة البحرين بقيادة صاحب السمو الملكي الأمير سلمان بن حمد بن عيسى الخليفة ولي العهد رئيس مجلس الوزراء على التصدي لهذه الجائحة وبشكل مدروس وفاعل مع مراعاة كافة النواحي الصحية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية والتعليمية ووضعت في مقدمة أولوياتها المحافظة على حق الإنسان في الصحة والسلامة ويشمل ذلك المواطنين والمقيمين على حد سواء ووفرت مراكز الإيواء ووسائل الفحص والعلاج واللقاح المجاني اللازم للمواطنين والمقيمين دون تفرقة أو تمييز السيد الرئيس لقد واصلت الحكومة الموقرة جهودها في تطوير المنظومة التشريعية المرتبطة بتعزيز حماية حقوق الإنسان حيث صدر قانون للعقوبات والتدابير البديلة في عام 2017 وتم تعديله في عام 2021 وشكل خطوة رائدة في مجال إصلاح وتأهيل المحكوم عليهم بأحكام قضائية للعودة إلى محيطهم الاجتماعي وحياتهم الطبيعية وقد بلغ عدد الذين استفادوا من تطبيق هذا القانون 3826 شخصا أنهى 60% منهم العقوبة البديلة التي قررت لها أو لهم من قبل التي قررت لهم من قبل السلطة القضائية وهو مؤشر بارز على نجاح هذا البرنامج الإنساني ذي الأهداف النبيلة كما واصلت مملكة البحرين تقدمها الكبير في مجال مكافحة الاتجار بالأشخاص حيث احتلت للعام الرابع على التوالي الفئة الأولى في التقرير السنوي لوزارة الخارجية الأمريكية المعني بتصنيف الدول في مجال مكافحة الاتجار بالأشخاص وهو أعلى تصنيف دولي سنوي في هذا الشأن لتنفرد المملكة بهذا الإنجاز من بين دول منطقة الشرق الأوسط وشمال أفريقيا السيد الرئيس لقد شهدت الجهود الداعمة لتقدم المرأة في مملكة البحرين نقلة نوعية انطلقت قبل عقدين مع إنشاء المجلس الأعلى للمرأة الذي قام بدوره بوضع سياسات وطنية وخطط نوعية لتعزيز حقوق المرأة وسد الفجوات أبرزها الخطة الوطنية لنهوض المرأة البحرينية المعتمدة من قبل صاحب الجلالة الملك المفدى والتي نتج عنها بالتعاون Muchas gracias. Le damos la palabra ahora a la delegación de Chipre, su excelencia, el señor Ioannis Casoulides, ministro de Asuntos Extranjeros de Chipre. Tiene la palabra. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. It is a privilege to address the 49th high-level segment of the Human Rights Council. Unfortunately, the continuously unfolding events of the last days render my physical presence impossible. The Human Rights Council is the epicenter of international dialogue and cooperation on all issues pertaining to the protection of human rights, their universality and indivisibility. The work of this Council, therefore, is about getting the standards and pushing the boundaries in order to bring out the best in humanity and to help unleash the full potential for good in our societies to ensure that the future will be brighter than the past. Yes, what we are witnessing in the last week is the unfold suffering and misery brought by war. The Republic of Cyprus unequivocally condemns Russia's invasion of Ukraine a flagrant violation of international law and the rules-based international order. The protection of the territorial integrity, sovereignty, and in the independence of all states 
constitutes a fundamental principle for Cyprus. Allow me to echo the call of so many before me to the Russian Federation to immediately end hostilities and return to the path of diplomacy. Cyprus stands in solidarity with Ukraine and its people. It is important to hold an urgent debate on the situation of human rights in Ukraine during the current session. Dialogue is the only way to bridge differences and diminish the plug of polarization and war that unfortunately has beleaguered our work and our world. Strengthening rules-based multilateralism is the only way to effectively address global issues. Cyprus has been living as a victim of foreign aggression, occupation, almost for the last 50 years. The consequences and human rights violations on behalf of Turkey since 1974 are still much felt today. The fate of half of Cyprus's missing persons has yet to be determined. Those forcefully displaced by the Turkish army are not allowed to return to their homes and properties. The demographic structure in violation of the Geneva Conventions continues to be re-engineered through illegal colonization by settlers. Threats to settle the ghost town of Arosha and in breach of, in breach of relevant Security Council resolutions and the 1987 resolution of the Commission of Human Rights that expressly con condemns any attempts to settle any part of Arosha by people other than its inhabitants is illegal and courts for the immediate cessation of such activities. Mr. President, COVID-19 has shown a light on a wide array of deep structural inequalities and has inevitably had socioeconomic consequences, both between countries as well as internally within societies. Its impact on social, economic and cultural rights has been immeasurable, as it has on civil and political rights. Allow me to seize this occasion to express our concerns regarding these negative trends and point out that Cyprus will continue to raise its voice with regard to the need for protecting the most exposed and most vulnerable groups within society including women, members of the LGBTI community, children, and persons with disabilities. Conflicts, crisis, and instability put the fundamentals of human rights under threat. Cyprus, in seeking to become a member of this council for the first time between 2025 and 2027, wishes to see these issues placed high on our common agenda. Mr. President, Cyprus lies just 60 miles off the coast of Syria, which for over a decade of conflict has been beleaguered by continuous human rights violations and abuses to international humanitarian law that no amount of humanitarian assistance can redress. The effects of foreign occupation, multiple and competing power centers, massive displacement, radicalization, migration and social and demographic engineering practices augment the fragmentation as civilians on the ground continue to suffer. As regards Libya, it is imperative that a new date of the postponed elections is announced as the growing uncertainty could spiral into violence. Meanwhile, the presence of foreign armies and militias must be addressed without delay. Improving the human rights situation in Libya remains an important topic for the Human Rights Council and the fact finding missions work towards the end is indispensable.
the recognition in September of the right to a healthy environment is a timely achievement. The creation of a special rapporteur on climate change was crucial as it is imperative to have a human rights based approach to mitigating the effects of climate change and raise international awareness. Migration will remain a challenge in the years to come. We must all remind ourselves of our obligations regarding international protection and respect of the principle of non refoulement We are extremely concerned about the exploitation and abuse of migratory flows by human traffickers, as well as the political instrumentalization of migration by certain states. We call for this abuse to be stopped, and the only way to do this is for states and stakeholders across the multilateral arena to work together. Before concluding, I wish to highlight that during this session of the Human Rights Council, Cyprus together with a cross-regional core group comprising also Argentina, Ethiopia, Greece, Iraq, Ireland, Italy, Mali, Poland and Switzerland will be presenting the triennial initiative on cultural rights and the protection of cultural heritage. We look forward to engaging in good faith with each and every one of the UN member states during the informal consultations and aspire to receive broad support for this resolution during the current session as well as was always the case in the past. Ladies and gentlemen, Cyprus will continue its active engagement in the Council in order to strengthen the promotion and protection of human rights across the world. I thank you. Gracias. Y ahora tiene la palabra el señor, su excelencia, el señor Sergei Lavrov, ministro de Asuntos Extranjeros de la Federación Rusa. Tiene la palabra su excelencia. Причина возмутительной меры Евросоюза по отказу соблюдать одно из основополагающих прав человека – право на свободу перемещения. Члены Евросоюза выбрали путь односторонних нелегитимных санкций, использовав их для того, чтобы уйти от прямого честного диалога лицом к лицу, которого они, видимо, явно опасаются. Ситуация в мире не становится проще, на глазах деградирует. Основная причина в том, что США и их союзники продолжают агрессивно навязывать остальным участникам межгосударственного общения так называемый миропорядок, основанный на правилах. Чем оборачивается такой порядок для прав человека, хорошо видно на примере Украины. Именно политика коллективного Запада во главе с Вашингтоном привела к тому, что с 2014 года киевский режим воюет собственным народом со всеми, кто не согласен с неонацистскими ценностями Майдана, с преступной политикой украинских властей на системной основе, нарушающих базовые права человека и права национальных меньшинств, обязательства, взятые в рамках ООН и ОБСЕ, и даже Конституцию собственной страны. Ультранационалисты и неонацисты, захватившие власть в Киеве в результате поддержанного Западом госпереворота, Развязали настоящий террор. Невозможно без содрогания вспоминать о страшной трагедии в Одессе 2 мая 2014 года, когда участники мирной акции были заживо сожжены в Доме профсоюзов. Преступники, совершившие это злодеяние, известны по именам, они позировали перед видеокамерами, но до сих пор не наказаны. Неопровержимым доказательством преступных последствий массированных обстрелов гражданских объектов Донбасса являются обнаруженные там массовые захоронения. Судебно-медицинская экспертиза установила, что большинство погибших – женщины и старики. Многочисленные факты этих вопиющих нарушений основного права человека – права на жизнь – наши западные коллеги попросту игнорируют. Попытки привлечь внимание Совета по правам человека, творившимся 8 лет бесчинством, наталкивались на их безразличие. Украинский режим все эти годы проводил курс на агрессивную дерусификацию и принудительную ассимиляцию. 
людям, которые считают себя русскими, хотели бы сохранить свою идентичность, свой язык, свою культуру, прямо дают понять, что на Украине они чужие. Зеленский, назвав их особями, посоветовал убираться в Россию. Он инициировал принятие закона о коренных народах, среди которых не нашлось места для русских, веками живущих на этих землях, вполне в духе законотворчества нацистской Германии. Русский язык изгоняется из школы университетов, из публичной сферы, просто из повседневного обихода. Нередко ситуации, когда за право говорить на родном языке, можно поплатиться не только работой, здоровьем, но и жизнью. Только представьте себе, что Ирландия запретила английский язык, Бельгия – французский, Италия – немецкий. Такое просто невозможно вообразить. А вот фронтальная атака на русский язык на Украине не вызывает у просвещенного Запада отторжения, а кое-кем даже поощряется. Любые признаки инакомыслия влекут за собой самые тяжелые последствия. На регулярную основу поставлен процесс очищения власти от неугодных, нелояльных служащих. Главным подспорьем здесь является принятый Верховный Рад еще один закон о люстрации. Владятся и другие законодательные акты, позволяющие силовым структурам режима жестко подавлять инакомыслие преследовать оппозицию. Вводятся запреты на работу телеканалов, других средств массовой информации, осуществляются репрессии против собственных граждан, включая депутатов парламента. Разве это не нарушение свободы слова, права выражать свое мнение? Бесстыдно насаждаются ложь о Второй мировой войне. Местные приспешники Гитлера объявляются героями. А настоящие герои антифашисты предаются за время. Сносятся памятники победителям фашизма. Прославляются военные преступники, воевавшие в рядах Третьего Рейха. Новым проявлением этого курса стало направление к админам Украины Верховную Раду 23 февраля этого года законопроекта о выходе Украины из соглашения СНГ об увековечении памяти о мужестве и героизме народов Великой Отечественной войны. На этом фоне верху Кощунск. Выглядит поведение Зеленского, которого хватило совести в тот же самый день заявить, что он чтит память своего деда, воевавшего в рядах Красной Армии за освобождение Советского Союза и Европы от фашизма. Киевский режим вторгся даже в такую чувствительную, интимную сферу, как духовный мир людей. Усиливается дискриминация по религиозному признаку. Прежние власти во главе с Порошенко при поддержке Вашингтона осуществили церковный раскол, создав так называемую православную церковь Украины. Инициированы законы, направленные против канонической украинской православной церкви Московского патриарха. Захватываются принадлежащие ей храмы, преследуются миллионы ее прихожан и духовенства. Что это как не нарушение свободы вероисповедания? И все эти массовые системные атаки на права и свободы, последовательные насаждения неонацизма осуществляются при откровенном попустительстве США, Канады, стран Евросоюза, высокомерно объявляющих себя эталоном демократии. Под их бесцеремонным давлением Оказались и международные правозащитные механизмы ООН, Совета Европы и ОБСЕ, которые все эти годы не могли найти в себе мужество адекватно отреагировать на вопиющий беспредел на Украине. Закрывать глаза на происходящее Запад начал в феврале 2014 года, когда радикалы осуществили антиконституционный госпереворот, разорвав достигнутое под гарантией Евросоюза соглашение с тогдашним президентом Украины, пришедшие к власти путь чистый, провозгласили курс на союз с Западом и тут же начали наступление на русский язык, вознамерились изгнать все русское из Крыма, направив туда вооруженных боевиков. Не принявшие госпереворот восточные регионы Украины были обвинены в терроризме, хотя они ни на кого не нападали. Напротив, против них выделили отряды карателей, их города бомбили с помощью авиации, артиллерии, систем залпового огня. Разрушили гражданские объекты, школы, больницы, убивали мирных жителей, 
Против Донбасса была введена бесчеловечная экономическая транспортная продовольственная блокада. Все это сходило с рук киевскому режиму. Международные структуры в лучшем случае ограничивались стерильными призывами к обеим сторонам. Ясно, что в этих условиях у жителей Крыма и Донбасса просто не было другого выбора. В марте 2014 года подавляющее большинство крымчан высказалось в полном соответствии с международным правом за вхождение полуострова в состав России. Реализация закрепленного в уставе ООН права народов на самоопределение позволила им защитить свое право на жизнь, на свободное пользование родным языком, на свои традиции, свою историю и культуру. Кстати, за это Киев перекрыл Северо-Крымский канал, главный источник пресной воды для жителей полуострова. И опять все промолчали, забыв про пять международных конвенций, в которых закреплено право человека на безопасную питьевую воду. Что касается жителей Донбасса, то после согласования в феврале 2015 года Минского комплекса мер, одобренного Советом безопасности ООН, они надеялись, что их услышат, что справедливо восторжествует, что Киев вступит в диалог со своими гражданами, дончанами и луганчанами и начнет выполнять все другие обязательства в рамках минских договоренностей, которые Киев, однако, откровенно саботировал при прямой поддержке Запада, продолжая вооруженную провокацию на Донбассе. В последнее время преступные действия украинского режима резко активизировались. Как следствие, только с середины февраля более 100 тысяч беженцев из Донбасса нашли приют в России. Нами собрана солидная доказательная база совершенных киевскими властями глубок массовых нарушений прав человека. На веб-сайте постоянного представительства России в Женеве развернута развернут онлайн-выставка документов и фотоматериалов, изобличающих зверство украинских военных и неонацистских добровольческих батальонов. Призываю всех надеющих за права человека ознакомиться с этой выставкой, чтобы узнать правду, которую киевский режим, его покровители и, к сожалению, большинство западных средств массовой информации старательно пытаются скрыть. В условиях грубейшего попрания прав русских и русскоязычных граждан Украины, развязанной против них восьмилетней войны со всеми признаками геноцида, в условиях упорного отказа Запада призвать украинские власти к порядку и в отсутствии какой-либо реакции со стороны правозащитных структур ООН, ОБСЕ и Совета Европы, Россия не могла оставаться безучастной к судьбе 4 миллионного Донбасса. Президент Путин принял решение признать Донецкую и Луганскую народные республики и в ответ на обращение лидеров этих республик начать специальную военную операцию по защите их жизни в соответствии с заключенными с этими республиками договорами о дружбе и взаимопомощи. Цель наших действий – спасение людей путем выполнения наших союзнических обязательств, а также демилитаризация и денацификация Украины, чтобы подобное никогда больше не повторялось. Это особенно актуально в свете затягивания страны в НАТО, накачивания ударными вооружениями нынешнего режима, который открыто предъявлял территориальные претензии к Российской Федерации и угрожал применением силы и обретением военного и ядерного потенциала. По поводу развернутой кампании якобы нарушения суверенитета и территориальной целостности Украины, инициаторы которые проявляют полное безразличие и презрение по пранию прав человека, хотят я хотел бы привлечь внимание к декларации 1970 года о принципах международного права, касающихся дружных отношений и сотрудничества между государствами в соответствии с уставом ООН. В этом документе, одобренном консенсусной резолюцией Генеральной Ассамблеи, закреплено, что принцип уважения территориальной целостности применим, я цитирую, государством, соблюдающим в своих действиях принцип равноправия и самоопределения народа, и вследствие этого имеющим правительство, представляющее безразличие расы, вероисповедания или цвета кожи, весь народ, проживающий на данной территории. Конец цитаты. Киевское неонацистское правительство очевидным образом таковым в отношении народов Украины не являлось и не является.
США и их союзники напрямую ответственны за многочисленные нарушения прав человека и международного гуманитарного права, виновные в преступлении, жертвами которых стали сотни тысяч простых людей в Югославии, Ираке, Ливии, Афганистане, в очередной раз демонстрируют двойные стандарты. Нынешний киевский режим – яркий пример того, что когда ты верно подданный вассал Гегемона, и с особым рвением участвуешь в обслуживании его политики по сдерживанию России, тебе дозволено все. Ты можешь попирать любые права человека, любые свободы, просто убивать людей, культивировать неонацистские традиции и порядки в обмен на твою беспрекословную преданность и послушание цивилизованный Запад. Будет на все это закрывать глаза. Более того, на днях Евросоюз в русофобском угаре принял решение поставлять Киеву летальные вооружения. Для нас жизнь каждого русского или украинца, каждого данчанина или луганчанина не менее ценна, чем жизнь европейца или американца. Как неоднократно подчеркивал президент Путин, мы с неизменным уважением относимся к украинскому народу, его языку и традиции. Не намерены каким-либо образом ущемлять интересы граждан Украины, с которыми нас объединяют не только общая история, цивилизационное, духовное, культурное родство, но и просто кровные семейные узы. Миллионы уроженцев Украины живут сегодня в России. Для нас они свои. Вместе мы всегда были и будем многократно сильнее и успешнее. Главное – прекратить попытки незаконно захвативших власть время щитов, предавать коренные интересы украинского народа и проводить в угоду Западу курс на превращение своей страны в антироссию в качестве смысла своего существования. Наблюдаемые сегодня в НАТО и Евросоюзе настоящая истерика лишь подтверждает, что именно создание антироссии было и остается целью США и построено в Вашингтоном всех их союзников. Как вы знаете, по просьбе Зеленского начались переговоры представителей России с делегацией Киева. Надеюсь, что украинская сторона осознает серьезность ситуации и свою ответственность, осознает необходимость проявить, но прежде всего, самостоятельность, а также договороспособность и избежать повторения истории с Минскими соглашениями. Завершить свое выступление хотел бы напоминанием о том, что права человека – это универсальная константа, которая не может зависеть от корыстных амбиций узкого круга избранных, стремящихся переписать всеобщую декларацию 1948 года, извратить на свой лад и подменить своими пресловутыми правилами достигнутый тогда консенсус, лежащий в основе всей нашей коллективной работы. Роль Совета ООН по правам человека – обеспечить приверженность нашим общим, а не чьим-то узким ценностям, продвигать взаимо взаимоуважительные дискуссии без какой-либо политизации и двойных стандартов, не допускать использования правозащитной тематики для вмешательства во внутренние дела. Только таким подходом необходимо руководствоваться, добиваясь справедливости в любых вопросах, затрагивающих ключевые интересы людей и их коренные права. Идет ли речь о позорном для Европы института без гражданства, о набирающем силу движения в пользу возрождения нацизма или об одержимости Запада политикой противоправных односторонних санкций, нацеленность которых на простых людей уже никто и не пытается скрывать. Эти незаконные рестрикции уже не ограничиваются финансово-экономическими запретами, они распространяются на культурную, спортивную, туристическую, образовательную, информационную сферу и в целом на все контакты между людьми. Запад явно потерял контроль над собой в стремлении сорвать злость на России, пошел на разрушение всех созданных им же институтов и правил, включая неприкосновенность собственности. Высокомерный, опирающийся на чувство собственного превосходства, исключительности и вседозволенности философии Запада, должен быть положен конец. Суверенное равенство государств – ключевой принцип устава ООН, и он в полной мере распространяется на работу Совета по правам человека. Россия всегда открыта к равноправной, взаимоуважительной дискуссии по любым вопросам, готова к поиску справедливого баланса интересов. Спасибо. Mr. Jeppe Kofod, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Denmark, who will address the Council. Your Excellency, you have the floor.
Thank you, Mr. President, Excellences, colleagues. We meet in a tragic time in history. We are all devastated by the Russian attack on uh, the sovereign nation and people of Ukraine. In images which were broadcasted all over the world, we saw families separated and children seeking shelter in Kiev subway system. We saw kindergartens destroyed by Russian ordinances and giant holes blown in the middle of residential buildings in the center of the capital of Ukraine. We are outraged by the indiscriminate attacks on civilians in this unlawful and immoral war of conquest. It serves no purpose and no principle but the naked quest for power. And we are outraged by President Putin's unfounded claims of genocide. These are obvious lies in bad faith. Future generations will judge us by the decisions we make in the coming hours and days. Every minute means more innocent civilians harmed, killed and displaced. They will ask if we did enough to support Ukraine when it mattered the most. And this is what I ask of you now. As the Foreign Minister of the Russian Federation has just addressed this Council, I want to make it very clear. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this unlawful, unprovoked invasion of Ukraine by Russian forces. I am deeply appalled by Russian actions. The Council decided yesterday to hold an urgent debate on the human rights situation in Ukraine stemming from the Russian aggression. This shows once again that the Council act promptly and appropriately and it shows that the Council will address violations of the rights of those um, it is here to protect. We must protect human rights of Ukrainians and everyone uh, worldwide, offline and online. This includes to counter the spread of Russian disinformation. The Russian aggression in Ukraine is sadly not the only situation that we need to address today. It is deeply worrying to see the increasing violence of freedom of expression, freedom of association, freedom of information, and freedom of religion or belief. These freedoms and rights must be protected by a full engagement from the entire international community. Mr. President, I've already spoken about Russian aggression in Ukraine, but inside Russia, we also urge the authorities to guarantee the right to peaceful assembly and freedom of speech and to release all peaceful protesters immediately. This has only become more urgent during the last week. And in Belarus, a regime that is supporting Russian aggression in Ukraine and oppresses the Belarusian people's rights to oppose, we will continue to hold those responsible for violations of human rights accountable. Mr. President, beyond the tragic and appalling violations related to the Russian aggression, we unfortunately continue to be concerned by violations in many other places. In China, we are deeply concerned about the situation and reiterate our call for meaningful access to Xinjiang for the High Commissioner for Human Rights. We call for democratic freedoms and rights to be restored and peacefully exercised in Hong Kong. In Myanmar, Denmark calls on the military regime to immediately end all violence, release all arbitrarily detained, restore civilian government, and respect human rights and the rule of law. And Denmark is also deeply concerned about the current situation in Afghanistan and the increasingly systemic violence, uh, violations of rights of the Afghan people, in particular women, girls, and minorities. In Ethiopia, we note that the government has taken some positive steps, but Denmark remains deeply concerned about human rights violations and abuses in the northern part of Ethiopia. We urge all parties to the conflict to cease hostilities, seek a negotiated settlement, and respect the human rights, security, and safety of civilians. Mr. President, in these times of strategy in Europe, imposed upon the Ukrainian people by the Russian aggression, we remain deeply committed to human rights and we will continue our long-standing engagement in the Council from the Danish side. Thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency.
Y ahora le doy la palabra a su excelencia, el señor Alexander Schallenberg, ministro federal para Europa y Relaciones Exteriores de Austria. Tiene la palabra. Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm addressing this council at a time when the world is still in shock at the horrifying events in Ukraine. So let me first of all address this situation. The invasion of Ukraine by armed forces of the Russian Federation in blatant violation of international law is not only an attack on another sovereign and independent nation, it is also an attack against the aspirations of the Ukrainian people to freedom and democracy. We condemn these acts by Russia in the strongest terms and call upon President Putin to immediately stop this senseless war. The Russian military aggression will leave thousands dead, displaced or scarred for life, families torn apart and children traumatized. The historical revisionism, disinformation and the use of military force instead of diplomacy bring back the demons of the past which we had thought to have left behind. In this dark hour, I wish to once again express Austria's full solidarity with Ukraine, the Ukrainian government and the people of Ukraine. This is why Austria fully supports the holding of an urgent debate of the Human Rights Council this week and the adoption of a resolution on this matter. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, in these challenging times, we have to prove time and again that our joint commitment to the universality of human rights and the rule of law is at the top of our priorities. They are the fundamental pillars of any open and free society. Next year will mark the 30th anniversary of the Vienna Conference on Human Rights. 30 years on, human rights and the rule of law are experiencing significant challenges. Let me be clear, no crisis should prevent us from standing up and speaking clearly out for human rights. Austria has always been and always will be a strong supporter of the international human rights system. Together we need to stand up against any attempts to undermine our open and free societies. Alice, we have to acknowledge that the humanitarian situation in many places, such as Belarus, Syria, Yemen, Ethiopia, Myanmar, Nicaragua, many others, is still alarming and requires our full attention. However, in doing so, we have to ensure that the Council addresses country situations in a holistic manner. Singling out or focusing on one country through a special agenda item, whereas neglecting human rights abuses in others, negatively impacts the Council as a whole and should be a matter of the past. Excellencies, Ladies and gentlemen, this year we mark the 30th anniversary of the Declaration on the Rights of Persons Belonging to Minorities. And I am glad that during the current Council session, Austria will present a resolution focusing on minorities in conflict situations. We count on your support for this resolution. To adequately safeguard the rights of us all, we must also protect those who uncover and denounce violations and infringements. Journalists, civil society and human rights defenders. The number of reporters jailed for the work hit a new global record and in the past 12 months alone, 46 journalists were killed in connection with the work. Ten years ago, we adopted the UN Plan of Action on the Safety of Journalists. Today, we have to make sure that this action plan remains the blueprint for our efforts to prevent, protect and prosecute crimes against journalists and free media, also over the next decade. Therefore, Austria is proud to host in cooperation with the UN Human Rights Office and UNESCO a high-level conference in Vienna coming November with the aim to renew and reinvigorate this action plan. Austria also continues to place women's rights and gender equality at the center of its foreign policy. Let me express my deep regret and concern about recent developments, especially 
but not limited to Afghanistan, where hard-won gains and achievements for women's rights are under threat. We will therefore continue, not least through our membership in the Commission on the Status of Women, to work intensively to strengthen the rights of women and girls. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me be very clear. The universal character of human rights is not subject to negotiations. Attempts to challenge it are unacceptable. We can only move forward on our common commitment to human rights if we return to the spirit of Vienna, where all human rights are placed on an equal footing. The Secretary General has presented an ambitious pathway to achieve this goal with his call to action for human rights. We will continue to fully support the Secretary General in these efforts. In this context, digital technologies are a new test for all of us. We have to ensure a human rights-based approach to new technologies, guaranteeing that existing international legal norms are fully implemented and effective in all spheres of life. Whether something takes place offline or online should not make any difference as far as human rights are concerned. Ladies and gentlemen, Austria is proud to have served as a member of this council for the last three years and we will continue to be a steadfast ally in all international efforts to protect human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you. Y ahora tengo el honor de darle la palabra a su excelencia, el señor Cornel Feruta, Secretary of State for Global Affairs and Diplomatic Strategies, Ministro de Relaciones Exteriores de Romania. Bienvenido, tiene la palabra. Gracias mucho, señor presidente. Madame la Haute Comisaria. Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, je tiens à vous féliciter, Monsieur l'Ambassadeur, pour uh, cette uh, occasion que vous avez de diriger ce Conseil et d'assurer, je vous assure aussi de, de l'entier appui de la délégation roumaine. Monsieur le Président, la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme sont devenus plus importants que jamais. Je salue le message du secrétaire général des Nations Unies et je souligne notre soutien pour le système universel des droits de l'homme qui fait partie de l'engagement de mon pays pour un multilatéralisme fort et efficace fondé sur les règles. La Roumanie continuera toujours à plaider en faveur des droits de l'homme tout en soulignant l'importance méritée en tant qu'un des trois piliers de l'UN. En même temps, je tiens à féliciter la Haute Commissaire, Madame Michelle Bachelet, pour son travail inestimable de promotion et de protection des droits de l'homme, particulièrement dans cette période très difficile. La Roumanie soutient fortement l'indépendance du Bureau et de la Haute Commissaire. Malgré les turbulences de, de la période actuelle, au cours de laquelle nous devons faire face à un, un tour défi planétaire, le Conseil a prouvé être à l'auteur des attentes, prêt toujours à remplir ses fonctions. C'est très important. En mars dernier, lors de notre réunion, nous avons renouvelé l'engagement de défendre le respect des droits de l'homme, la coopération multilatérale, l'égalité et la non-discrimination, le droit de chacun de vivre en paix et en sécurité. Et maintenant, il devient de plus en plus évident que nous devons rester tous fidèles à nos engagements, aux valeurs universelles et aux principes fondamentaux, à notre devoir de défendre la vie et à notre espoir de préserver la sécurité mondiale. De plus, tout au long de ces dernières années, les pressions, les menaces, les conflits et les crises n'ont pas cessé d'augmenter tout en compliquant beaucoup nos efforts en faveur de la stabilité, du développement et de la paix. Mr. President, eight years since the illegal annexation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol by the Russian Federation, we see yet another violation of Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity through Russian Federation's recent unprovoked military attack against Ukraine and this decision to recognize the self-proclaimed separatist republics in Donetsk and Luhansk regions of Ukraine 
as a dependent entity. We are deeply concerned about the human costs of this aggression. We are also deeply concerned about its unpredictable implications on human rights and humanitarian situation in Ukraine. We welcome, therefore, the urgent debate on humanitarian human rights consequences of the Russian unlawful attack on Ukraine to be held uh, later this week. It is cru the crucial duty. It is the crucial duty of this Council to monitor and verify reports of human rights and humanitarian law violations. Mr. President, distinguished delegations, we are gravely worried about indiscriminate attacks on civilian areas causing the loss of lives of many civilians and substantial damage to civilian infrastructure such as hospitals. The Russian Federation should immediately halt indiscriminate attacks in, violations, in violation of international law. We reaffirm our strong support for the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Romania is in full solidarity with the people and the government of Ukraine. We call for an immediate cessation of aggression and the immediate withdrawal of the Russian armed forces. We will continue to support Ukraine alongside our international partners. And Romania is very committed to facilitate the safe entry of Ukrainian refugees. And we have taken measures to prepare for an increasing flow of people. The numbers are growing daily. We have also assisted many nations around the world and the international organizations to evacuate their nationals or staff, and we will continue to do so. I also want to share our concerns regarding reports of hundreds and thousands of people arrested by the Russian authorities for exercising their basic rights to freedom of opinion, expression, and peaceful assembly while protesting the war against Ukraine. All persons arbitrarily detained must be released immediately. Mr. President, distinguished delegates, a year ago we have announced Romania's candidacy to the Human Rights Council for 2023-2025 term. Our priorities are fundamental to the raison d'etre of the Human Rights Council, which is the meeting point of our promises of a safer future for our fellow citizens and for those without any protection. True to our solid support for human rights, democracy and the rule of law, Romania remains committed to work for their consolidation and enhanced resilience, taking into consideration also the impact of new technologies and the needed safeguards to prevent and fight threats. Our long-standing principal position to prevent and combat discrimination, racism and xenophobia will continue through preemptive positive approaches based on an inclusive agenda education and strengthening the culture of tolerance. The recent, uh, the recent adoption of the national strategy for preventing and combating anti-Semitism, xenophobia, ra radicalization and hate speech, as well as legislation introducing the study of Jewish and Holocaust history in high school, stands proof of our determination in this regard. The rights of women and girls remain one of our priority. We approach gender equality and the fight against gender violence, both as objectives of human rights and as prerequisites for social justice development, peace and progress towards achieving the 2030 Agenda's targets. One ministerial portfolio in the Romanian government is dedicated to equal opportunities. Romania will continue to display efforts for achieving institutional gender parity for women's access to public life or decision-making positions for eliminating violence, discrimination, stereotypes, and pay gaps. New generations depend on our respect for women and girls' rights and their realization. Freedom of expression is today under a pervasive attack globally, irrespective of countries' GDP, digital accessibility, or other historical or cultural determinants with so many visible basic de deprivations of moral suffering people are confronted with, the risk of overlooking the realization of the freedom of expression is high. Conflicts begin and are fed, are fed in with misinformation, hatred, call to violence online and offline, with repressing dissent, curtailing 
specific space or media freedom limitations. The freedom of expression is the cherished right and way of living liberty. It is the essence and the guarantee of any functioning democracy and pluralistic and open society. And Romania will stand for its respect at home and everywhere abroad. Mr. President, Excellencies, Distinguished Delegates, these are our priorities for, the, for our bid to join this prominent body. And we will continue to promote effective multilateralism in the service of the rules-based international order and for the benefit of our resilient democracies. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister. I now call representing the European Union, His Excellency Joseph Borrell Fontel, High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Vice President of the European Commission. You have the floor. As we gather today at this 49th session of the United Nations Human Rights Council, the Russian Federation is pursuing its military aggression against Ukraine, including attacks on civilians. This is not only an attack on a free, democratic and peaceful Ukraine, it's an attack on global stability and security, an outrageous violation of international law and a violation of the basic principles of human coexistence. So let me begin by making it very clear the European Union condemns in the strongest terms Russia's unprovoked attack on Ukraine. We support the democratically elected government of Ukraine and its efforts to defend its territory and its people. We stand with the women and men of Ukraine whose courage and determination is an inspiration to us all. One week of the United Nations Secretary General's appeal to Russia to stop its aggression and the High Commissioner's words of grave concern over civilian casualties and the human rights implications of Russia's actions. The Human Rights Council must address this crisis in all its aspects and do so now. While we are focusing on the war in Ukraine, we cannot forget other situations where basic human rights are being violated. Let me mention briefly some of them. First, in Belarus, more than 1,000 political prisoners have been locked up because they dare to protest peacefully and independent media and civil society are being repressed. The Lukashenko regime is complicit in facilitating Russia's military invasion of Ukraine and should be held accountable for that. In Afghanistan, girls are prevented from going to schools and human rights defenders Journalists and minorities are hiding or fleeing the country in fear of their life. In Myanmar, the military ignores the results of democratic elections and uses violence against its own citizens. In northern Ethiopia, a humanitarian emergency is happening before our eyes with credible allegations of massive human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law. Moreover, we are seeing an attempt by some, Russia, to reshape the core principles of international relations. They seek to relativize key concepts of human rights and democracy, arguing that all the states are sovereign, not people, if this revisionist campaign succeeds, we run the risk of moving back to an international order where might will be right. Let us remember that human rights are the law, are the international law, but they are much more than a law. They are about the dignity of human beings. And they don't belong to any state. They don't belong to any system. They belong to the people, all people in the world. And on this, I want to be clear. Human rights are universal and indivisible. They are the rights of all human beings. The European Union will not accept any effort to undermine fundamental freedoms 
or existing international human rights obligations. All members of this Human Rights Council and the United Nations Security Council must respect the responsibility and obligations that come with their membership. And this Council's mandate is to ensure that human rights are upheld everywhere and apply to everyone without any distinction between countries. And that means all human rights, economic, social, cultural, civil, and political, not only political, but also political. No country and no region has a perfect human rights record. No one of us is perfect. And that includes us, the European Union. Yes, we are not perfect. We have a lot of problems also. So I want to express the European Union full support for the High Commission of Bachelet and to the independency of her office. Her office is the custodian of human rights norms. And the special procedures are the eyes and ears of the Council and they must be allowed to do their work. Excellencies. Multilateralism, with the United Nations at its core, remains the only way to achieve global peace, to achieve security and prosperity. And Russia's actions in Ukraine seek to make a mockery of multilateralism. And President Putin has shown his contempt for the United Nations Security Council. But no attempt by Russia here in Geneva or in New York to invoke international principles in justification will disguise the facts. The facts are the facts. And the action by President Putin and his government are the opposite of the principles on which the United Nations and this Human Rights Council are based. They must and will be held to account. I appeal to all UN Nations members, big and small, I appeal to all of you to act with, to defend the principles and values of the United Nations at this Human Rights Council. Because global security only exists if it is based on human dignity and respect for universal human rights. Thank you. And now I have the honor to give the floor to Ms. Her Excellency, Ms. Belislava Petrova, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bulgaria. Welcome. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, it's a great honor to address the high-level segment of the Human Rights Council. And let me use this opportunity to congratulate His Excellency, Ambassador Viegas, um, on assuming the presidency of the Council and wish him every success in this venture. For more than 15 years of its existence, the Human Rights Council has emerged as a funda fundamental pillar of the universal system for protection and promotion of human rights at a global scale. It has adopted numerous resolutions of major significance and has set up arrangements for the scrutiny of human rights issues and situations and the investigation into various crises. Throughout these years, Bulgaria has demonstrated its commitment to the respect and promotion of human rights and has always tried to contribute to the reinforcement and efficiency of their international protection, building on the values and principles of international human rights law and on the understanding that individual rights and freedoms are universal and interrelated. But as I'm speaking at this moment, a worse security and humanitarian military crisis is unfolding in Europe, challenging and threatening the rules-based international order we have been building over the past 30 years, and the very principles and values on which it is founded. As we have witnessed on multiple occasions, armed conflicts pose one of the gravest threats to the effective enjoyment of human rights. And the ongoing aggression against Ukraine is no exception in this regard. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this unprovoked military invasion of Ukraine, 
which represents a gross violation of international law. Bulgaria supports unconditionally Ukraine's sovereignty, unity, and territorial integrity within its internationally recognized borders, including its territorial waters. Bulgaria urges Russia to seize the hostilities immediately, to withdraw from Ukrainian territory, and to fully comply with its obligations under international law, including the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. Bulgaria deplores the negative impact Russia's invasion already has and will continue to have on the respect of human rights and on the humanitarian situation in and around Ukraine. We fully support Ukraine's request to the Human Rights Council to hold an urgent debate with a view to considering and adopting appropriate measures to address the gravity of the situation. The Council should remain seized with the matter until the problem is fully resolved. Bulgaria remains committed to the fight against COVID-19 pandemic and the efforts to overcome its socioeconomic consequences. The respect for human rights is at the forefront of these efforts of the Bulgarian government. The goal is to provide all citizens with the best possible protection from the pandemic, including through access to information, medical care, vaccination, and social and economic compensations. School and university students, as well as other vulnerable groups, are in the focus of these efforts. International solidarity is also of crucial importance, and Bulgaria has contributed with vaccines, equipment, and other assistance to the efforts of many countries around the world to protect their citizens from the pandemic. Despite the pandemic, Bulgaria has kept its focus on combating all forms of racism, anti-Semitism, discrimination, intolerance, and hate speech. The institutions of the different branches of power work in close coordination to prevent and prosecute all such manifestations. The education of young people and the promotion of the traditional values of tolerance, mutual respect, and inclusion of the Bulgarian people benefit from a special occasion, attention. The act of racism, anti-Semitism, discrimination, intolerance, and hate speech remain rare in Bulgaria and do not go without appropriate reaction from the authorities and the society. Looking in the future, digital technologies are advancing ever more rapidly. The COVID-19 pandemic further accelerated this trend. This poses many new challenges in the sphere of human rights, and they require the special attention of the Human Rights Council. Likewise, the climate change and its universal negative impact on the humankind, including in the field of human rights, needs a more prominent place on the agenda of the Council. In this difficult period, the High Commissioner for Human Rights and her devoted staff deserve our appreciation and support for their relentless strive to advance the cause of human rights around the world. Mr. President, Bulgaria's first ever membership of the Human Rights Council successfully concluded last December. In 2021, the Bulgarian Permanent Representative in Geneva, Ambassador Steck, served as a Vice President of the Human Rights Council and a member of the Council's Bureau. During its membership in the Council, Bulgaria actively engaged in all initiatives related to the promotion and protection of the rights of the child, the equality of women and men, the empowerment of women, the rights of disabled persons, and the rights of other persons belonging to vulnerable groups. In a broader context, Bulgaria is convinced that human rights have a central place in the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Bulgaria remains dedicated to these noble goals and to the highest international human rights standards. Building on the experience of the membership in the Human Rights Council during the past three years, Bulgaria is pleased to put forward its candidature for a membership in the Council for the term 2024-2026 and counts upon the valuable support of all UN member states. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Y ahora tiene la palabra now call Su Excelencia, Señor Choi Young Moon, Vice Ministro de Relaciones Choi, Exteriores de la República de Corea. Affairs of the Republic you of Korea. You have the floor. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner, distinguished delegates, 
I very much appreciate this chance to address the Human Rights Council this year. I wish to thank High Commissioner Michel Bachelet and the OHCHL for their tireless dedication to safeguard the human rights and dignity of those left behind. Last year, conflicts broke out in many parts of the world, which led to the suppression of civilians and attacks on human rights defenders. At the same time, the ramifications of the COVID-19 pandemic extended far beyond the area of health. The social economic crisis generated by the pandemic has led to increased inequality, discrimination, and poverty. For its part, the Council held five special sessions in an effort to deal with these and other urgent challenges to human rights. The Republic of Korea believes that the Council has an even greater responsibility in such time of crisis. We start this year with yet another human rights crisis unfolding in Ukraine. The Republic of Korea strongly condemns Russia's aggression as it is a clear violation of the principles of the UN Charter. For this reason, the Republic of Korea voted yesterday in favor of convening an urgent debate on the situation of human rights in Ukraine. The ROK condemns all violations of international humanitarian law and human rights. The reports of civilian casualties are causes of grave concern. The use of force that causes innocent casualties simply cannot be justified under any circumstances. A rapid, safe, and unhindered access of humanitarian assistance to those in need in Ukraine are urgently needed in order to protect civilians. The ROK is also closely watching the somber situation in Myanmar. The serious human rights situation is continuing, is continuing even after the one-year anniversary of the military takeover. We stress the need to keep monitoring the situation in cooperation with the relevant mechanisms such as the independent investigative mechanism for Myanmar. And meanwhile, the situation in Afghanistan remains worrisome. About 400 persons of merit who came from Afghanistan to the Republic of Korea are settling in as members of the Korean society. However, let us not forget the people still in Afghanistan. The fundamental rights and freedoms of all Afghans, including women and girls, should be fully respected. Mindful of this, the Republic of Korea will pledge its 35 million US dollars this year as part of its continuing assistance to mitigate the humanitarian crisis regarding Afghanistan. A distinguished delegate, COVID-19 is affecting every corner of the globe, and the DPRK is no exception. The Republic of Korea has been closely watching the human rights and humanitarian situation in the DPRK with a profound interest and concern. We wish to underline that the international community should continue to engage the DPRK for substantially improving the human rights and standard of living of the people in the North. We also hope that the DPRK will respond to our calls for a lasting resolution to the tragedy of the separated families, which remains as one of the most urgent humanitarian issues on the Korean Peninsula. Our distinguished delegates, over the years, the ROK has brought the Council's attention to new and emerging digital technologies and their human rights implications. Two resolutions have been adopted with broad support as a follow-up measures to the resolution. The first expert consultations will be hosted by the OHCHR next week with a focus on the application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to technology companies. We look forward to the active participation of all stakeholders. Last but not least, the Republic of Korea wishes to stress the importance of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. Based on its historical experience, the Republic of Korea is firmly committed to advancing this agenda, especially by addressing conflict-related sexual violence around the globe. In this vein, the Republic of Korea, a strong advocate of the survival-centered approach, launched the Action with Women and Peace Initiative in 2018 and convened three international conferences so far 
to galvanize public awareness and political will on this issue. Three decades ago, the late Miss Kim Hoxon became the first survivor of the so-called comfort of women to testify to the public her painful experience during World War II. The only way to pay tribute to these courageous survivors is to remember the atrocious acts perpetrated against them and restore their honor and dignity. With a great sense of historical responsibility, we will continue to heed the voices of the survivors. A distinguished delegate, the Republic of Korea will continue to play an integral part in the Council's noble work as a member of the Council. Our commitment to promote universal human rights lies at the very heart of our values. It would be an honor for us to stand here again as a member of the Council next year. Thank you. Thank you. Agora tenho a honra de convidar Sua Excelência o Sr. Francisco André, Secretário de Estado para Assuntos Estrangeiros e Cooperação do Porto. Bem-vindo. Bem-vindo. Sr. Presidente do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos, Sra. Alta Comissária das Nações Unidas para os Direitos Humanos, Sras. e Srs. Sr. Presidente, Permita-me que comece por felicitar o desejando das maiores, dos maiores sucessos nas atuais funções como Presidente deste Conselho, onde terá contar sempre com a colaboração de Portugal. É uma honra dirigir-me ao Conselho dos Direitos Humanos em nome de Portugal, ainda mais por poder fazê-lo em português. Contudo, faço com a tristeza de um momento sombrio que talvez o mais sombrio na Europa desde a Segunda Guerra Mundial. Vemos novamente uma guerra na Europa, uma guerra provocada pela Rússia, uma guerra ilegítima e ilegal, Illegitimate and illegal in breach of international law and the United Nations Charter. Its impact has and will continue to have serious consequences. Portugal vehemently condemns Russia's military action in Ukraine. This unjustified aggression. Manifestamos a nossa total solidariedade com a Ucrânia neste momento tão difícil. Portugal está disponível para receber e acolher os ucranianos que procurem o nosso país e que possam encontrar a segurança e um destino para dar continuidade às suas vidas. Neste momento em que, no leste da Europa, assistimos a, flagra a flagrantes violações dos direitos humanos pela Rússia, é fundamental preservar o respeito pelo direito internacional, incluindo o direito internacional humanitário e o direito internacional dos direitos humanos. Sr. Presidente, superarmos a pandemia não teria sido possível sem os esforços concertados de todos. Estados, organizações internacionais, sociedade civil e comunidade científica. Permita-me que felicite as Nações Unidas, em especial o secretário-geral António Guterres, e alta comissária Michel Bachelet, o incansável empreendimento e dedicação por causa da Comissão de Proteção e Realização dos Direitos Humanos durante a pandemia. Se a alguma Covid-19 nos recordou, é que os direitos humanos estão presentes em todos os aspectos das nossas vidas, mesmo aqueles em que, por regra, nos passam despercebidos. A proteção dos direitos humanos e a mitigação dos efeitos nefastos da pandemia no seu exercício tem sido uma preocupação constante para Portugal e continuará a ser na fase da recuperação. Adotámos um conjunto de medidas para apoiar as pessoas em situações de maior vulnerabilidade, desde logo os migrantes, as crianças, as pessoas idosas e os jovens, para prevenir e combater a violência doméstica, para prevenir a manifestação de ódio, xenofobia, racismo. Ao mesmo tempo, empenhamos no apoio aos pequenos estados insulares em desenvolvimento e aos países menos avançados nos seus esforços de luta contra esta doença, através da disponibilização de recursos e da formação de profissionais de saúde. O início da disponibilização com vacinas a nível mundial, começámos também a apoiar a vacinação internacionalmente. Portugal já doou mais de 5,3 milhões de doses de vacinas contra a Covid-19 a 12 países bilateralmente através da iniciativa COVAX, um mecanismo europeu de proteção civil. Igualmente, durante a presidência portuguesa do Conselho da União Europeia, no primeiro semestre do ano passado, a Comissão dos Direitos Humanos esteve no centro da nossa ação. Sr. Presidente, é mais urgente do que nunca uma aposta séria no multilateralismo, com os direitos humanos no centro de todos os nossos esforços. Temos de aprender com a pandemia para, para, para reconstruir melhor, caminhando para um mundo mais igual, mais solidário, mais participativo, sem discriminação, violência, ódio e preconceito. Sem direitos humanos, todos os direitos humanos, civis, culturais, económicos, políticos e sociais, não haverá desenvolvimento sustentável. Na resposta às alterações climáticas, queria saudar o conhecimento há alguns meses neste Conselho de Direito Humano a um ambiente saudável, limpo e sustentável, direito reconhecido na Constituição Portuguesa, já em 1976. 
Temos de manter uma perspectiva de direitos humanos no combate ao terrorismo, na gestão dos fluxos migratórios, na luta contra a desinformação e na gestão dos desafios colocados pelo mundo digital, entre os quais contam os ataques à liberdade de imprensa, ao bullying e à violência digital. Portugal continuará na linha da frente do apoio e da contribuição para o multilateralismo e uma agenda internacional fortemente alicerçada nos direitos humanos. Portugal agradece ao Secretário-Geral das Nações Unidas, o documento da nossa agenda comum, também apoiamos sem reservas, defendemos a implementação do apelo à ação para os direitos humanos. Continuaremos a apoiar o sistema universal de proteção dos direitos humanos e sua independência. O mandato do Escritório da Alta Comissária das Nações Unidas para os Direitos Humanos, os órgãos dos tratados e o sistema de procedimentos especiais. As comemorações do 30º aniversário da Declaração e do Programa de Ação de Viena em 2023 constituirão uma boa ocasião para a comunidade internacional reforçar o seu compromisso com o recurso do pilar de direitos humanos das Nações Unidas. Sr. Presidente, convidaria ainda todos a participarem no painel de discussão no próximo dia 22 de março sobre a importância de políticas públicas robustas e eficientes e recursos adequados e de serviços plenamente operacionais para a proteção dos direitos económicos, sociais e culturais para mitigar o impacto negativo da pandemia da Covid-19 e contribuir para os esforços de recuperação. Gostaria de assinalar também que, juntamente com um largo grupo de países, convidarámos também no ano passado uma decisão para assinalar o décimo aniversário do Fundo Fiduciário para apoiar a participação dos CIT e dos PMA nos trabalhos do Conselho dos Direitos Humanos. O Conselho precisa de todos os países grandes ou pequenos. O Conselho precisa também de continuar a incluir a sociedade civil em todas as vertentes da sua ação e condenamos todos os tipos de represálias e de restrições à livre participação da sociedade civil. Continuamos a presidir em Genebra ao grupo de amigos sobre os mecanismos nacionais de implementação que reporta o seguimento das obrigações e recomendações internacionais de direitos humanos. Formulhamos ainda, através da Comissão Nacional de Direitos Humanos, a que tenho o privilégio de presidir, Portugal tem as suas obrigações junto aos órgãos dos tratados em dia e uma maior coordenação interna em matéria de direitos humanos também alargada à sociedade civil. Sr. Presidente, tendo sido há mais de 150 anos um dos primeiros países do mundo a abolir a pena de morte, conquista de todos os orgulhos e honramos, Portugal tem a abolição universal da pena de morte como um objetivo cimeiro da nossa ação espanhola. Convocamos esforços na promoção da igualdade de género e estamos totalmente comprometidos com a realização dos direitos humanos de todas as mulheres e raparigas. O combate a toda e qualquer forma de discriminação, seja baseado em qualquer for, é um denominador comum de todas as ações. A este respeito, gostaria de destacar a aprovação do ano passado do primeiro plano nacional de combate ao racismo e à discriminação para o período 2021-2025 e o nosso empenho juntamente com a África do Sul, para as fundações do 20 aniversário da Declaração e do Programa de Ação de Derby. O direito à educação é um direito humano e vital, também para o gozo de todos os mais direitos humanos. E é por isso que Portugal apoia a plataforma global para o ensino superior nas emergências. E este é um mecanismo de resposta rápida, uma iniciativa desenvolvida pelo antigo presidente de Portugal, Jorge Sampaio, recentemente falecido. Portugal atribui prioridade à proteção, o respeito e a realização dos direitos humanos dos imigrantes e, por isso mesmo, gostaria de destacar a importância do acordo sobre mobilidade de pessoas no seio da comunidade do país do grupo português assinado no ano passado. Sr. Presidente, 2021 foi um ano caracterizado por novos conflitos, pelo agudizar de tensões e de fenómenos de intolerância, por uma ilusão da democracia e por um retrocesso ao nível da proteção de direitos humanos, especialmente das mulheres e das raparigas. Este ano de 2022, apenas agora agora começado, traz-nos já o espectro da guerra e o seu contexto de violência, destruição e horror. A invasão injustificada e não provocada da Ucrânia pela Rússia constitui um ato de agressão intolerável e inaceitável. Apelamos à Rússia para que cesse de imediato a operação militar, que regressa à negociação, à diplomacia e ao respeito pelas normas básicas do direito internacional. Estamos com o povo da Ucrânia e estamos do lado do direito internacional e do respeito pela Carta das Nações Unidas. E por isso temos de agir em conjunto para pôr termo às violações e abusos para garantir que os seus autores sejam responsabilizados e que as vítimas sejam protegidas e compensadas. Muito obrigado. Muito obrigado, Excelência. Agora eu tenho o prazer de dar a palavra à Sra. Excelência, Ms. Elizabeth Truss, Secretária de Estado para o Foro e o Desenvolvimento e Desenvolvimento dos Estados Unidos da Grã-Britânia e da Northern Ireland. Welcome. You have the floor. Mr. President, Excellences, the UK is proud to defend and promote freedom around the world. We come here to the Human Rights Council to unite in this shared vision. Together, we have a moral duty 
to stand up to aggression, especially when it comes from members of this very council. We remain concerned about reports of violations from China, particularly Xinjiang and Tibet, and other parts of the world like Afghanistan and Myanmar. But today, we must face up to the urgent situation in Ukraine. As we speak, Russia continues with its illegal and unprovoked invasion of Ukraine. The consequences of Vladimir Putin's unjustified aggression are horrific. Russian troops are laying siege to once peaceful European cities. Tanks are tearing through towns while missiles hit homes and hospitals. Putin is responsible for civilian casualties and over 500,000 people fleeing, with the numbers still rising fast. The blood is on Putin's hands, not just of innocent Ukrainians, but the men he has sent to die. He is violating international law, including the UN Charter and multiple commitments to peace and security. He is violating human rights on an industrial scale, and the world won't stand for it. The UK stands united in condemning Russia's reprehensible behaviour. There are no shades of grey in this conflict. It is about right and wrong. This is President Putin's war against a sovereign nation. There can be no apologising or excusing it. I urge nations to condemn Russia's appalling actions and to isolate it on the international stage. Russia is now becoming a global pariah. Just last week, we joined over 40 countries at the OSCE in condemning its aggression. The Council of Europe also voted to suspend Russia. And at the UN, we joined over 80 members in backing a resolution condemning Russian aggression. Meanwhile, Russia stood alone in opposing it. This is the cost of isolation, and it's a consequence of Putin's war of choice. We must continue to lead a chorus of condemnation to show Moscow that Putin's ambitions will not succeed. This is a struggle, not just for Ukraine's freedom and self-determination, but for all our freedom and security. That is why the United Kingdom is proud to be at the forefront of support for Ukraine, economically, politically and defensively. We were the first European nation to send defensive weapons to the country and we're leading the way on humanitarian support. We've just pledged £220 million, including providing Ukraine with access to basic necessities and vital medical supplies for aid. And we call on Russia to enable unhindered humanitarian access into Ukraine and safe passage for civilians. Now is the time to come together with a strong response. We've joined forces with the United States, with the G7, with the EU, and other partners to take decisive action through sanctions. Together, we are cutting out the vast majority of Russia's banking system from the global financial system. We're using our collective heft, making up over half of the world's economy, to cut funding from Putin's war machine. And we're delivering severe economic costs through these sanctions as ordinary Russians are finding from queues at their local banks and rising interest rates. These consequences will only increase in breadth and severity as the conflict goes on. We are working to squeeze the Putin regime harder and harder by steadily tightening the vice. We're going after the highest echelons of the Russian elite, targeting President Putin personally and all of those complicit in his aggression. Nothing and no one is off the table. Yet we cannot pretend that this is the first time Russia has subjected Ukraine to such aggression. This council has heard many independent reports about widespread violations by Russia since their illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014. The Office of the High Commissioner has documented arbitrary arrests, detentions, intimidation and torture. Ukrainian political prisoners remain detained in Russia and Crimea, and many are subject to torture and denied medical care. Such abuses 
are far from limited to Ukraine. Russia continues to show contempt for freedoms people deserve worldwide. It continues to undermine Georgia's territorial integrity in breach of UN resolutions. It remains responsible for widespread violations in Syria. This goes hand in hand with what is happening to Russian people at home. The Putin regime is dogged by allegations of arbitrary detention, police brutality and torture. It continues to suppress freedom across the board, from free speech to freedom of assembly. Political opponents like Alexei Navalny continue to face grave threats. There are reports of people from the LGBT community being arrested, tortured and killed in Chechnya. And the Kremlin continues to clamp down on civil society, shutting two of its oldest NGOs, International Memorial and the Memorial Human Rights Centre. The Putin regime has left Russia's moral authority in tatters. It should be ashamed to sit in this chamber. We know many Russian people feel the same way, which is why thousands of people have been arrested across the country at anti-war protests. But no matter how hard the Putin regime tries, they cannot hide the truth. At this critical moment, members of this council must make their voices heard. Together, we can stand up to Russian aggression and back the Ukrainian people. We cannot rest in this task until Putin is stopped. Now more than ever, his regime will be held to account for its actions in Ukraine and across the world. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Excelencia, señoras y señores, este fue la última oradora de mi lista para esta reunión. Nos volvemos a reunir esta tarde a las 3 p.m. a las 3 p.m. para continuar con el segmento de alto nivel. Con esto doy por concluida la cuarta reunión del 49 o periodo de sesiones del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Muchas gracias.
Excellency, uh, distinguished colleague, ladies and gentlemen, I hereby declare open the first meeting of the 49th session of Human Rights Council. Uh, we will continue with the high-level segment. I have the honor to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Bizera Turkovic, Deputy Chairperson of the Council of Ministers and Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner for Human Rights, distinguished excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and great pleasure to have this opportunity to address you today. I would like to commend High Commissioner Michelle Bachelet and her staff for their commitment to the challenging task of protection and promotion of universal rights and freedoms. Allow me also to congratulate Ambassador Federico Belleras on taking over the important position of the President of the Human Rights Council and to express our gratitude for the dedicated work that Ambassador Khan carried out presiding over the Council in 2021. Mr. President, today is 30th anniversary of renewed independence of my country in its thousand year old history. And immediately after proclaiming independence 30 years ago, aggression started on Bosnia and Herzegovina. To remind you, only in the capital of Sarajevo, 11,441 persons have been killed, plus 1,601 child. Around 50,000 people have been wounded while overall number of shells, of grenades thrown on my city, be around half a million. All that was happening in the heart of Europe. When war concluded, we have repeated, never again. The German philosopher, George Hegel, famously said, the only thing that we learned from history is that we learn nothing from history. So there we are today. War is raging in the heart of Europe once again. Fundamental rights of people in Ukraine are being under attack and their lives have been endangered. Nobody has a right to be idle when that is happening. Mr. President, as a multicultural and multi-religious society, Bosnia and Herzegovina is devoted to, to protecting and promoting human rights and fundamental freedoms expressed through a multicultural dialogue respect for different ethnicities, cultural and religious diversity, combating all forms of discrimination and intolerance. Bosnia and Herzegovina remains committed to the implementation of our international obligations and we continue to work even further on adoption of high standards for protection of human rights in our, in our international legislation. Preamble of our constitution includes declaration on human rights and we have adopted all relevant resolutions on the protection of human rights. 
But reality is that despite our determination to uphold the highest standard of human rights, we are still missing around 7,000 of people as a consequence of the war. Mothers of Srebrenica, city where genocide has been committed 27 years ago, are dying without being able to identify bones of their children, husbands, brothers, to bury them in dignity. Our demography has been changed. More than a million people were forced to leave the country, and many of those who are internally displaced are not welcome to return back to their places where they used to live. We are a country in which law on denial of genocide and glorification of war criminals has been highly debated and rejected to be adopted in the parliament by one political party and one political player. Mr. President, the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina from 1990s has left deep scars and constant fear from the resurgence of conflicts. War in Ukraine is increasing that fear and concern that this now might be beginning of a larger trend in Western Balkan, and in particular in my country, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Playbook seen in Ukraine is similar to what we are seeing in my country as well. Blockades of state institutions and secessionist policies by one leader and by one political party. One cannot rule out that they could get supported from outside to provoke unrest and conflict in Bosnia and Herzegovina once again in order to further destabilize Europe. All this caused the more serious political and security crisis in the country since 1995. Political players threaten to call his or their friends to help in the case of resistance to his political positions, bearing in mind that Russian Federation is opposed to Bosnia's progress towards NATO and European Union. Mr. President, having the express of being faced with the most difficult forms of human rights violations during the war that happened not so long ago, we consider that strong efforts in building equality, respects for diversity, and respects for human rights a very important prerequisite for reconciliation and internal stability in post-conflict societies. Let me remind you that back in 2020, Bosnia and Herzegovina presented to this council its third periodic report on human rights within the framework of the universal periodic review mechanism. Our commitment is to continue to implement the subsequent recommendations and to work persistently and relentlessly on the implementation in the best interests of our citizens. Mr. President, the COVID-19 pandemic is still the frontline topic regarding human rights issues across the globe. The impact on our life has become an everyday challenge for all of us. Although we have been fighting this pandemic for almost three years, some groups are still more affected than others, not only by the virus, but also by the level of emergency measures taken and by the lack of access to the vaccines. This is not only a huge health crisis, 
rather this is evaluating into a humanitarian and development crisis that threatens to leave deep social, economic, and political scars in the years ahead, to widen the gap between the rich and the poor, as well as to further deepen the already existing social inequalities. In regard to gender, this emergency times that we are living in is an excellent opportunity to emphasize the importance of UNGA Resolution 1325 and its transformative potential, thus giving us an opportunity to tackle these threats, taking into consideration the gender perspective. We must ensure gender equality by appointing women from different sectors of society. In other words, we have to do our utmost to ensure that the emergency policies and decisions properly address existing inequalities and adequately contribute to reducing the gender gap. Dear friends, beside the ongoing pandemic, migration is one of the biggest challenges of today's world both for countries of region and for countries of transit and final destination of migrants. And our prospects is that this challenge will now increase even more on daily basis, considering that what is happening in Ukraine. In the last four years, about 85,000 registered migrants entered the territory of Bosnia and Herzegovina illegally. To adequately respond to the, to the multiplicity of migration pressure, Bosnia and Herzegovina has undertaken a number of activities to help the migrant population and ensure the security of our own citizens without these regarding the humanitarian aspect of the migrant crisis. In that sense, we welcome EU plans for establishment of the joint coordination platform to tackle irregular migration that will promote better coordination of measures against irregular migration along the Eastern Mediterranean, Western Balkan route, while respecting the fundamental rights for migrants. Mr. President, Bosnia and Herzegovina is a country with its own specific challenges, but we will remain consistent in our active participation and cooperation with international organizations and initiatives at the global level for protection and promotion of fundamental human rights and freedoms. Therefore, I would like to once again underline that Bosnia and Herzegovina strongly believes in the role of the Human Rights Council as one of the key bodies of the UN system in the field of peace building and stability at the global level and we are committed to our common work for a more humane and better future for all of us. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, thank you very much, Excellency. Uh, now I have the honor to give the floor uh, to His Excellency, Mr. Alfonso Sui Mokui, Sir Deputy Prime Minister of Equatorial Guinea. Please, Excellency, you have the floor. Señor Presidente, Señor Alta Comisionada, Representante de los Estados, Miembros y Observadores, Representantes de la Sociedad Civil, Señoras y señores, es un honor especial participar una vez más 
como tercer viceprimer ministro del Gobierno de la República de Guinea Ecuatorial en este 49 periodo de sesiones. Nosotros reconocemos que el Consejo de Derechos Humanos es el ámbito multilateral por su excelencia para la construcción de un diálogo que haga posible una mayor cooperación entre los Estados, una paz universal y una seguridad internacional. Dentro de esta visión, el nombre de la República de Guinea Ecuatorial, de su gobierno y de su presidente, su excelencia, Obian Guevara Ambasado, quiero a través de mi voz hacerles llegar nuestros fervientes saludos de paz, armonía y solidaridad para la promoción y la defensa de los derechos humanos en el mundo y así desearles un próspero y venturoso Año Nuevo 2022. Asimismo, hago mía las felicitaciones a las egresias personas del señor presidente del Consejo de Derechos Humanos y a la alta comisionada en un contexto de verdadera expresión de reconocimiento y homenaje que vos merecéis por la responsabilidad de dirigir estas sesiones que tienen lugar en esta memorable sala. Auguramos un buen desarrollo y éxitos en los trabajos realizados. Señor presidente, la República de Guinea Ecuatorial mantiene su compromiso de trabajar para elevar los estándares nacionales de promoción y protección de los derechos humanos, convencidos de que el respeto al Estado de Derecho es un pilar fundamental que permite aumentar la capacidad de los Estados para mejorar la calidad de vida de sus poblaciones y prevenir las violaciones a los derechos humanos y a los crímenes contra la humanidad. Mi Gobierno es consciente de que los derechos humanos deben guiar en la aplicación de los objetivos del desarrollo sostenible para lograr y conseguir un mundo cada vez más respetuoso hacia un desarrollo sostenible en los principios de igualdad, justicia y paz. La República de Guinea Ecuatorial se suma a los oradores precedentes en la constatación de, los, de las dificultades que los Estados hemos venido sufriendo con las restricciones de la pandemia del COVID-19, que sigue impidiendo el cumplimiento efectivo de nuestros compromisos internacionales. Para la respuesta a la pandemia del COVID-19, mi Gobierno ha adoptado medidas económicas para fortalecer el Sistema Nacional de Protección Social y el apoyo a las pymes, creando así un programa de garantías sociales públicas con el fin de contrarrestar el impacto socioeconómico del COVID en las familias más necesitadas. Estas garantías sociales consistían en la dispensión de kit de alimentos e higiene a familias que viven en riesgo de exclusión, a fin de que puedan satisfacer sus necesidades básicas mientras permanezcan en sus hogares por dicha pandemia. Esta gestión del Gobierno ha sido apoyada con la asistencia de las agencias del Sistema de las Naciones Unidas en el país. Señor Presidente, el Código Penal que prevé la abolición de la pena de muerte en nuestro país, así como la lucha contra la trata de personas y el tráfico de migrantes, ya se encuentra en la segunda lectura en la Cámara Alta para su aprobación. El Gobierno se ha autoimpuesto como prioridad en sus políticas públicas la protección a todas las víctimas de la trata de personas, en especial de las mujeres y niños. Esto se refleja en el Plan de Acción Nacional para la Prevención y Lucha contra la Trata de Personas. Se han cubierto los diferentes vacíos que todavía no habíamos resuelto, como es la creación de un protocolo 
de actuación inter interinstitucional para la atención y protección a las víctimas de la trata. En materia de reforzamiento de capacitación institucional, Guinea Ecuatorial ha participado en talleres sobre el fortalecimiento de las instituciones nacionales de derechos humanos, organizados por el Centro de Derechos Humanos y la Democracia para África Central, con el fin de exhortar a estas instituciones la necesidad de funcionar conforme a los principios de París. Estamos trabajando con la asistencia técnica de los expertos internacionales del sistema de las Naciones Unidas sobre la implementación y adecuación de la Convención sobre los Derechos de las Personas con Discapacidad y del Protocolo Facultativo de la Convención sobre los Derechos del Niño relativo a la participación en los conflictos armados, con el mismo apoyo técnico nos asisten en los procesos de elaboración de informes periódicos y de los mecanismos del examen periódico universal para una mejor implementación de las recomendaciones aceptadas por mi Gobierno en el último informe nacional en el tercer ciclo. Acordamos una particular importancia a los mecanismos de protección del sistema multilateral como instrumentos que sirven para el mejoramiento de la situación de los derechos humanos a nivel nacional y al fortalecimiento de la capacidad del Estado como un intercambio de mejores prácticas y a la cooperación en la formación y protección de los derechos humanos. No estamos ajenos a la profunda crisis que afronta el mundo, especialmente en las zonas afectadas con conflictos armados donde se registran ataques indiscriminados, deliberados contra la población civil y los bienes de carácter civil, escuelas, hospitales e iglesias, violando deliberadamente los derechos humanos y el derecho internacional humanitario. Exhortamos a todos los Estados miembros para que en virtud de las leyes se prohíba la venta de armas a mercenarios y demás organizaciones consideradas como violadores de los derechos humanos para salvar muchas vidas humanas. Señor Presidente, señora Alta Comisionada, mi país ha sufrido un siniestro en la zona denominada Ancoántoma en la ciudad de Bata, el día 7 de marzo del pasado año 21, dejando centenares de víctimas mortales e importantes daños materiales. Agradecemos en alto a todos los países amigos que nos ofrecieron ayuda para corresponder a las necesidades contenidas en el Plan de Respuesta y Recuperación diseñadas por el Gobierno para dicho siniestro. Mi Gobierno renueva su disponibilidad para seguir trabajando con la asistencia y la cooperación de la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de las Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos y reafirma su compromiso de dedicar esfuerzos y capacidad para alcanzar una sociedad nacional en la que los derechos humanos constituyan los valores de la convivencia pacífica y democrática. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you very much, Excellency. Now it's honor for me to give the floor uh, to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Uh, Benedetto de la Vedova, Under Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy for video message. Please. President, distinguished delegates, it's an honor to address this body on behalf of the Italian government. We are shocked and appalled by what happened in the last days on European soil. We condemn the Russian military offensive against Ukraine which represent an atrocious violation of the international law 
and of the territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. This is why, under our presidency of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe, we supported the decision to suspend the Russian Federation, which was adopted with an overwhelming majority. This is horrendously affecting densely populated areas and defenseless and innocent civilians. The impact on human rights will be catastrophic, as those in the most vulnerable situation will be the most affected. We stand close to the Ukrainian people and urge the Russian Federation to fully abide by international humanitarian law and immediately cease military actions. The crisis is a stark reminder of the deep interlinkage between peace and human rights, two of the UN pillars. In line with the motto of our last mandate on the Council Human Rights for Peace, we strongly believe that only when human rights are guaranteed to all societies can really be peaceful. Italy firmly believes in the unique role of the Human Rights Council for the promotion of human rights worldwide and fully support the High Commissioner and her office, the special procedures that have a standing invitation to Italy, the treaty bodies and all other mechanisms. In 2022, also as an observer to the Council, Italy will continue to work to advance the respect for human rights. We will campaign with determination against the death penalty and spare no efforts to get an even wider support to the ninth Unger Resolution on Universal Moratorium of Capital Executions. Let me warmly congratulate Armenia for ratifying the optional protocol on the abolition of death penalty and prize Kazakhstan, Papua New Guinea and Sierra Leone for recently outlawing capital executions. Italy believes in the necessity to preserve the rule of law as a way to promote peace and prevent conflict in accordance to the SDG 16. In the past years, the world has been severely hit by the pandemic, which struck in a harder way those persons in the most vulnerable situations, including women, children, older persons, persons with disabilities, persons belonging to ethnic and religious minorities, as well as LGBTIQ plus persons. We will continue to stand up for gender equality, women empowerment and women rights, including sexual and reproductive health and rights, and fight all forms of gender-based discrimination and violence, including harm of practices such as child, early and forced marriages and female genital mutilation. Also on the basis of our national action plan on women, peace and security. In 2022, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the establishment of the mandate of UN Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict, a milestone in the international efforts to protect children in conflict-affected areas. Italy strongly reiterates its support to this mandate and to all other initiatives to advance children's rights fighting against all forms of discrimination, including on ground of sexual orientation or gender identity, is a key commitment of Italy's action. In line with this, we recently appointed the first special envoy for the human rights of LGBTIQ plus persons in the world, a move to place that placed Italy at the forefront internationally in this area. Our action in the human rights field would not be possible without the irreplaceable role of civil society organizations and human rights defenders, including journalists and media workers, which play an essential role in documented violations and abuses worldwide and always push us to do more to protect human rights. We will continue to support their work and participation in the activities of the Council. We will not step back from addressing new emerging challenges, including the need to adopt a human rights-based approach to climate action and to ensure that human rights 
apply equally online and offline. We will also continue to work to implement the second national action plan on business and human rights adopted in 2021 in line with the UN guiding principles and the 10 plus roadmap for the next decade. We are deeply concerned by the human rights situation in many areas of the world. We strongly condemn all violations and abuses perpetrated in Afghanistan. We remain committed to standing by the Afghan people and to helping them overcome the dire humanitarian crisis. We are particularly close to the Afghan women and girls and reiterate that restrictions to their access to education and work are unacceptable. We welcome the appointment early next month of a special rapporteur for monitoring the human rights conditions in Afghanistan. The escalation of violence and the human rights violation in Myanmar, including arbitrary detentions and lack of accountability of those responsible for the coup, raise strong concern. The adoption of the new EU sanctions witnesses our determination to increase pressure on the junta. We support the ASEAN mediation work and the UNSG special envoy for an inclusive and long-lasting peace and resumption of the democratic transition process. The human rights and humanitarian situation in Syria remain particularly distressing and calls for a redouble of the UN human rights bodies efforts. The humanitarian conditions in Yemen continue to draw serious concern. All concerned parties must genuinely commit themselves to make all possible efforts to avoid targeting civilians and negotiate a peaceful solution to the conflict, facilitated by the mediation of the UN. Italy fully supports the work of the fact-finding mission on Libya, which is critical to ensure the sustainable stabilization of the country. We underline the importance of accountability for all violations and abuses of human rights and international humanitarian law, including the framework of ongoing efforts to promote national reconciliation. The human rights situation in Belarus continues to deteriorate. We urge the authorities to fully cooperate with the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights as well as with the Special Rapporteur on Belarus. We are concerned for the worsening situation in Nicaragua and the widespread violations of human rights. We call on the authorities to put an end to the crackdown against political opponents, independent media and civil society. To conclude, human rights are and will continue to be at the center of the Italian foreign policy. Let's all work together to advance them. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you, Excellency. Uh, now, I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Anthony Blinken, Secretary of the State of the United States of America for video message. Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, fellow members, the United States is pleased to rejoin the UN Human Rights Council. More than at any other point in recent history, the principles at the heart of this Council's work and the entire United Nations are being challenged. As we meet, Russia is carrying out a premeditated, unprovoked, and unjustified attack on Ukraine, violating international law, flouting the core principles of international peace and security, and creating a human rights and humanitarian crisis. Reports of Russia's human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law are mounting by the hour. Russian strikes are hitting schools, hospitals, residential buildings. They're destroying critical infrastructure, which provides millions of people across Ukraine with drinking water, gas to keep them from freezing to death, and electricity. Civilian buses, cars, even ambulances have been shelled. Russia is doing this every day across Ukraine. The High Commissioner said yesterday that Russia's attacks had killed at least 100 civilians, including children, and wounded hundreds more. 
and said she expects the real figures are much higher. And the casualties keep mounting, including the many civilians killed and wounded in Russia's monstrous rocket strikes that hit an apartment complex in Kharkiv yesterday. Russia's violence has driven over half a million Ukrainians from the country in just a few days. Children, the elderly, people with disabilities, who are making harrowing journeys through conflict zones. If President Putin succeeds in his stated goal of toppling Ukraine's democratically elected government, the human rights and humanitarian crises will only get worse. Look at Crimea, where Russians' occupation has come with extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearances, torture, arbitrary detention, the persecution of ethnic and religious minorities, the brutal repression of dissent. The Kremlin is also ramping up its repression within Russia, where, even before the invasion, it was shuttering human rights organizations and harassing, poisoning, and imprisoning anti-corruption activists and political opponents. Authorities reportedly have detained thousands of Russians peacefully protesting the invasions, as well as journalists covering the demonstrations. Russian officials issued a warning to the country's press that any reporting that refers to the assault as, quote, an attack, an invasion, or a declaration of war, end quote, in other words, that, that tells the truth, will result in media outlets being blocked and fined. And Russia's prosecutor's office said that any Russian who assists a foreign country foreign organization, or international organization during its so-called operation may be imprisoned for up to 20 years. These are the human rights abuses this council was created to stop. If we cannot come together now, when will we come together? We must send a resolute and unified message that President Putin should unconditionally stop this unprovoked attack, as the Secretary General and the High Commissioner have done and immediately withdraw Russian forces from Ukraine. We must condemn, firmly and unequivocally, Russia's attempt to topple a democratically elected government and its gross human rights abuses and violations of international humanitarian law. And we must take steps to hold the perpetrators accountable. This Council's decision to hold an urgent debate on the crisis in Ukraine is an important step toward ensuring documentation and accountability. I thank the many members who supported it. We must underscore Russia's obligation, even in its unlawful invasion, to respect international humanitarian law, including as it relates to the protection of civilians in the conflict. Council members should stop using language implying that all sides bear equal responsibility for the unprovoked attack of one side. This isn't even-handed. It's wrong and fails to place accountability where it belongs. The same goes for members who argue falsely that denouncing human rights abuses is politicizing the situation. It is failing to speak up about human rights abuses that politicizes the situation. We must reject Russia's attempts to falsely justify this attack as a defense of human rights, misappropriating terms that we reserve for the worst atrocities and disrespecting every victim of those crimes. Finally, we must press the Kremlin to respect the human rights of all Russians including the right of citizens to peacefully express dissent and journalists to report the news and provide information to the families of Russian soldiers who deserve to know the fate of loved ones killed in President Putin's war of choice. One can reasonably ask whether a UN member state that tries to take over another UN member state while committing horrific human rights abuses and causing massive humanitarian suffering should be allowed to remain on this council. Even as we focus on the crisis in Ukraine, it's far from the only part of the world where the Council's attention is needed. In Belarus, the Lukashenko regime is brutally repressing civil society and the country's pro-democracy movement, using transnational repression to silence critics abroad and enabling Russia's invasion of Ukraine. In recent days, Belarusian authorities have detained hundreds of people demonstrating peacefully against Russia's attack. In China, the government continues to commit genocide and crimes against humanity in Xinjiang, against predominantly Muslim Uyghurs and other minority groups. We urge the High Commissioner to release without delay her report on the situation there. We must redouble our efforts to address the growing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan and press the Taliban to respect the rights of all Afghans, 
including by stopping the unjust detentions of women protesters and journalists, ending reprisals, allowing all Afghans to be educated and to work in every sector. The human rights crises in Burma, Cuba, the DPRK, Iran, Nicaragua, South Sudan, Syria, Venezuela, and Yemen, among others, also demand this Council's ongoing attention. In each of these places, we must not only denounce abuses, but work to stop them and hold perpetrators accountable. Yet, at a moment when the world needs both moral clarity and unity from this Council, some governments are arguing that sovereignty gives countries the right to do whatever they want within their borders. It's no coincidence that many of the governments making this argument are systematically abusing human rights and have been eerily silent in the face of Russia's flagrant assault on Ukraine's sovereignty. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights begins with the word universal, because nations decided that there are certain rights that every person, everywhere, is entitled to enjoy. Members of this Council have a special responsibility to strengthen, not weaken, those rights. One way to do that is by welcoming scrutiny of our own records. In September, the United States issued a formal standing invitation to all UN experts who report and advise on thematic human rights issues. We urge every Council member to take this step. We know we have work to do to advance human rights at home. Every member does. What matters is that we all hold ourselves to the same standards and work to address our shortcomings, as we are doing. Here's what else you can expect from the United States on this Council. First, we're committed to working with other countries, including those we don't always agree with, to advance human rights as members have seen in their engagements with our permanent representative to the UN in Geneva, Ambassador Shiva Crocker, and our new ambassador to the Human Rights Council, Michelle Taylor. Second, we've heard repeatedly that the United States has often focused more on strengthening civil and political rights than we have on strengthening economic, social, and cultural rights. People around the world are looking to us to do both, and we hear that call. Third, we'll continue to counter anti-Israel bias and the unfair and disproportionate focus on Israel on the Council. The Commission of Inquiry and Standing Agenda Item 7 are a stain on the Council's credibility. We strongly reject them. Fourth, we'll keep fighting for the human rights of LGBTQI plus people, people with disabilities, members of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities, women and girls, and all marginalized populations and people in vulnerable situations. In recent days, people on every continent have come out to demonstrate against Russia's invasion and for the rights of Ukrainians. They understand that if we allow the rules of the international order to be flagrantly trampled anywhere, we weaken them everywhere. As an Estonian student protester put it, if Ukraine is not a country, then President Putin can say Estonia is not a country either. We stand for these rules not in opposition to any government, but rather because we see our shared interest in striving for a world where all people of all nations enjoy human rights and peace and security, and because history has shown us the darkness and suffering that comes when these rules are abandoned. People in Ukraine and around the world are looking to us to stand up and stand together. We must not let them down. Thank you, Excellency. Now I have the honor to give the floor uh, to His Excellency Mr. Vopke Orchestra, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Please, Excellency, the floor is yours. Ladies and gentlemen, for decades, we, the international community, have worked to strengthen the rules-based order in a strong conviction that we don't want to live in a world where might is right. Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine is threatening not only the lives of many innocent Ukrainians, but also the international rules-based order. The single most important structure that we have to protect our people. And that makes this 49th Council meeting of the utmost importance. 
we know that the worst human rights violations happen during armed conflict. We know that we must do everything we can to protect what we've built over the last 75 years. And we know that here in this council, we have the power to turn our collective anger into a collective response. To protect the lives and rights of innocent people and to protect the legal frameworks aimed at securing peace, justice, and human rights. The Netherlands strongly condemns Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. It is a clear and gross violation of international law, a breach of the United Nations Charter, and it, can, and it will not and cannot go unanswered. The Netherlands also strongly condemns the violence against innocent civilians. In the horrendous bombardment of Kharkiv, dozens of innocent lives were reportedly lost and many more injured. Cluster ammunition was used against civilians in residential areas. Such indiscriminate attacks are war crimes. And those directly responsible for these acts of war must be held accountable. By establishing the International Criminal Court, we gave legal expression to the moral imperative that the most serious crimes must not go unpunished. ICC Prosecutor Khan has already pointed out that the ICC may investigate any act of genocide, any crime against humanity, and any war crime committed in Ukraine since 20 February 2014. And yesterday evening he announced the opening of an investigation into the situation in Ukraine. And we call on the ICC prosecutor to pursue this as a matter of urgency. As we've seen here in the Human Rights Council many times before, with Syria, Myanmar, Yemen, the road to justice begins with the truth. Truth that can be found only through independent fact-finding and evidence-gathering. And for this reason, the Netherlands fully supports the establishment of a UN Commission of Inquiry. A commission that can ensure independent and impartial monitoring and reporting, that can collect and, and analyze evidence so that perpetrators can be identified and held accountable for their actions. In order to support the collection of evidence, we will donate 1 million euros to support the creation of a civil society accountability mechanism. And this investigative mechanism would collect and analyze information and evidence of crimes committed in Ukraine to assist criminal proceedings in the future. And this allows us to prepare for the moment when criminal proceedings can start before a national or international court. For the moment when justice will be served. Stop this mad war. That's what courageous protesters are shouting at rallies throughout Russia. Thousands of them have been arrested. There is no excuse for war. That is what the courageous Russian diplomatic correspondent, Elena Chernenko, wrote in an open letter. And she has been expelled from the diplomatic press pool. No to war. Those are the words used by the courageous Russian television host, Ivan Urgant. The show has not been aired since. Ladies and gentlemen, let me be crystal clear. With just a fraction of the courage of these people, we, the members of the Human Rights Council, can help protect the human rights that are at risk and are being violated today. Those of Ukrainians who have the right to live in peace, freedom, and safety, who have the right to democracy, who have the right to be informed through free and independent media. The same rights we all have. 
Yet the reality is that Ukrainian civilians are being killed right now. The democracy is under threat and that Russian cyber attacks and disinformation have been going on for years. Similarly, Russian protesters have the right to gather peacefully. Russian news reporters have the right to report freely. And Russian citizens have the right to know the facts and be informed. Yet the reality is that their rights too are being severely violated and we cannot condone these violations. Ladies and gentlemen, if we do not act and show courage now, we are undermining the significance of this very council, undermining the rules-based international legal order we shaped together. Because the attack on Ukraine is also an attack on the United Nations Charter, an attack from within by a permanent member of the UN Security Council and a member of this council. The UN was established out of a conviction that we need to solve problems together. And the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted out of a strong belief, a strong belief that we must protect the values we all share and stand for. And today, that is exactly what we must do. The Netherlands calls upon the members of this Council to stand united, to ensure that the road to justice starts here. Membership of this Council is not a free right. It comes with responsibilities to all of us. And one of them, one of them, ladies and gentlemen, is to ensure that justice and accountability are not empty words. They must lead to actions and we owe that to the victims. Therefore, the Netherlands will also support the UN Human Rights Office with an additional 1 million euros so that it can strengthen its field presence in Ukraine. We call on all members of the Human Rights Council, we call on all of you to support all efforts to end this conflict and to achieve justice and accountability for all the crimes committed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Excellency. Now I have the call to, uh, I have the honor to give the call to His Excellency Mr. Saifuddin Abdullah, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Malaysia for a video message. Excellency, you have the floor. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner for Human Rights, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. At the outset, allow me to congratulate Ambassador Federico Vichegas on his election as the President of the HRC, as well as members of the Bureau to steer this August body. I wish to thank the international community for their support of Malaysia's HRC membership for the 2022-2024 term. I reaffirm Malaysia's commitment to deliver on our pledges and foster constructive engagement, inclusivity, understanding and mutual respect at our discourse at the Council based on the principle of peaceful coexistence. Malaysia will strive to become a mediator for peace, a facilitator for collaboration and a builder of consensus. As we enter the third year of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are still far from overcoming the deadly virus, with new variants spreading faster and wider than the rate of the global vaccine distribution. It is in these uncertain times that we have to unite for humanity. We must work together to collectively address our shared global challenges, recover better and build back stronger. We must work hand in hand and intensify our efforts to ensure vaccine equity and that no one is left behind. In this spirit, Malaysia has contributed almost 900,000 doses of vaccine 
and 23 million units of equipment, including face masks and medical gloves to countries in need. Mental health has also emerged as a silent parallel pandemic evidenced by the rising case of repression, anxiety, and suicide worldwide. In October 2021, Malaysia launched the National Strategic Plan for Mental Health, which emphasizes intersectoral collaboration and crisis preparedness to ensure early intervention for mental health issues. Malaysia also plans to further highlight the issue of mental health and human rights in the context of the public service in upcoming council sessions. We hope to raise greater awareness on the mental health situation among public servants during the pandemic and we welcome the collaboration of interested parties. In recent development, last October, Malaysia co-sponsored a groundbreaking HRC resolution recognizing that enjoying a clean, healthy and sustainable environment is a human right. We are committed to conserving planetary health as we aspire to achieve a net zero greenhouse gas emission target by 2050. At the national level, we established the Climate Change Action Council to discuss and set the policy direction to this end. I now would like to draw attention to the escalating situation in Ukraine that threatens to evolve into another humanitarian and human rights quagmire. Malaysia strongly urges all concerned parties to urgently take steps to de-escalate and prevent further loss of lives and devastation. Malaysia had experienced firsthand the brutality of the conflict in Ukraine with the downing of Flight MH17 in 2014, resulting in the tragic loss of innocent life. We do not wish to see further victims caught in the unfortunate conflicts, especially civilians and the vulnerable groups. We call on all parties to respect the basic principles of sovereignty and territorial integrity, as well as international humanitarian and human rights laws. All efforts must be vigorously pursued and accelerated to seek a peaceful and amicable solution to the conflict based on international law and the UN Charter. Malaysia will also continue to highlight long-standing humanitarian and human rights challenges, particularly the plight of the Palestinian people and the Rohingya refugees. Decades of Israel's gross human rights abuses and apartheid practices must stop, and the international community must uphold the Palestinians' right to self-determination. Malaysia is also disappointed that the predicament of the Rohingya refugees has not improved. Finding a long-term solution requires addressing the root causes and guaranteeing accountability which could enable their safe, voluntary and dignified return to Rakhine. As an ASEAN member state, Malaysia will continue to work with all stakeholders towards the implementation of the five-point consensus and ultimately an amicable and sustainable solution for Myanmar's return to the path of democracy. We believe that the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy and the ASEAN Chair's Special Envoy on Myanmar can play a pivotal role in ensuring inclusive engagement and bringing all stakeholders to the table. Malaysia stands ready to play a constructive role towards this end. Thank you. I thank you, Excellency. Uh, now, uh, it's honor for me to invite uh, Her Excellency Ms. Najla Mohamad, Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Government of In National Unity of Libya. Excellency, the floor is yours. Saadat Sayyid Federico Tigas, Rais Majlis Hukuk al Insan. سعادة السيدة ميشيل باشليت المفوضية السامية لحقوق الإنسان أصحاب الفخامة والمعالي والسعادة السيدة والسيدات 
بداية يطيب لي أن أنتهز هذه الفرصة لوهنئ السيد فريدريكو بيكاس على توليه رئاسة المجلس وكذلك السادة النواب أعضاء مكتب الرئاسة وأتمنى لهم التوفيق في إدارة أعمال المجلس خلال هذه السنة سيد الرئيس إن حقوق الإنسان واحترامها لم تعد مسألة داخلية تهم الدول والحكومات فحسب بل شأنا عالميا يهمنا جميعا كأعضاء في المجتمع الدولي ولهذا نحن جميعا ملزمين بأن نعمل سويا وبشكل جماعي على تعزيز احترام حقوق الإنسان في كل مكان في العالم لقد اختبرت جائحة كوفيد التضامن الدولي والجهد الإنساني المشترك لحماية وضمان الحقوق الأساسية في الحياة والصحة والتنقل وأظهرت هذه الجائحة مدى احتياج المنظمات الدولية والدول الأعضاء إلى مزيد من التنسيق والتعاون والمثابرة والإصلاح لأجل مواجهة التحديات التي تواجه البشرية عموما وحقوق الإنسان بشكل خاص إن عالمنا اليوم أمام مفترق طرق فمبادئ حقوق الإنسان التي كانت حاضرة في أذهان واضعي ميثاق الأمم المتحدة الذي نص على احترامها هي أحد الدعائم الرئيسية للأمم المتحدة لا يمكن تجزئتها اليوم ونحن نواجه سيلا من المخاطر ما بين أوبئة وكوارث بيئية وحروب ولعل الاعتداء الأخير على سيادة الجمهورية الأوكرانية ينبهنا جميعا لأهمية هذه المبادئ وخاصة مبدأ احترام سيادة الدول واستقلالها وسيادة أراضيها ومنع استخدام القوة لتسوية النزاعات وأنه قد حان الوقت لأن تجسد الدول احترامها الفعلي لهذه المواثيق الدولية سيد الرئيس بلادي أيضا لا زالت تعاني من تداعيات حرب الوكالة رغم أننا استطعنا عبر الحوار وبدعم الأمم المتحدة والدول الصديقة أن نخرج من الحرب للسلام الذي نود اليوم الحفاظ عليه لحماية شعبنا وأمتنا وأمن المنطقة إلا لأننا لازلنا في مرحلة حساسة من تاريخنا ونسعى إلى تحقيق الاستقرار وإرساء دعائم الديمقراطية ودولة القانون والمؤسسات بعد سنوات من الصراعات المسلحة والانقسام السياسي لاحت الليبيين بارقة أمل بعد اختتام ملتقى الحوار الوطني الليبي والتوصل إلى اتفاق جنيف مطلع العام الماضي الذي أنهى النزاع المسلح ومهد لتشكيل حكومة الوحدة الوطنية التي تعمل على تعزيز حالة السلم والبدء في مسار المصالحة الوطنية وإعادة البناء وكان نصب أعينها أيضا العمل على إنجاز الاستحقاق الانتخابي الرئاسي والبرلماني والذي كان مقررا له أن يكون في الرابع والعشرين من ديسمبر من العام الماضي ولكن تحديات جمة لوجستية وتشريعية حالت دون إنجاز هذا الاستحقاق إن المشاركة الديمقراطية وحق المواطنين في اختيار سلطته التشريعية والتنفيذية هو حق أساسي من حقوق الإنسان ولبنة أساسية في بناء دولة القانون والمؤسسات وتعمل حكومة, الدف... حكومة الوحدة الوطنية بمشاركة واسعة من مختلف مكونات الطيف السياسي الليبي على توفير المناخ الملائم لإجراء الانتخابات البرلمانية والرئاسية في أقرب الأجال سيد الرئيس أن حكومة الوحدة الوطنية وانطلاقا من مسؤوليتها الأخلاقية والقانونية تعمل جاهدة على تأزيز حقوق الإنسان وضمان تمتع المواطنين بحقوقهم الأساسية دون تمييز وفي هذا الصدد أطلقت الحكومة مبادرة لمراجعة أوضاع المحتجزين والمعتقلين داخل كافة السجون والمعتقلات حرصا منها على الحد من حالات الاحتجاز التعسفي والغير قانوني كما تعمل على ضمان عودة النازحين داخليا إلى بيوتهم ومناطقهم من خلال حملات إعادة الحياة التي شهدتها المناطق التي كانت مسرحا للصراع المسلح كما أعدت الحكومة قانونا يهدف إلى تجريم خطاب الكراهية تمهيدا لعرضه على مجلس النواب وإقراره إدراكا من الحكومة لأهمية ملاحقة مرتكبي انتهاكات حقوق الإنسان ومنع الإفلات من العقاب فقد تعاونت مع السلطة القضائية لأجل تسريع وتيرة التحقيقات في هذه الانتهاكات ولسيما تلك لاستطالة المدنيين وتمكين أسر الضحايا من التعرف على ذويهم وتقديم المتهمين إلى القضاء لينالوا جزائهم العادل وفي هذا الصدد فإن حكومة الوحدة الوطنية بالتعاون مع بعثتنا في جنيف لزيارة ليبيا والالتقاء بالأشخاص وزيارة المواقع التي ترغب البعثة في زيارتها خصوصا مع البعثة التقصي الحقائق الدولية التي شكلها مجلسكم الموقر أما على صعيد الحقوق الاقتصادية والاجتماعية فقد عملت الحكومة على تحسين مستوى المعيشة وذلك بإقرار حزمة من الإجراءات التي تهدف إلى رفع مستوى الدخل لكثير من الفئات والشرائح المجتمعية فضلا عن إنشاء صناديق لإعمار المدن والمناطق الأكثر تضرما وعلى صعيد التعامل مع جائحة كورونا 
وحماية المواطنين والمقيمين من هذا الوباء فإن حكومة الوحدة الوطنية تعمل على استجلاب الجرعات الكافية من اللقاحات للمواطنين المقيمين على أراضيها بما فيهم ذلك المهاجرين الغير نظاميين وقد أطلقت حملة واسعة لتشجيع الجميع على تلقيها سيد الرئيس إن الهجرة البشرية هي ظاهرة إنسانية عالمية حيث شهد العالم عبر تاريخه الطويل موجات من هذه الهجرات وهي ما شكلت عالمنا المتنوع اليوم وتعد بلادي وبحكم موقعها الجغرافي معبرا رئيسيا للراغبين في الهجرة من الجنوب إلى الشمال وسبيلا للطامحين إلى عيش أفضل خارج حدود بلدانهم مما شكل أعباء إضافية على بلادي وموالدها الوطنية التي تعاني مصاعب جدة نتيجة حالة عدم الاستقرار كما عرض هؤلاء المهاجرين لأخطار كثيرة ومنها وقوعهم فريسة للجريمة المنظمة العابرة للحلود ولعصابات التهريب البشري والاتجار بهم مما أدى إلى الوقوع في كثير من الانتهاكات التي طالت هؤلاء المهاجرين وتعمل حكومة بلادي على محاربة هذه العصابات الإجرامية ونجحت في تحرير كثير من هؤلاء المهاجرين من قبضتهم إلا أنه ينبغي التأكيد على أن بلادي لا تستطيع وحدها معالجة هذه الظاهرة العالمية إنما يستدعي ذلك جهدا أمميا ودوليا وإقليميا يجمع دول المصدر والعبور والمقصد لأجل وضع حد لهذه الظاهرة أو تنظيمها بحيث يكفل للراغبين في الهجرة سبيلا قانونيا وأمنا يمكنهم من تحقيق طموحاتهم سيد الرئيس إن ضمان واحترام حقوق الإنسان وتعزيزها من المبادئ والقيم الإنسانية التي تستوجب تكثيف الجهود والتعاون الدؤوب بين أعضاء المجتمع الدولي من خلال مؤسساته وأطره القانونية الدولية والإقليمية وعلى المستويات الوطنية وفي هذا السياق فإن بلادي تحرص كل الحرص على ترسيخ هذه المبادئ والقيم رغم أنها تمر بمرحلة انتقالية وتتلمس طريقها نحو الديمقراطية ودولة القانون والمؤسسات وهو ما يؤكد العمل الذي تطلع به من خلال عضويتها في مجلسكم الموقر وبكل شفافية تؤكد التزامها بالآلية التي أقرها المجلس المتمثلة في بعثة تقصي الحقائق الدولية في ليبيا في إطار البند العاشر المتعلق بالتعاون الفني وبناء القدرات وهي تتطلع إلى أن تنهي هذه البعثة أعمالها بعد أن تقدم تقريرها النهائي في المدة المحدد لها بموجب القرار 25 على 48 سيد الرئيس تتطلع بلادي إلى شراكة فاعلة مع المجتمع الدولي لأجل تحقيق الأمن والاستقرار والتنمية في ليبيا والمنطقة من خلال الدعوة الصادقة إلى معالجة أسباب وجذور الأزمات بشتى أشكالها من حروب وفقر وإرهاب وتغير مناخي وجريمة وإيجاد الحلول الناجعة لها كما تتطلع بلادي لمواكبة الرؤية المستقبلية المتمثلة في أهداف التنمية المستدامة 2030 وأهداف أفريقيا 2063 واللتان يصبوان إلى تحقيق مجتمعات تنعم بالعدالة والأمن والاستقرار ختاما حقوق الإنسان لا تتجزأ كما ندين الاعتداء على أوكرانيا ندين الاعتداء على أخوتنا في فلسطين ندين الاعتداء والتدخلات الأجنبية في كافة الدول التي تصارع في المنطقة العربية ونتمنى السلام للجميع شكرا ونتمنى لكم التوفيق في هذه الأعمال الدورة Uh, to Her Excellency Ms. Carolina Maldiva, uh, Acting Minister for Foreign Affairs of Chile for video message. Yes. Señor Presidente, Señora Alta Comisionada, Excelencias, me dirijo a ustedes en representación de Chile durante este segmento de alto nivel de la 49 ª sesión del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Chile condena la agresión armada de Rusia y la violación a la soberanía e integridad de Ucrania y reitera su llamado al diálogo para encontrar una solución pacífica al conflicto como establece el artículo 2 de la Carta de Naciones Unidas. Tanto Rusia como Ucrania son miembros del Consejo de Derechos Humanos y como tales entendemos que se han comprometido con el respeto a los más altos estándares de protección de los derechos humanos. Hacemos un llamado a Rusia para que retire sus tropas, respete la integridad territorial y soberanía de Ucrania y evite la pérdida de vidas inocentes y daños materiales, respetando los convenios de Ginebra. Deseo manifestar la solidaridad del pueblo de Chile con los millones de personas en Ucrania afectadas por esta guerra. Chile abriga la esperanza de que prevalezca el diálogo y las negociaciones para prevenir un mayor escalamiento de este conflicto que amenaza la paz y seguridad internacionales. Señor Presidente, para Chile el Consejo de Derechos Humanos es el principal espacio de cooperación, 
diálogo y consenso en materia de derechos humanos de Naciones Unidas. Defendemos la necesidad de un orden multilateral que reconozca la interrelación profunda entre las dimensiones de paz y seguridad, democracia y participación, desarrollo sostenible e inclusión y los derechos humanos. Para comenzar, queremos aprovechar esta oportunidad para respaldar la labor que realiza la Alta Comisionada de Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos, señora Michelle Bachelet, cuya voz independiente, unida a las múltiples acciones emprendidas bajo su dirección, son de la mayor relevancia para cautelar la vigencia de los derechos humanos en las complejas circunstancias del tiempo presente. Señor Presidente, Excelencias, Chile aboga por el fortalecimiento de los mecanismos multilaterales de promoción y protección de los derechos humanos, tanto universales como regionales. Y es en consideración a tales propósitos que queremos reiterar que el Gobierno de Chile ha presentado su candidatura al Consejo de Derechos Humanos de Naciones Unidas para el periodo 2023-2025, cuya elección tendrá lugar en Nueva York durante la 77 séptima sesión de la Asamblea General en noviembre de 2022. Esta candidatura permitirá a nuestro país reafirmar su compromiso con la promoción y protección de los derechos humanos como eje rector del Estado de Chile y de sus políticas públicas. La promoción de la democracia, los derechos humanos y el Estado de Derecho son pilares fundamentales de la política exterior de Chile. Por eso, Chile es parte de los principales tratados e instrumentos internacionales de derechos humanos que protegen los derechos civiles, políticos, económicos, sociales y culturales, los de la mujer, el niño, los pueblos originarios, las minorías y otros grupos vulnerables. Señor Presidente, estimados representantes, nuestra candidatura se plantea en un momento desafiante para el trabajo del Consejo, dada la necesidad de revitalizar el multilateralismo y el reconocimiento de nuevas realidades en materia de derechos humanos, particularmente en el ámbito de derechos civiles y políticos y en materia de género y derechos de la mujer. La agenda de género es para nuestro país una prioridad en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Por ello, Chile es coordinador, junto con Canadá, de los dos paneles que se realizan en el debate anual de los derechos de las mujeres durante las sesiones de junio del Consejo de Derechos Humanos, abordando esta materia desde distintos ámbitos que comprenden la equidad de género, la violencia contra la mujer, los derechos sexuales y reproductivos, la participación de la mujer en el ámbito público, entre otras temáticas. Quiero hacerles presente que mi país, luego de 20 años, finalmente ratificó el protocolo facultativo de la CEDAW, depositándolo en la Secretaría General de las Naciones Unidas el 12 de marzo de 2020. Señor Presidente, estimados representantes, Chile valora la universalidad, la igualdad de trato, el diálogo y la cooperación que se desprenden del mecanismo del examen periódico universal en los términos dispuestos por la resolución 60-251. Nuestro país participa en los exámenes periódicos de todos los estados y lo considera una herramienta única de revisión entre pares para promover la universalidad, la interdependencia, la indivisibilidad e interrelación de todos los derechos humanos. Las prioridades establecidas por Chile cuando emite recomendaciones a los estados son la ratificación de instrumentos internacionales de derechos humanos, el fortalecimiento institucional de derechos humanos, el combate a la discriminación y violencia basados en la orientación sexual, identidad y expresión de género y las características sexuales, la prevención y protección contra la tortura, la abolición o moratoria en el uso de la pena de muerte. Por otra parte, Chile considera que los procedimientos especiales son un mecanismo central de la promoción y protección de los derechos humanos y un aporte sustancial al desarrollo progresivo de estos. Desde el año 2009, Chile tiene una invitación abierta y permanente y lleva una política de plena cooperación con los procedimientos especiales y es parte del grupo de amigos de dichos procedimientos. Señor Presidente, estimados representantes, los grandes desafíos que enfrenta la humanidad, como el cambio climático, la pandemia ocasionada por la COVID-19 y la desigualdad, son todas cuestiones que deben enfrentarse con un enfoque de derechos humanos. 
En este sentido, Chile apoya la creación de un instrumento internacional jurídicamente vinculante que permita enfrentar de mejor manera, con mayor solidaridad y cooperación, las futuras emergencias sanitarias. Señor Presidente, estimados representantes, la construcción de una sociedad democrática y respetuosa de los derechos humanos es una labor constante y es un compromiso ininterrumpido del Estado de Chile desde su retorno a la democracia en 1990. Para ello, nuestro país se compromete a seguir desplegando sus esfuerzos institucionales para lograr justicia, verdad y plena reparación de todas las violaciones de los derechos humanos ocurridas durante la dictadura de 1973 a 1989. Por otro lado, en el año 2019, Chile vivió diversas movilizaciones sociales que obligaron al gobierno a decretar estados de excepción constitucional y a realizar grandes esfuerzos para mantener el orden público y la seguridad de las personas. En el contexto de esa crisis, nuestro país extendió una invitación a la Oficina de la Alta Comisionada de las Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos, a la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos y a otras organizaciones para visitar Chile y se ha comprometido a fortalecer las investigaciones por los hechos denunciados durante las movilizaciones sociales y así como a adoptar todas las medidas legales y políticas para garantizar su no repetición. Señor Presidente, estimados representantes, para finalizar queremos reiterar el compromiso de Chile en orden a seguir trabajando por ser cada día un miembro activo de la comunidad internacional, la que está llamada a la noble tarea de lograr el mejoramiento constante del escenario de los derechos humanos en todos los rincones del mundo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Excellency. Maintenant, uh, j'ai l'honneur de donner la parole à Son Excellence Madame Erlène Cantonella Dembet Damas, ministre de la Justice du Gabon. S'il vous plaît, Votre Excellence. Monsieur le Président du Conseil des droits de l'homme, Monsieur le Secrétaire général, Madame le Haut-Commissaire, Mesdames et Messieurs les délégués, Mesdames et Messieurs, c'est pour moi un honneur et un plaisir renouvelé de prendre la parole devant cette auguste Assemblée à l'occasion de ce segment de haut niveau de la 49e session du Conseil des droits de l'homme après deux années d'absence du fait de la pandémie de la COVID-19. Ces retrouvailles sont encourageantes, car elles apportent une lueur d'espoir quant à un retour à la vie normale dans nos pays respectifs, et ce, grâce aux efforts communs de nos États. À ce titre, le Gabon, le Gabon n'a ménagé aucun effort dans la lutte contre cette pandémie, en prenant des mesures préventives, courageuses, appropriées, et en adoptant une stratégie nationale de vaccination dont l'efficacité a permis de réduire irrémédiablement la circulation du virus. À tous, je vous prie de recevoir par ma voix les chaleureuses salutations des autorités gabonaises, en tête desquelles son Excellence Ali Bongo Ndimba, président de la République, chef de l'État. Qu'il me soit également permis d'adresser nos vives félicitations à M. Frédérico Villegas, ambassadeur représentant permanent de la République d'Argentine, pour sa désignation à la présidence du Conseil des droits de l'homme pour l'année 2022. Enfin, je voudrais exprimer notre haute appréciation à Madame Michelle Bachelet, au commissaire aux droits de l'homme, pour son leadership indéfectible et ses orientations au cours de ces deux dernières années difficiles. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président, Excellence, en prenant la parole au cours de ce segment de haut niveau, je tiens tout d'abord à réitérer de façon solennelle l'attachement de mon pays 
aux droits de l'homme et aux libertés fondamentales, telles qu'ils découlent des instruments juridiques internationaux auxquels nous sommes partis. Cet attachement se traduit par les efforts consentis et les actions menées, tant au niveau international qu'au niveau national, en faveur de la promotion et du renforcement de la garantie des droits de l'homme. Au plan international, mon pays se réjouit d'avoir présenté son septième rapport périodique devant le Comité pour l'élimination de la discrimination à l'égard des femmes les 8 et 9 février 2022, lors de la 81e session. En outre, il a transmis son premier rapport périodique au titre de la Convention contre les disparitions forcées le 7 février 2022. Cette volonté et cette détermination du Gabon à coopérer avec les mécanismes des droits de l'homme se poursuivront, sans doute au cours des mois à venir, avec la transmission d'autres rapports, notamment les rapports relatifs à la Convention contre les discriminations raciales, à la Convention contre la torture, au Pacte international sur les droits économiques, sociaux et culturels et à l'examen périodique universel prévu pour le mois d'octobre 2022. Par ailleurs, dans le cadre de son mandat au sein du Conseil des droits de l'homme, le Gabon poursuit une politique d'engagement actif à travers des initiatives prises en sa capacité nationale d'une part et par le soutien accordé à ses pairs et groupes d'appartenance d'autre part. À ce titre, nous nous réjouissons de l'adoption par consensus le 12 juillet 2021 de la résolution A bar HCR 47 bar L2 intitulée « Gestion de l'hygiène menstruelle, de droits humains et égalité des sexes » initié par notre pays et présenté sous la bannière du groupe africain. Cette résolution, qui souligne l'importance d'une gestion optimale et efficace de l'hygiène menstruelle dans la réalisation des droits des femmes et des filles, vise à impulser une nouvelle dynamique législative et institutionnelle pour la matérialisation de l'égalité des sexes et la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable pour 2030. À ce sujet, nous voudrions pouvoir compter sur l'implication de tous les États lors du panel de discussion qui se tiendra à l'occasion de la 50e session du Conseil des droits de l'homme au mois de juin prochain. Au niveau national et avec l'appui technique constant du Haut Commissariat aux droits de l'homme, à travers son bureau basé à Yaoundé, de nombreuses actions ont été menées en vue de promouvoir et garantir les droits de l'homme au bénéfice de l'ensemble de nos concitoyens. À cet effet, en novembre dernier, trois ateliers de renforcement des capacités ont été organisés en faveur des magistrats et des membres du comité de, de pilotage du plan de veille et des ripostes contre l'épidémie de COVID-19, ainsi qu'aux membres des institutions nationales des droits de l'homme de la sous-région Afrique centrale. Il, a, il en est de même de la mise en œuvre d'une vaste politique publique en matière de réduction des inégalités hommes-femmes et de lutte contre les violences faites aux femmes en conformité avec l'esprit de la Convention sur l'élimination de toutes les formes de discrimination à l'égard des femmes, les objectifs de développement durable pour 2030, le programme d'action de Beijing de 1995 et à l'appel à l'action du secrétaire général des Nations Unies pour les droits humains lancé en 2020. Dans le cadre de cette vaste politique publique, dite Gabon Égalité, élaborée à partir d'une analyse situationnelle de la condition de la femme dans tous les aspects de sa vie, 33 mesures ont été adoptées et mises en application depuis septembre 2021, sur la base de trois lois essentielles la loi portant modification de certaines dispositions du Code pénal, la loi portant modification de certaines dispositions du Code civil et la loi spécifique portant élimination des violences faites aux femmes. Au plan pénal, les modifications apportées ont permis l'introduction de nouvelles infractions 
telles que la discrimination, le harcèlement moral et le viol conjugal, le renforcement des peines applicables à celles-ci avec l'intégration de circonstances aggravantes, lorsque ces violences sont le fait des membres de la famille et la sanction des dépositaires de l'autorité de l'État qui se rendraient coupables de contraintes ou de pressions à l'endroit des femmes victimes de violences pour les amener à renoncer à leurs droits. Par ailleurs, cette loi intègre la notion d'état de détresse de la femme au titre des cas limitativement énumérés permettant l'interruption volontaire de grossesse. Au plan civil, les réformes portent principalement sur le rallongement des délais de déclaration de naissance, l'interdiction de toute condition à la délivrance d'un acte de naissance, le rehaussement de l'âge nubile qui passe de 15 à 18 ans, la garantie du libre exercice d'une activité salariale par les femmes, l'introduction de la notion de divorce par consentement mutuel avec une procédure particulière, l'insertion de la violence exercée par l'un des conjoints comme cause de divorce pour faute. S'agissant de la loi portant élimination des violences faites aux femmes, elle prévoit un ensemble de dispositions en vue d'assurer une meilleure prise en charge des victimes. En premier lieu, elle précise et définit toutes les formes de violence, notamment les violences physiques, psychologiques, morales, les violences sexuelles et les violences patrimoniales, patrimoniales et les violences économiques, que celles-ci soient faites en milieu familial ou professionnel. En deuxième lieu, elle met en place au bénéfice des femmes victimes de violences des mesures allant de la sensibilisation, la prévention dans tous les domaines, la gratuité du droit à l'information, à l'aide sociale et à l'assistance juridique, les droits liés au travail, à des mesures coercitives telles que l'ordonnance de protection délivrée par le juge en vue de préserver la sécurité de la victime en danger. Enfin, cette loi instaure un Observatoire national des droits de la femme. En vue de garantir l'application effective de ces réformes, des sessions de formation ont été organisées sur l'ensemble du territoire national, à l'endroit des personnels judiciaires et auxiliaires de justice. Une vaste campagne de sensibilisation des populations se poursuit actuellement, avec la participation et l'implication de tous les acteurs de la société civile. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, dans son souci constant de garantir l'effectivité de la jouissance des droits de l'homme aux personnes les plus vulnérables, le gouvernement gabonais, sur instruction du président de la République, chef de l'État, met actuellement en œuvre une politique nationale de gestion des détentions et des peines, destinée à apporter des solutions adéquates et pérennes pour améliorer le fonctionnement des services judiciaires et pénitentiaires. Cette politique sera renforcée par une autre politique d'insertion et de réinsertion des détenus, actuellement en cours d'élaboration et qui permettra de lutter contre la récidive et de resocialiser les personnes sortant de prison. Monsieur le Président, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, comme vous le savez, le Gabon entame sa deuxième année comme membre du Conseil des droits de l'homme. À ce titre, nous sommes déterminés à soutenir le rôle actif du Conseil dans l'élaboration d'outils qui nous servent de base pour la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme et renforcer le travail de conseil, du Conseil en matière de respect des droits de l'homme. Dans un contexte où les défis prennent une dimension de plus en plus mondiale et où nos destins inéluctablement liés les uns aux autres, il nous appartient de consolider davantage la solidarité internationale pour parvenir à un monde plus prospère, plus juste et plus équitable. Il ne me reste qu'à vous renouveler mes remerciements et à réitérer l'engagement et la mobilisation du peuple gabonais pour contribuer à la réalisation de notre objectif commun, à savoir la garantie de l'universalité des droits de l'homme.
Je vous remercie. Je vous remercie, euh, Excellence. Oui. Uh, I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency Mr. Juan Carlos Olguin, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Human Mobility of Ecuador for video message. Please. Distinguidos jefes de Estado, ministros, autoridades, señoras y señores. Es un honor intervenir en el marco de este segmento de alto nivel de esta sesión ordinaria del Consejo de Derechos Humanos de las Naciones Unidas. Deseo reiterar el compromiso inquebrantable del Ecuador con el respeto, promoción y protección de los derechos humanos en línea con el cumplimiento de la Agenda 2030 para el Desarrollo Sostenible. Mi país ha ratificado todas las convenciones e instrumentos internacionales sobre derechos humanos y colabora abierta y permanentemente con todos los mecanismos y procedimientos especiales de las Naciones Unidas. La pandemia de la COVID-19 ha impactado en todo el mundo y en el Ecuador no fuimos la excepción. Nuestro país tuvo una situación de emergencia sanitaria, económica y social. Sin embargo, el gobierno nacional supo manejar responsablemente los recursos disponibles, desplegando todos sus esfuerzos para atender la crisis. Como resultado, en ocho meses de esta administración, el éxito de la vacunación es indudable y hoy tenemos la buena noticia de comunicar que más del 83% de la población se encuentra completamente vacunada, un logro del gobierno y del pueblo ecuatoriano que también fue posible gracias a la cooperación internacional, incluida la vacunación de la población guaorani, para proteger a este pueblo indígena que se encuentra en el aislamiento voluntario en el corazón de la Amazonía ecuatoriana. Deseo recordar que el Ecuador presentó hace un año, en conjunto con Azerbaiyán, en nombre del Movimiento de Países No Alineados, la resolución denominada Garantía del Derecho a la Salud a través del acceso equitativo y universal a las vacunas en la respuesta a pandemias y otras emergencias sanitarias la cual fue adoptada por unanimidad por el Consejo de Derechos Humanos y recibió el respaldo de una gran cantidad de países, tema en el que debemos continuar trabajando, pues aún existen problemas en el acceso equitativo a las vacunas. Nuestro Plan Nacional de Desarrollo 2021-2025 se fundamenta en principios de democracia, de diversidad, solidaridad, transparencia y lucha contra la corrupción, y busca, entre otros objetivos, garantizar los derechos humanos, erradicar la pobreza, fomentar la inclusión social y alcanzar la prosperidad. El Ecuador ha demostrado su permanente preocupación por incrementar la protección de las personas y grupos más vulnerables de la sociedad. En materia de derechos de niñas, niños y adolescentes, estamos impulsando programas para reducir la pobreza y eliminar la desnutrición crónica infantil. Continuamos defendiendo los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Estamos comprometidos con la defensa de los derechos de las personas con discapacidad, materia en la que el liderazgo de Ecuador ha trascendido a nivel mundial. El Ecuador es parte de todas las convenciones internacionales para la promoción y protección de los derechos de las mujeres. Promovemos que se cumplan los instrumentos internacionales que permitan alcanzar la igualdad de género y que se adopten medidas para prevenir, erradicar, judicializar y sancionar la violencia contra las mujeres. Sobre ello, por primera vez en la historia del país, se cuadruplicó el presupuesto destinado a la prevención y erradicación de este tipo de violencia. Nuestro país ha dado pasos muy importantes hacia el reconocimiento y respeto de las diversidades en todas sus formas. Creamos una unidad administrativa en la función ejecutiva que permitirá construir la primera política pública integral para prevenir y erradicar todas las formas de violencia y discriminación por orientación sexual y diversidad sexogenérica. En materia de derechos de las personas privadas de la libertad, el Gobierno Nacional tiene previsto presentar en las próximas semanas una política de rehabilitación social con enfoque de derechos humanos elaborada con el apoyo del Sistema de Naciones Unidas y la Oficina de la Alta Comisionada para los Derechos Humanos. 
mi país continuará promoviendo la elaboración e implementación de estándares internacionales en materia de empresas y derechos humanos. En tal sentido, el representante permanente del Ecuador ante las Naciones Unidas en Ginebra continuará desde la presidencia del Grupo de Trabajo Intergubernamental de Composición Abierta en la elaboración de un instrumento internacional jurídicamente vinculante sobre las empresas transnacionales y otras empresas de negocios con respecto a los derechos humanos. En el plano doméstico, el Ecuador continúa elaborando un plan de acción nacional sobre empresas y derechos humanos bajo los principios rectores de las Naciones Unidas. En materia de lucha contra la corrupción, el Ecuador firmó un memorando de entendimiento con la Oficina de las Naciones Unidas contra la Droga y el Delito, documento que nos permitirá establecer mecanismos para alcanzar integridad, transparencia y rendición de cuentas. El Ecuador continuará participando activamente en la discusión de los principales temas de interés de la agenda de este Consejo. Esperamos que las lecciones que la pandemia nos ha dejado permanezcan para que siempre en nuestra memoria estén como objetivos fundamentales y que todas las dificultades que hemos superado constituyan la base de un nuevo entendimiento entre los pueblos. Muchísimas gracias. I thank you. Uh, now I have the honor to give the floor uh, to Her Excellency Miss Wendy Carolina Morales Urbina, Attorney General of Nicaragua, for video message. Excelentísimo señor Federico Villegas, Presidente del Consejo de Derechos Humanos de la Organización de Naciones Unidas. Señoras y señores representantes de los Estados miembros, señoras y señores miembros y observadores, apreciados representantes de organizaciones internacionales. El Gobierno de Reconciliación y Unidad Nacional de Nicaragua, en esta sesión del Consejo de Derechos Humanos, quiere referirse a la forma en que instancias y organizaciones internacionales como este Consejo valoran la aplicación de los derechos humanos de manera dispar entre los países, siendo permisivos y tolerantes con las barbaries que cometen las potencias e irracionales con aquellos países en vías de desarrollo como Nicaragua. Esta valoración desigual se presta a la manipulación e instrumentalización de los derechos humanos para otros fines y pretensiones hegemónicas derivados de intereses económicos y políticos de los países imperialistas que afectan la dignidad y soberanía de los pueblos que buscan labrar su propio destino sin ningún interés foráneo. El enfoque de la promoción y desarrollo de los derechos humanos que este organismo internacional debe impulsar es la aplicación y fortalecimiento de esos derechos en el marco del respeto de la identidad, soberanía y desarrollo histórico de cada país, sin perder de vista la universalidad de los derechos humanos contenidos en las declaraciones, resoluciones, acuerdos y mandatos adoptados que ponen especial énfasis en las fuentes de obtención de la información para su análisis, la cual debe ser imparcial y objetiva. Observamos y desaprobamos las fuentes usadas como base para el análisis de esta Oficina de las Naciones Unidas respecto a las llamadas actualizaciones, informes preliminares y rutas investigativas que lejos de centrarse en recopilar información veraz sobre la realidad de los derechos humanos de la sociedad, comunidad o pueblo, recogen únicamente las voces de algunos sectores con intereses políticos, ideológicos y económicos definidos bajo el diseño de la política interventora de las grandes potencias imperialistas en contra de los pueblos y gobiernos dignos. En el caso de Nicaragua, las llamadas actualizaciones sobre los derechos humanos no son justas ni equitativas, sino verdaderas agresiones contra nuestro país. Este tipo de informes tienen como objetivo seguir descalificando y denigrando a nuestras autoridades e instituciones nacionales, así como al ordenamiento jurídico que sustenta el Estado nicaragüense, sobre la base de información falsa y totalmente parcializada con la finalidad de inmiscuirse en nuestros asuntos y respetando nuestra soberanía e independencia y haciendo eco de la política intervencionista de los Estados Unidos de Norteamérica y de algunos países europeos para con nuestro pueblo. Siempre reiteraremos que... Emitir juicios de valores a priori y hablar de derechos humanos es muy fácil. Lo realmente difícil es hacer realidad su aplicación, sobre todo los derechos económicos, sociales y culturales que beneficien a todo un pueblo. Y hacerlo en medio de vicisitudes y ataques permanentes es aún más difícil. 
estamos hablando con toda autoridad del derecho a la vida, derecho a la salud, derecho a la educación, al trabajo, derecho al agua potable, a la energía eléctrica, a la vivienda, derechos de la mujer, derechos de la niñez, de la juventud, de los adultos mayores, el combate a la pobreza extrema, la erradicación del analfabetismo, la seguridad ciudadana, la seguridad jurídica sobre la propiedad, los derechos de los pueblos indígenas y afrodescendientes, entre otros derechos en los que hemos logrado grandes avances. Afirmamos categóricamente que no pueden existir derechos humanos sin la democratización de la riqueza. Y esa democratización se logra implementando políticas públicas dirigidas a proteger la vida, la salud y el bienestar de los nicaragüenses, tal y como lo ha venido haciendo nuestro gobierno. Totalmente contrario a los derechos humanos de todo un pueblo, Nicaragua ha sido sometida permanentemente al escrutinio inquisidor y malsano de quienes pretenden someternos, atacando directamente los derechos humanos esenciales de los nicaragüenses, constituyéndose en un verdadero crimen de lesa humanidad. Sin embargo, estas injustas medidas unilaterales, coercitivas e ilegales contra nuestro país no nos desaniman ni nos amedrentan y seguiremos caminando firmes en la lucha por alcanzar el máximo nivel de efectividad de nuestra democracia política, económica y social. Nicaragua nunca, ni ahora, ha sido una amenaza para ningún país del mundo, sino que somos un país pacífico, decente y decoroso en la comunidad internacional, que reclama justicia e igualdad, y por eso demandamos que este foro se pronuncie en defensa de los derechos humanos de los nicaragüenses para que cesen las sanciones contra nuestro pueblo. Denunciamos el énfasis de estos foros internacionales que en sus análisis y enfoques pretenden juzgar y calificar con facultades que no le son inherentes ni le han sido reconocidas a países que como Nicaragua aplican su propio derecho basado en los estándares internacionales de derechos humanos. Llamamos a este foro, una vez más, a asumir sus responsabilidades ante la historia de la humanidad, reconociendo y respetando el derecho de los pueblos del mundo a tomar sus propias decisiones y a vivir en paz con soberanía, respeto y consideración humana. Muchas gracias. I thank you. Uh, it's my honor to give the floor to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Abdul Mumin, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh, for video message. Excellency, you have the floor. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Mr. President. Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is an honor for me to address this Council. Our country, Bangladesh, was born out of a long struggle against injustice, discrimination and oppression. So when we started our journey as a free nation, we attached a strong commitment to human rights and fundamental freedom of our people. The spirit has remained unchanged ever since. Our father of the nation, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, envisioned a country that would uphold the principles of equality, inclusivity, democracy, and justice. Taking inspiration from his ideals, our democracy has flourished with an elected parliament, independent judiciary, free media, and vibrant civil society. These institutions have collectively worked in favor of a stronger focus on human rights and fundamental freedoms. They have also helped us in mainstreaming human rights in our national discourse. Under the leadership of Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, the government of Bangladesh is relentlessly working to uphold the rule of law, good governance, and civil liberty. We have adopted a whole of society approach to ensure economic, social, and cultural rights and protect civil and political rights. Our government has remained vigilant against violent extremism, terrorism, human trafficking, and narcotic use that have the potential to jeopardize human rights enjoyment to all. With the highest level of professionalism, and respect for human rights, our law enforcing agencies have been trying to fight these social evils. Equity, inclusiveness, and fairness characterize, characterize our development and ours. We take pride in our success in gender equality and women empowerment. 
Today, in Bangladesh, women have greater participation in legislation, administration, judiciary, and civil society. We have also ensured social inclusion and empowerment of the third gender people. Recently, two third gender persons have been elected in our local government elections. Social justice is integral to our development policies and programs. We have put in place special measures for vulnerable sections of the society to enable them to enjoy the fundamental rights and participate in all spheres of national life. As we fight the COVID pandemic, we have ensured human rights remain at the center of all prevention, preparedness, containment, and treatment measures. Mr. President, our respect for human dignity led us to provide shelter to over a million forcibly displaced Rohingyas of Myanmar. By doing so, we save thousands of lives. Despite enormous challenges, we continue to host these persecuted people and ensure their safety and security. Last year, in this August Council, I called for proactive global efforts to seek a durable solution to the Rohingya crisis. Today, I again urge <coughs> the international community to help ensure that the recommendations of the Advisory Commission on Rakhine State are implemented, accountability and justice are delivered, and a conducive environment for the return of the forcibly displaced Rohingyas is created in Myanmar. The international community must not shy away from their responsibility to resolve the crisis and relieve Bangladesh from the burden that Myanmar has imposed upon us. I would like to reiterate that the Rohingya crisis was created by Myanmar and its solution also lies with them. We must not forget that it is the right of the Rohingya people to be able to return to their homeland, Myanmar. Excellencies, Bangladesh attaches high importance to the work of Human Rights Council in promotion and protection of human rights globally. We strongly support the UPR mechanism to reinforce countries' endeavors to promote and protect human rights. We also cooperate closely with other mechanisms of the Council, including the special procedures. We are equally mindful of our obligation under the treaty bodies. As a testimony to our robust engagement, we have submitted seven treaty body reports in recent years. Mr. President, let me briefly share our perspective on some global problems that require greater attention from the Council. Climate change is an existential threat to humanity. While it is a global crisis, the most vulnerable countries bear the greatest burden. The Council has a moral responsibility of contributing to the acceleration of global climate actions to save lives and livelihoods and promote climate justice. Inequality is another threat to human development and dignity. We have witnessed its worst nature during the pandemic, particularly in the form of vaccine inequality. We would like to see that Council addresses inequality within and among the states more deftly. In many parts of the world, migrants remain vulnerable and experience discrimination. During the pandemic, migrant workers were disproportionately affected due to their unequal access to healthcare and livelihood opportunities. The Council needs to reflect on solutions that can protect the rights of the migrants more effectively irrespective of, of their status. Mr. President, the Human Rights Council has completed 15 years of its existence. This pioneer human rights body was created to promote and protect human rights around the world. It is now high time to reflect 
that the council has lived up to its expectations. In our view, the universal periodic review is the flagship mechanism of this body, which has changed the culture of selective consideration of human rights. Surely, this universal mechanism needs uh, continued nurturing and support. Like this, we also need to remain impartial and non-selective and avoid confrontation and the application of double standards in dealing with human rights issues in the Council. On its part, Bangladesh will continue to play a constructive role and remain engaged with all to make this truly an effective human rights organ of the United Nations. I thank you. Joy Bangla. Joy Bangabundu. Thank you, Excellency. And now, uh, I have the honor to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Retno Marsudi, uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Indonesia, for video message. Mr. President, as we meet today, the people of Ukraine are suffering. War and conflict have resulted in innocent civilian casualties. It has created humanitarian catastrophe. The military attack on Ukraine is unacceptable. It must be put to an end. Please stop. A peaceful resolution through diplomacy must be put forward. The UN Charter and international law, including respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of a country, must be adhered to. The human rights situation in Ukraine warrants the Council undivided attention. The safety and well-being of the people is our utmost priority. In this connection, we call on all parties to ensure safe passage for all civilians and to allow and facilitate rapid, safe and unhindered access for humanitarian assistance. Mr. President, the conflict in Ukraine has compounded human rights challenges, particularly when most of us continue to struggle with COVID-19 and its multidimensional impact. Global unemployment has climbed over 200 million more. Over 1 billion people could be living in extreme poverty by 2030. Discrimination and inequalities run rampant, robbing the less fortunate among us of an opportunity to have a better life. Mr. President, this should be our wake-up call. The pandemic must not divert our attention away from human rights situation around the world. Our effort to promote and protect human rights depends on our ability to address these challenges collectively and urgently. We must always avail ourselves to assist those in need. We have to stand strong for human rights and reject human wrongs. There are three areas that should be our focus. First, ensure everyone has an equal chance to defeat COVID-19. Health is a fundamental human right, and so is access to medical solutions. The Council must reinforce its commitment to fulfill the right to health, including through fair and equitable access to vaccine for all. As President of the G20, Indonesia stands ready to collaborate further in this effort with a view to rebuilding stronger global health architecture. Second, uphold democratic value in addressing global challenges. Colleagues, democracy, development, and human rights are interdependent and mutually reinforcing. Democratic values must be at the core of our pandemic response to ensure no one is left behind, guarantee the voices of the people, and strengthen international enabling environment for sustainable recovery. The Council must reinvigorate dialogue on the future of democracy in promoting and protecting human rights. Third, 
advance protection of women's rights. Colleagues, women continue to be disadvantaged in many aspects of life, including access to health care, social protection, and decent employment. Violence against women continues, especially in the conflict zone. Indonesia knows full well the potential of women in being part of the solution. And we are committed to helping other countries harness such potential, including Afghanistan, where we continue to explore possible cooperation on women empowerment. And going forward, I hope to see further integration on a gender perspective in the council works and deliberation. Mr. President, successful discharge of the council's mandate requires us to address its shortcoming. We need an adaptive and agile council that is well prepared to address human rights challenges of our time. We cannot allow politicization of human rights here, including the misuse of the council for short-sighted objective. We are here not to assign blame, but to learn from each other and advance cooperation on human rights. To continue our contribution to the Council's work, we have put forward our candidacy to the Council for 2024-2026, and I look forward to having a constructive discussion with all of you during the fourth cycle of the UPR in November. I thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I honor to give the word to His Excellency, Mr. Severin Maxime Quenon, Garbesso, Minister of Justice and of the Legislation of the Republic of Benin. Please, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs les chefs de délégation, Mesdames et Messieurs, je voudrais avant tout propos adresser mes cordiales salutations à cette auguste assemblée à l'occasion de ce segment de haut niveau qui constitue le premier rendez-vous solennel du Conseil auquel le Bénin, mon pays, prend part en sa qualité de nouveau membre pour la période 2022-2024. J'adresse à cet égard les félicitations du peuple béninois à M. Frédérico Villegas, à qui nous souhaitons tous du succès. Au nom du président Talon et de son gouvernement, je tiens particulièrement à remercier ici encore tous les membres des Nations Unies qui ont apporté leur soutien à l'élection du Bénin le 14 octobre 2021 à New York pour lui offrir l'ainsi opportunité de réaffirmer à travers ce deuxième mandat au Conseil sa détermination et son engagement à œuvrer pour la promotion et la protection des droits humains, aussi bien sur son territoire que dans le reste du monde, en ces temps troubles où renaissent de nouvelles menaces contre les droits de l'homme. Pour le pays de Bénin, c'est toujours illustré et révélé au monde entier par son attachement aux valeurs et principes universels, promu notamment par la Charte des Nations Unies, la Déclaration universelle des droits de l'homme et de la Charte africaine des droits de l'homme et des peuples, dont les dispositions font partie intégrante de notre Constitution. Cet attachement est resté constant depuis l'avènement du renouveau démocratique en 1990 et s'est consolidé à travers la ratification des instruments juridiques internationaux majeurs relatifs aux droits de l'homme. L'engagement du Bénin, en matière de promotion et de protection des droits humains, s'est également traduit au cours des dernières années par des avancées tangibles dans le cadre de la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable, notamment dans les domaines de la santé, de l'éducation, de la protection des personnes vulnérables, de l'amélioration du cadre de vie des populations et de la lutte contre la pauvreté. En matière de santé, je voudrais évoquer ici en particulier le projet Assurance pour le renforcement du capital humain, lancé par le gouvernement du président Talon en, 1900, en 2019, et qui consiste à doter de ressources humaines substantielles pour offrir aux populations en situation de précarité 
un paquet intégré de quatre services, à savoir l'assurance maladie, le crédit, la formation et l'assurance retraite. Le projet est entré en cette année 2022 dans sa phase de généralisation après une phase pilote qui a porté sur 21 des 77 communes de notre pays. Dans le domaine de l'éducation, la mesure de gratuité de l'enseignement primaire pour tous les enfants béninois a été étendue au collège pour les jeunes filles qui en bénéficient désormais jusqu'à l'obtention du brevet d'études primaires du premier cycle. Dans le même but, nous avons institué un système d'alimentation prioritaire en milieu scolaire et le gouvernement a initié avec le programme des Nations Unies, non, avec le PAM, un programme de cantines scolaires dont la mise en œuvre est assurée en partenariat avec cette institution et qui permet aux enfants de bénéficier de deux repas chauds par jour à l'école de manière à les maintenir dans le cursus scolaire. En matière de protection des personnes vulnérables, le Bénin s'est doté en 2017 d'une loi portant protection et promotion des droits des personnes handicapées et s'apprête à présenter prochainement son rapport initial de mise en œuvre de la Convention relative aux droits des personnes handicapées. Les femmes continuent également de bénéficier de l'attention de la protection accrue du gouvernement et dans ce cadre, une nouvelle loi portant mesures spéciales de répression des infractions commises à raison du sexe et de protection de la femme en République du Bénin a été adoptée le 20 octobre 2021. Cette loi, je dois le souligner, assure une protection renforcée aux femmes ainsi qu'une répression plus sévère des faits de harcèlement sexuel, d'agression sexuelle, de viol, de mariage précoce, de mutilation génitale ou de violences aggravées. Parallèlement, l'Institut national pour la promotion de la femme, créé en 2009, a été réformé en 2021 et doté de prérogatives élargies pour lui permettre une meilleure promotion et une meilleure protection des droits de la femme béninoise au plan politique, économique, social, juridique et culturel. En ce qui concerne l'amélioration du cadre de vie des populations, des progrès considérables ont été enregistrés dans la fourniture de l'eau potable avec un taux de couverture de près de 70% en 2021 qui devrait atteindre les 100% en 2023. Le gouvernement s'y est engagé. Il en est de même pour l'accès des populations à l'énergie électrique, dont l'amélioration sensible se manifeste autour, se manifeste par un taux d'électrification en nette progression qui passe de 46% en 2015 à 56% en 2022, notamment en milieu rural. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, grâce aux avancées sus évoquées et du fait de sa gouvernance exemplaire, le Bénin a rejoint en 2020 la catégorie des pays à revenus intermédiaires de la tranche inférieure, confirmant ainsi son engagement résolu dans la voie de la réduction de la pauvreté et du développement durable en vue d'un meilleur bien-être social. Et pour consolider ces acquis et corriger progressivement les insuffisants constatés en matière de protection des droits de l'homme, le gouvernement béninois veille à renforcer l'indépendance de la Commission béninoise des droits de l'homme en l'adaptant de moyens adéquats propre à assurer l'efficacité de sa mission. De même, le Bénin compte saisir l'opportunité de son mandat pour participer et contribuer aux travaux du Conseil en sept ans, je l'ai indiqué, où on voit ressurgir les démons qui nuisent aux droits de l'homme. Au sein du groupe africain, mon, mon pays veillera à ce que les préoccupations et les aspirations des populations africaines puissent être entendues défendu et prise en compte dans la réalisation des droits émergents, notamment le droit à un environnement propre, sain et durable, la promotion et la protection des droits de l'homme dans un contexte de changement climatique, le droit à la protection de la vie privée à l'aide du numérique. Le Bénin ne manquera pas de participer aux réflexions en cours sur les défis actuels tels que la lutte contre le terrorisme et la pandémie de la COVID-19, la lutte contre la discrimination raciale et la xénophobie, le développement des droits collectifs et autres thématiques d'intérêt inscrites à l'ordre du jour de la présente session. Monsieur le Président, Mesdames et Messieurs, je ne saurais achever mon intervention sans saluer 
les efforts visant à favoriser une participation universelle des États aux travaux du Conseil. Je loue en particulier le travail remarquable effectué par le Fonds d'affectation spécial et ses contributeurs pour permettre aux pays les moins avancés et aux petits États insulaires en développement de pouvoir participer pleinement aux sessions ordinaires du Conseil. Pour sa part, le Bénin ne ménagera aucun effort pour contribuer durant son mandat à la bonne marche du Conseil et participer ainsi à la promotion et à la protection des droits de l'homme dans le monde. Je vous remercie de votre aimable attention. Je vous remercie, euh, Excellence, pour le discours. Euh, maintenant, je l'honneur de donner la parole à son Excellence, M. Félix Bayou, ministre délégué auprès du ministre des Relations extérieures du Cameroun. Votre Excellence, la parole est à vous. The President of the Human Rights Council, Madam High Commissioner of the United Nations for Human Rights, Madam Director General of the United Nations Office in Geneva, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. At the outset, permit me to greet you all cordially on behalf of the Cameroonian delegation, I am honored to lead to this 49th session of the Human Rights Council. I also wish to extend to His Excellency Federico Villegas the warm congratulations of my delegation for his brilliant election to the president, presidency of the Human Rights Council for the year 2022. There is no doubt that his rich and long experience as a seasoned diplomat, coupled with his great knowledge of the issues before us, will be of great value for the smooth conduct of our work throughout his term of office. While wishing you, Mr. President, full success in your noble and exalting mission, I would like to assure you of the total and constant collaboration of Cameroon. Mr. President, please also allow me to thank all members of our organization who in their vast majority voted to re-elect my country, Cameroon, to the Human Rights Council for the period 2022-2024. We thank you all for this and promise, as in the past, to contribute actively to strengthening and enhancing the role of the Human Rights Council. To you, Madam High Commissioner, let me greatly appreciate and applaud the relevance and holistic approach of your report on the situation of human rights in the world. Let me, in this regard, assure you of the constant support of the head of state of Cameroon, His Excellency Paul Bia, in the accomplishment of your lofty and exalting mission. I share your concluding remark that all of humanity must make a strong commitment to the respect, protection, and promotion of human rights. Mr. President, the work of the 49th session of our Council is taking place in an international context marked by the hope of overcoming COVID-19 in the near future the gradual lifting of barrier measures and the notable advances in preventive and therapeutic research, as well as positive initiatives in favor of vaccine coverage on a world scale, are indices which all go well for a better future. I hope that once this pandemic is over, we will all draw the lessons of this difficult and uncertain period of our life together Already my delegation, like many others, is convinced that more than ever before, 
the Agency of Strengthening Solidarity and International Cooperation is the appropriate solution to foster a collective well-being. The pandemic has revealed to all of humanity the community of destiny that binds all the peoples of the world. Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we examine the thematic agenda of this 49th session, we quickly realize that despite the sustained efforts of the international community, community in favor of development of mankind, many challenges still remain in this vast project of strengthening human values. This situation is probably due to many sources of tension in the world, inequalities of all kinds, the prevailing precariousness in many societies, the long march towards the consolidation of democracy and the strengthening of the rule of, rule of law, the resurgence of conflicts of identity with a strong geo-strategic connotation. All these factors sufficiently show that the fight for the strengthening of human rights of which our council is the champion par excellence is still long and difficult. Monsieur le Président, Excellences, Mesdames et Messieurs, s'agissant du conflit en cours en Europe de l'Est, j'ai saisi l'occasion qui m'est offerte pour dire que le gouvernement du Cameroun suit avec la plus grande attention le conflit qui s'y déroule à l'heure actuelle. Le gouvernement de la République est d'autant plus préoccupé par cette situation qu'elle est porteuse de graves conséquences pour la paix et la sécurité internationale. Le règlement pacifique des différends entre les États a toujours été l'un des principes fondamentaux de la politique étrangère du Cameroun. C'est pourquoi le gouvernement en appelle à l'arrêt des hostilités et à l'ouverture des négociations entre les partis dans l'optique d'une tolérance, dans l'optique d'une recherche des solutions concertées entre les partis. Le gouvernement camerounais reste convaincu que le retour à la normale est à ce prix, dans la perspective de la préservation des intérêts des uns et des autres, et afin que triomphe les idiots de la paix et de la sécurité chère à la communauté internationale. Monsieur le Président, fondant notre engagement commun au multilatéralisme, nous nous sommes assignés il y a quelques années un ambitieux programme, l'Agenda 2030, celui des objectifs du développement durable. Je voudrais à cet égard réitérer ici l'engagement ferme du Cameroun a œuvré en faveur de l'édification d'un monde où l'épanouissement de l'homme est la préoccupation primordiale de l'humanité. Le chef de l'État du Cameroun, son Excellence Paul Biya, a toujours considéré que si nous ne servons pas l'homme, alors nous agissons en vain. Je voudrais rappeler cette réalité historique et factuelle qui a fait du Cameroun une pupille des Nations Unies et qui, de ce fait, l'engage à demeurer aux premières lignes de la défense des idiots que promeuvent sa charte et bien d'autres instruments pertinents. Le Cameroun, mon pays, est totalement dévoué à la cause et à la mission du Conseil des droits de l'homme. Monsieur le Président, comme vous le savez pertinemment, mon pays a été marqué ces dix dernières années par des manœuvres répétitives de déstabilisation, des manœuvres entretenues par les professionnels de la violence, du désordre et les adeptes de l'obscurantisme. La paix et la stabilité du pays ont été constamment menacées. N'eût été 
les fait conjuguer de la clairvoyance et d'un leadership avisé, empreint de la tolérance et de sagesse du chef de l'État du Cameroun, combiné au patriotisme et à la maturité de la grande majorité du peuple camerounais, mon pays, le Cameroun, serait aujourd'hui plongé dans une spirale de violence. L'objectif était de troubler la paix, installer le désordre et l'instabilité, détruire les valeurs humaines que promeut notre organisation, déconstruire l'unité difficilement retrouvée après 40 années de séparation imposée et entraver le progrès du Cameroun. Avec votre concours, celui inestimable des Nations Unies, l'appui déterminant du Haut Commissariat aux droits de l'homme, l'aide des pays amis, nous sommes presque sortis de cet engrenage infernal. La situation dans les régions en crise, le nord-ouest, le sud-ouest et l'extrême nord de mon pays, s'est considérablement améliorée. Je puis dire que nous commençons à regarder cette période sombre de notre histoire dans le rétroviseur. Je tiens à rassurer la communauté internationale de ce que la situation sécuritaire de mon pays est maîtrisée. Et à titre d'illustration, le Cameroun vient d'abriter avec grand succès la Coupe d'Afrique des Nations de football qu'il a organisé en début de cette année, en janvier-février 2022. C'est le lieu pour moi de rappeler, pour la gouverne de notre Conseil et de l'ensemble des membres de l'Organisation des Nations Unies, quelques importantes mesures prises par le chef de l'État en faveur de la normalisation de la situation et la promotion de la paix. Mr. President, true to his wise leadership, the head of state organized a major national dialogue which brought together all the stakeholders, including those of the diaspora. The major outcome of this dialogue included, but not limited to, the granting of a special status to the north, west, and southwest regions of Cameroon, the acceleration of the process of decentralization, the establishment of a humanitarian emergency assistance plan, the putting in place of a reconstruction program piloted by the United Nations Devel Development Program, and the creation of a center for disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration. Notwithstanding, there are still some isolated cases of deplorable acts that the government is working to control. These acts include attacks by Boko Haram in the far north and especially sporadic acts of violence of armed groups in the northwest and southwest regions, groups which benefit from support of the enemies of the country living abroad. They continue to collect and embezzle funds to sustain terror in Cameroon. They plan kidnappings and assassinations, including of school children. They have for the past four years denied the right to education for young children by imposing the so-called school boycott, which they keep alive through violence and threats. Let me avail myself of this opportunity to salute, on behalf of the head of state, the constructive and decisive contribution of Madame Bachelet, United Nations Commissioner for Human Rights and her team, for their visit to Cameroon in 2019 a visit during which they noticed and understood the situation on the ground. 
it should be said that this visit is, was one of the crucial steps in the effort to return to normalcy. On behalf of the government of Cameroon, I would like to renew to Madame Bachelet Cameroon's support and reassure her of her total collaboration in the application of the recommendations contained in the mission report of the technical team of the High Commission published on its extranet site in December 2021. It is noteworthy that the report highlights, among other things, the good disposition of Cameroon in favor of the restoration of peace and serenity in the north and southwest regions of the, of the country. Finally, I would like to reassure you, Mr. President, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, that despite some indigenous and exogenous difficulties, Cameroon is and will always remain a state which respects, protects, and promotes human rights. Our commitment to fostering the work of the Human Rights Council will always be effective and decisive and commensurate to a commitment to multilateralism. I thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Uh, now I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Stanislav uh, Raschan, State Secretary and the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Slovenia for video message. Mr. President, Madam High Commissioner, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and privilege to address the UN Human Rights Council. Even though I could not attend this session live, this is in-person meeting can be seen as a sign of success in our long and exhausting battle against COVID-19. Though last week we woke up into the darkest time since the end of the World War II, I'm deeply saddened and appealed by the horrific events in Ukraine caused by Russian unprovoked action. My thoughts are with Ukraine and its people. Their lives are at grave risk. We have established international law and international fora to pursue dialogue and to react. It's time to react. Russian military aggression on the territory of Ukraine have already resulted in a massive and grave human rights violations. Slovenia support urgent debate on the UNHRC on the situation on human rights in Ukraine stemming from the Russian aggression. We will promote a resolution establishing a commission on inquiry of the Human Rights Council. Madam High Commissioner, the nature of contemporary human rights challenges has evolved over time. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought it even further. In this, his recent remarks to the General Assembly, the Secretary General recognized five concrete global challenges. To tackle them, we must choose cooperation instead of polarization, and we must place human rights front and center. In the words of Secretary General, the time to act is now. Regarding the High Commissioner's 2022 Agenda of Action and Rights, Slovenia believes that this comprehensive plan offers an innovative, rights-based solution for addressing the main global challenges. We are especially grateful for the inclusion of concrete and decisive action to uphold the human rights to a healthy environment and to promote the human rights of older persons. Together with our common agenda, the High Commissioner's plan provides a roadmap guiding our action towards the final eight years we have to implement the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Ladies and gentlemen, the Council should continue with the use of modern technologies that were introduced during the COVID-19 pandemic and that can increase its accessibility as well as improve its transparency. We are in particular in favor of technical solutions that can be helpful to small and isolated developing states and large developed countries. Together, we should be exploring ways to improve support for universal participation in the work of this Council. We remain concerned 
over the increased level of politicization of human rights. In the challenging global environment, we need to rely on multilateralism and dialogue. The Human Rights Council can be a platform that unites us. That is why we strongly support the President of the Human Rights Council call for strategic dialogue and his wish to hold a series of retreats. Today, reality makes the responsibility of the Human Rights Council significantly bigger. The Council plays the main role of leading global discussions upholding the highest standards in the promotion of protection and human rights for all. Madam High Commissioner, in conclusion, please allow me to mention that Slovenia remains a firm supporter of the Human Rights Council as well uh, as the of Office of the High Commissioner and its available work. We understand that it's imperative to secure the highest possible financial independence of the Office in this regard. Therefore, we are stepping up our efforts by planning the predictability of our annual financial contribution. As an active observer state, we are looking forward to the possibility to rejoin the Council for the third time as one of the, its 47 member states in the period of 2026-2028. Thank you very much. I thank you. Uh, I have the honor to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Rina Tsanthu, Vice Minister in the Ministry of External Affairs of India for video message. The floor is yours. Mr. President, I congratulate you on your election as the President of the Council and assure you of my delegation's full cooperation. India is a country that believes in our civilizational ethos of Atmavat Sarva Bhuteshu namely treating all human beings as one. We are a society that is firmly rooted in ideals of equality and social justice. We have adopted the mantra of Sabka Saath, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas and Sabka Priyas that is working together for inclusive development for all while securing the trust and contribution of all. Prime Minister Modi, speaking at the 28th Foundation Day of National Human Rights Commission, underlined our civilizational ideal of not behaving with others in a manner which is inimical to you. It implies that enjoyment of human rights also entails for us certain duties as human beings. We should care not only about our rights, but embrace the rights of others as our duty. As this belief permeates our society, human rights have naturally been accepted as one of the core values of our society. As Mahatma Gandhi, father of the nation, said, rights and duties should be seen together and not in isolation. It is our experience that our rights are ensured if there is equal emphasis on observance of our duties. Our vibrant and inclusive democracy provides a conducive and enabling ecosystem for promotion and protection of human rights. Democracy in India is not just a system of governance, but an article of faith. It is also a source of inspiration for billions around the world. Our constitution has enshrined basic human rights as fundamental rights guaranteeing civil and political rights, stipulating provisions for progressive realization of economic, social and cultural rights. These continue to evolve and be enforced through legislation by parliament, progressive interpretation of laws by our judiciary and active participation of civil society, vibrant media and citizens. Through our independent judiciary, and independent institutions, including Category A, National Human Rights Commission, National Commissions for Minorities, National Commission for Women, National Commission for Scheduled Castes, and National Commission for Scheduled Tribes, we have created a mechanism to enable our citizens to enjoy their fundamental rights and have their grievances redressed. 
India's active engagement with the global human rights agenda dates back to the early days of the Commission on Human Rights and drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and other human rights treaties. India has recently been elected to the Human Rights Council for another three-year term for 2022-24. We are committed to bring in pluralistic, moderate and balanced perspectives to bridge multiple divides in human rights discourse and action within the Human Rights Council and beyond. We believe that promotion and protection of human rights are best pursued through dialogue, consultation and cooperation among the UN member states and through provision of technical assistance and capacity building. Even after adoption of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights 73 years ago, the international human rights discourse has remained contentious and divided. The Human Rights Council since its inception as a successor to the Commission on Human Rights has continued to grapple with ideological and political divides. We strongly believe that the Council should promote and protect all human rights, civil, political, economic, social and cultural rights, including the right to development in a fair and balanced manner. The human rights agenda, including the Council's contribution towards prevention of human rights violations, must be pursued in an impartial manner with due respect for the principles and purposes of the UN Charter. India firmly believes that the Universal Periodic Review of the Human Rights Council is an effective instrument for promotion and protection of human rights. India will be undergoing its fourth UPR later this year and we seek support and constructive engagement of the member states. Mr. President, terrorism is the most serious violation of human rights as it violates the most fundamental right, namely the right to life. The international community must take resolute action against terrorism in all its forms and manifestations to prevent and stop violation of human rights and fr fundamental freedoms of innocent victims of terrorism. It is important for us to affirm that terrorism can never be justified, nor its perpetrators ever equated with its victims. India's External Affairs Minister had presented last year to the UN Security Council an eight-point action plan on combating terrorism, and we are committed to contribute to global action in this regard. India's abiding commitment to promotion and protection of basic human rights has been manifest in our strategy to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic. Following our vision of One Earth, One Health and our commitment to the welfare of the entire humanity, we have contributed to global action against COVID pandemic by providing necessary medicines and vaccines to more than 150 countries. We have ourselves administered more than 1.7 billion doses of vaccines in just over a year. More than 90% of our adult citizens have received the first dose of the vaccine, whereas more than 70% have been administered both the doses. India has undertaken unprecedented steps aimed at economic and social transformation of India, especially during the pandemic. We have continued to provide direct food support to 800 million Indians and financial support to 445 million, many of them women. The development initiatives undertaken by the Government of India include the world's largest financial inclusion scheme which covers 445 million aspirational Indians, including 115 million farmers, free health insurance coverage to 500 million, provision of 150 million homes to the underprivileged, 
including 20 million to women, 85 million free gas connections to deserving women belonging to rural households, providing electricity to all villages, construction of 110 million toilets in the last five years to improve personal hygiene and sanitation, bringing tap water connection to every household in the country by 2024, etc. We have endeavored to make our development sustainable, inclusive and green. Our developmental successes have contributed immensely in enjoyment of basic human rights by our people. We therefore support full realization of the right to development. Let me conclude by reiterating our commitment to ensure fullest enjoyment of basic human rights of our people, including through inclusive and sustainable development. India is building a better and fairer society at home it is also contributing to a better and fairer world. I thank you, Mr. President, for giving me the floor, and I wish the Council success in its endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Excellency. Now I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency, Archbishop Paul Gallagher, Secretary for Relations with States of Holy See, for video message. Mr. President, I am pleased to convey the cordial greetings of His Holiness Pope Francis to you, to the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and to all delegations of member and observer states, as well as to all the participants of this 49th session of the Human Rights Council. At the outset, I wish to echo in this council the words of Pope Francis on the tragic events in Ukraine, who affirmed, in recent days, we have been shaken by something tragic, war. Those who wage war forget humanity. They do not start from the people. They do not look at the real life of people, but place partisan interests and power before all else. They distance themselves from ordinary people who want peace and who, the ordinary people, are the real victims in every conflict, who pay for the follies of war with their own skin. I think of the elderly, of those who seek refuge in these times, of mothers fleeing with their children. They are brothers and sisters for whom it is urgent to open humanitarian corridors and who must be welcomed. With a heart broken by what is happening in Ukraine, I repeat, put down your weapons. Those who love peace reject war as an instrument of aggression against the freedom of other peoples and as a means for the settlement of international disputes. Mr. President, it is with regret that one must acknowledge how in addition to the millions of lives lost due to the coronavirus and the devastating effects that lockdowns and restrictions have had on promoting integral human development all over the world, the frequency and severity of violations of human rights have been exacerbated over the course of this ongoing global health crisis. The activity of this council provides startling evidence of this fact. In 2021 alone, it held five emergency special sessions on the grave situation of human rights, respectively in Myanmar, Palestine, Afghanistan, Sudan, and Ethiopia. Additionally, the past year has seen increased tensions in the protracted conflicts in Yemen, Syria, Cameroon, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Colombia. Mr. President, these situations of conflict, violence, and instability cause alarming levels of internally displaced persons and refugees, while the pandemic has had an exponentially negative impact on the displaced. Border closures, local public health restrictions and devastated economies have limited their access to the security and safe passage guaranteed by international law. In some cases, the global health crisis is even being instrumentalized as an excuse to promote ideological policies that deny the displaced of their basic human rights. At the same time, some host countries are also disproportionately burdened by the enormous influx of refugees and migrants they receive. 
being asked to go well beyond their capacity to adequately provide for the needs of these people on the move. Once more, I would like to extend my heartfelt gratitude to all host countries for their generosity, especially in these challenging times, and urge the international community to provide the necessary support and burdens sharing. Mr. President, I recently had an opportunity to visit Lebanon, which has always been a historic example of coexistence. Only authentic dialogue carried out in mutual respect and with the support of the international community will enable the country to find a solution to the current crisis and to continue being a model of peaceful coexistence and brotherhood. My thoughts also go to the victims of the explosion at the port of Beirut on the 4th of August 2020, to their families, to the many injured and those who have lost their homes, their jobs, and the hope to live. I have met some of them, and they clearly asked to be helped in finding truth and justice. The Holy See would like to bring this plea to the attention of this council and remind the international community that justice is properly sought solely out of love of justice itself, out of respect for the victims as a means of preventing new crimes and protecting the common good, not an as alleged outlet for personal anger. Mr. President, during the COVID-19 pandemic, there has also been a stark increase in the number of abuses and violations of civil and political rights, including the right to freedom of assembly, of speech, and of association, as well as the perpetration of arbitrary detentions. While it is necessary to respect the adoption of reasonable measures to public authorities to, to ensure public safety and health, every effort must be made to ensure that these are not imposed disproportionately in violation of the fundamental human rights or politically motivated. Too often, these violations occur in a context of impunity. Among these violations, those against the freedom of religion are particularly egregious, as the ability to express and practice one's faith, including the freedom of worship, is one of the most intimate and sacred human rights and remains essential, especially in times of crisis and insecurity. Moreover, attacks on and the desecration of or destruction of places of worship and religious sites have escalated over the course of the past few years and are becoming appallingly more commonplace. Mr. President, in the current situation we are living, the need to promote and respect human rights and fundamental freedoms is more crucial than ever. The Holy See will continue to raise its voice in defense of those whose fundamental rights and freedoms are not respected. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank you. Now I have the honor to give the floor uh, to Her Excellency Ms. Marta Delgado Perlata, Under Secretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights uh, at the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Muchas gracias, señor vicepresidente. Los saludo a nombre del gobierno de México. La coyuntura actual obliga a los estados a reiterar la firme convicción de que la paz, la libertad y la justicia constituyen las bases del mundo que la humanidad merece. México lamenta las terribles situaciones por las que atraviesan diversas regiones del mundo, incluyendo la región latinoamericana, pero sobre todo, como lo ha hecho patente en otros foros de las Naciones Unidas, condena la invasión del territorio de Ucrania, Estado miembro de las Naciones Unidas, y destaca el impacto negativo que esta invasión tiene en los derechos humanos de las personas y en el sistema multilateral al contravenir los principios fundamentales de la Carta de las Naciones Unidas. México dará seguimiento al desarrollo de la actual eh, situación en Ucrania y trabajará de la mano con este Consejo en coordinación con los demás órganos del sistema de Naciones Unidas, basándose en el respeto al derecho internacional y en particular eh, el respeto de los derechos humanos de todas las personas. En línea con la tradición de México y la reconocida política exterior de mi país, 
de promover la solución pacífica de controversias. Hacemos un firme llamado a las partes a mantener los canales diplomáticos y a que se establezca un diálogo efectivo para la solución pacífica y pronta de esta situación. Señor vicepresidente, hoy convergemos nuevamente en este consejo, órgano crucial para el presente y para el futuro de la humanidad, cuyo mandato es promover el respeto universal para la protección de los derechos humanos y las libertades fundamentales. México, como miembro del Consejo de Derechos Humanos, del Consejo de Seguridad de las Naciones Unidas, del Consejo Económico y Social y del Consejo Rector de la UNESCO, de los que somos parte en este mismo momento, busca promover la coordinación entre los distintos órganos y mandatos de las Naciones Unidas en favor de las personas. Así, de manera activa y coordinada, promovemos nuestros principios constitucionales de política exterior, la promoción y el respeto de los derechos humanos, el respeto del derecho internacional y la promoción del diálogo y la solución pacífica de controversias para la construcción de sociedades más justas y pacíficas. Este es el compromiso que tiene México con el multilateralismo y por eso coincidimos con la señora Bachelet en que los estados debemos apostar por el diálogo internacional para hacer frente a los retos globales. Las situaciones de conflicto, los graves efectos del cambio climático, los estragos generados por la pandemia que ha aquejado al mundo en estos últimos dos años, demandan que trabajemos de manera unida, que seamos solidarios en la búsqueda de soluciones. Hoy es cuando debemos recordar eh, que nos comprometimos a no dejar a nadie atrás. Y por eso México continuará promoviendo eh, las acciones necesarias para que avancemos a la igualdad sustantiva de género, al reconocimiento de los derechos de las personas en situaciones de vulnerabilidad, como lo son las personas en movilidad internacional, las personas LGBTI+, las personas con discapacidades, las personas de las comunidades indígenas. La participación equitativa y significativa de estos grupos tiene un impacto tangible en el desarrollo social y económico de todas las sociedades. Y por ello México es un país con una política exterior feminista. Observamos con seria preocupación los intentos por retroceder en esta importante agenda y hacemos un firme llamado a los estados y otros actores para abordar el tema de manera adecuada, objetiva y con un enfoque centrado en la persona. Otra de nuestras prioridades en el contexto de la pandemia actual es seguir impulsando el acceso universal, oportuno y equitativo a las vacunas, a los tratamientos y otros insumos médicos para enfrentar no solamente la actual pandemia por COVID-19, sino otras pandemias eh, que vendrán desafortunadamente en el futuro. El hecho de no garantizar el acceso a la salud tiene efectos en el ejercicio pleno de los derechos humanos y en el desarrollo de los países. La política exterior en materia de derechos humanos de México demanda la acción no solo en el orden internacional, también busca impactar en acciones en el ámbito nacional para que podamos hacer frentes a los desafíos estructurales del Estado que impiden la garantía o el ejercicio pleno de los derechos humanos. Y por eso, como parte de la política de apertura al escrutinio internacional, México trabaja de manera colaborativa y transparente con los diferentes órganos de tratados, procedimientos especiales y mandatos emanados de este Consejo, así como directamente con la Oficina de la Alta Comisionada para cumplir nuestros compromisos internacionales en esta materia y contribuir al fortalecimiento de nuestras políticas nacionales. Entre esos esfuerzos quisiera destacar la visita del Comité de Naciones Unidas contra las desapariciones forzadas. Es la primera visita de este comité a un país, la ha aceptado México el año pasado, y esto para encontrar de manera conjunta y colaborativa la mejor manera de atender uno de los grandes flagelos que enfrenta el Estado mexicano. 
También somos conscientes de otros problemas que enfrenta el país, la seguridad de las personas periodistas, de los defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos y trabajamos actualmente en la construcción de instituciones y leyes sólidas para su protección. El gobierno de México lamenta y condena los asesinatos y los actos de intimidación y de hostigamiento en contra de periodistas y personas defensoras de los derechos humanos y del medio ambiente en nuestro país. Y reconocemos la contribución al debate democrático y al Estado de Derecho que tiene. En este foro, eh, México se compromete a seguir adoptando las medidas que contribuyan a hacer efectivos todos los derechos humanos, para todas y para todos, tanto a nivel nacional como a combatir la impunidad en los tres órdenes de gobierno. Finalmente, señor vicepresidente, en este momento de tiempos complejos que nos demanda acciones comprometidas de los estados internacionalmente y también nacionalmente, le quiero eh, reiterar que México seguirá su colaboración con los organismos internacionales y el compromiso con el multilateralismo que debemos tener, lo refrendamos para hacer frente a todos estos retos que enfrenta la humanidad. Gracias a todas y todos. I thank you, Excellency. Now I have the honor to give the floor to His Excellency Kahdan uh, Taha Janabi, Under Secretary for Legal Affairs and Multilateral Relations of Iraq, for regional message. سعادة رئيس مجلس حقوق الإنسان سعادة المفوض السامي لحقوق الإنسان السيدات والسادة بداية يسرني أن أستهل كلمتي بالترحيب بجمعكم الموقر وأن أعرب باسم حكومة جمهورية العراق عن تقديري لعملكم الدؤوب والمستمر للنهوض بواقع حقوق الإنسان والشؤون الإنسانية في جميع أنحاء العالم رغم الظروف الاستثنائية التي تحيط بنا وأنني من هذا المنبر أؤكد رغبة حكومة بلادي في الاستمرار بالسعي قدما لتحقيق أهدافها والإيفاء بالتزاماتها الوطنية والإقليمية والدولية في شتى المجالات وخاصة الجانب الإنساني السيد الرئيس أود أن أستعرض أمام حضراتكم اليوم أبرز ما أنجزته حكومة جمهورية العراق خلال العام المنصرم بالرغم من التحديات التي واجهتها في طريق تحقيقها ولا تزال تواجهها من أجل استكمال ما تأهدت بتنفيذه في برنامجها الحكومي ومن أهم هذه الإنجازات تنظيم انتخابات برلمانية مبكرة في تشرين الأول 2021 وبشهادة منظمات مراقبة انتخابية دولية وبعثة الأمم المتحدة في العراق اتسمت بالنزاهة والشفافية والعدالة في أجواء آمنة ومستقرة وفرت فرصة عادلة ومؤمنة للناخبين لممارسة حق الاختيار الحر مستوفية بذلك جميع الشروط والمعايير الدولية المطلوبة والتي نجم عنها فوز النساء ب 97 مقعدا في مجلس النواب مما يشكل انجازا وسابقة للعراق وتحقيقا للهدف المرجو من خطة العراق الثانية للتمكين الاقتصادي للمرأة للعام 2021 2022 التي اطلقتها حكومة بلادي بدعم من مجموعة البنك الدولي وضمن برنامج تمكين المرأة في المشرق السيدات والسادة إن حكومة جمهورية العراق ماضية في تعاونها مع بعثة الأمم المتحدة لمساعدة العراق المنامي وفق احترام سيادة العراق والولاية التي أنشئت من أجلها هذه البعثة إلى جانب تعاونها مع المنظمات غير الحكومية ومؤسسات المجتمع المدني المحلية والدولية والتي يبلغ عدد هذه المنظمات حاليا في العراق نحو خمسة آلاف 
ما بين منظمة محلية وأجنبية وتعمل الحكومة على تذليل كافة العقبات التي تعترض عملها لا سيما وأن بعض تلك المنظمات والمؤسسات استطاعت تقديم المساعدة الضرورية إلى ضحايا تنظيم داعش الإرهابي من الأفراد والعوائل وفي إطار معالجة التداعيات الناجمة عن جرائم تنظيم داعش فقد أقر مجلس النواب العراقي قانون الناجيات الإيزيديات في الأول من شهر آذار من العام 2021 والذي يوفر إطارا قانونيا لتعويض العديد من الناجيات والناجين من جرائم التنظيم الإرهابي ماديا ومعنويا وإعادة تأهيلهم كما شكلت حكومة بلادي مديرية عامة لشؤون الناجيات لضمان حسن تنفيذه ومما يشار إليه بالبنان إن العراق وضع اللبنة الأولى في إطار سعي الدول لمساندة الضحايا ويعد هذا القانون الأول من نوعه الذي يعنى بالناجيات من جرائم العنف الجنسي في المناطق التي تعاني من النزاع المسلح والإرهاب وجاعلا من يوم ثلاثة آب من كل عام يوما وطنيا للتعريف بقضية هؤلاء الضحايا وفي ذات السياق لا بد أن أشير إلى ملف الأطفال الذين ينحدرون من عوائل مقاتلي تنظيم داعش الإرهابي حيث تسعى حكومة بلادي إلى تسليم الأطفال من أصول غير عراقية إلى دولهم الأصلية إذ سلم العراق إلى يومنا هذا 1102 طفل إلى دول مختلفة وأن حكومة بلادي تنتظر نتائج فحص الـ DNA لمطابقتها من أجل التعرف على ذوي الباقين ومن هذا المنبر فإننا ندعو جميع الدول إلى تسلم رعاياهم من الأطفال دون السن القانوني والأحداث الذين انتهت مدة محكوميتهم عن الجرائم التي ارتكبوها وفقا للنظام القضائي العراقي السيد الرئيس في إطار اهتمام حكومة بلادي بتوفير حياة حرة وكريمة لمواطنيها فقد عملت على نقل 94 عائلة عراقية من مخيم الهول في سوريا إلى مخيم الجدعة في العراق مع تهيئة كافة مستلزمات الحياة الضرورية والحماية الأمنية لهذه العوائل ويسعى العراق إلى تكثيف الجهود مع التحالف الدولي والمنظمات الدولية لكشف أنشطة داعش في مخيم الهول والحد من اتساع تأثيراتها السلبية لا سيما مع مساعي عوائل داعش من الأجانب للهروب من المخيم وفي ذات النسق وفيما يخص قضية اللاجئين العراقيين العالقين على حدود الدول الأوروبية فإن القضية المثارة هنا ذات أبعاد دولية ولا تنسحب آثارها فقط على مواطني العراق الذين وقع الأغلب منهم ضحية لشبكات التهريب والاتجار بالبشر وإنما أثرت سلبا على علاقاتنا ببعض دول الاتحاد الأوروبي لذا فإنني أدعو المجتمع الدولي من هذا المنبر إلى تقديم المساعدة اللازمة وتضييق الخناق على إصابات التهريب والاتجار بالبشر لتقليل أعداد ضحاياها من جانبنا فإننا ماضون بإعادة مواطنينا الراغبين بالعودة إلى العراق حيث سهلت الجهات الحكومية المعنية عودة ما يقارب من 4390 عراقيا ومن الملفات الأخرى ذات الاهتمام القصوى التي أولتها الحكومة العراقية واتخذت إزاءها العديد من الإجراءات القانونية قضية التعرض للمتظاهرين أثناء المظاهرات التي حدثت في نهاية العام 2019 وذلك انطلاقا من حرصها على إقامة العدل والأنصاف لضحايا هذه المظاهرات والسعي لمحاسبة الجنات ووصولهم إلى محاكمة عادلة وقد شكلت لهذا الغرض اللجان التحقيقية بأمر 
من السيد رئيس مجلس الوزراء وتم بموجبها اعتقال العديد من المتورطين بغض النظر عن هويتهم سواء كانوا منتمين إلى الأجهزة الأمنية أو من خارجها ولا زال العمل جار للكشف عن آخرين متورطين بارتكاب تلك الانتهاكات السيدات والسادة في إطار التزامات العراق الدولية فإن بلادي مقبلة على مناقشة تقريرها الخاص بالعهد الدولي للحقوق المدنية والسياسية خلال شهر آذار وتقريرها الوطني المعني باتفاقية مناهضة التعذيب وغيره من ضروب المعاملة أو العقوبة القاسية أو اللا إنسانية أو المهينة خلال شهر آيار إلى جانب مناقشته للتقرير الخاص بالميثاق العربي لحقوق الإنسان خلال شهر شباط لعام 2022 أشكر استماعكم وأتمنى لهذا المجلس التوفيق والنجاح وشكرا جزيلا Thank you. Maintenant, j'ai l'honneur de donner la parole à son Excellence, Madame Isabelle Berroy Amadei, conseillère de gouvernement, ministre des Relations extérieures et de la coopération de la Principauté de Monaco, pour le vidéo message. Monsieur le Président de l'Assemblée Générale, Monsieur le Président du Conseil des Droits de l'Homme, Madame le Haut-Commissaire, Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs. Depuis deux ans maintenant, nos vies sont totalement bouleversées par une crise sanitaire d'une ampleur sans précédent et dont nous n'avons pas fini d'évaluer les répercussions, souvent dramatiques, sur nos sociétés. Bien évidemment, nos pensées vont en premier lieu à toutes les victimes du virus et aux familles endeuillées. Mais nous savons qu'au-delà de ses conséquences les plus directes, la pandémie a entravé la réalisation des droits de l'homme et la pleine jouissance de nos libertés fondamentales. Malheureusement, ce sont souvent les plus vulnérables qui ont été le plus durement touchés, tels que les femmes, davantage exposées aux violences domestiques, ou encore les enfants, dont le droit à l'éducation a connu des entraves importantes. C'est pourquoi il est indispensable de placer les droits de l'homme au cœur de nos stratégies de lutte contre la pandémie et de nos efforts de reconstruction post-Covid. La crise de la Covid-19 n'a toutefois pas éclipsé toutes les autres et 2021 a été marqué par l'émergence d'un certain nombre de situations préoccupantes. Dans ce contexte, le Conseil des droits de l'homme a démontré sa capacité de réaction en tenant pas moins de cinq sessions extraordinaires qui ont permis notamment, pour ne prendre que cet exemple, la création d'un mandat de rapporteur spécial au Soudan. À cet égard, la Principauté de Monaco tient à souligner l'importance des mécanismes indépendants institués par le Conseil, tels que les mandats de rapporteurs spéciaux, les commissions d'enquête et autres groupes d'experts qui œuvrent notamment à la collecte et à la préservation de témoignages et de preuves quant aux violations les plus graves des droits de l'homme. Ce travail est en effet indispensable en vue des efforts ultérieurs de justice, d'établissement des responsabilités et de reddition des comptes. C'est la raison pour laquelle la Principauté de Monaco ne peut que regretter le rejet lors de la 48e session de la résolution qui visait à renouveler le mandat du groupe d'experts sur le Yémen. Ce dernier constitue en effet le seul mécanisme onusien destiné à documenter les violations des droits de l'homme commises par toutes les parties au conflit. Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, Simone de Beauvoir affirmait qu'il suffira d'une crise politique, économique ou religieuse pour que les droits des femmes soient remis en question. Ces paroles résonnent aujourd'hui avec gravité, alors que les femmes et les filles se retrouvent particulièrement exposées aux effets de la Covid-19, du changement climatique ou des conflits armés. À cet égard, la Principauté de Monaco est particulièrement préoccupée par le recul des droits des femmes et des filles constaté ces derniers mois dans plusieurs régions du monde. 
Je pense notamment à l'Afghanistan, où les avancées qui avaient été enregistrées au cours des 20 dernières années ont été remises en question en quelques jours, comme l'ont encore rappelé dans un communiqué récent une trentaine de titulaires de mandat au titre des procédures spéciales. Leur constat est sans appel. Les femmes sont dorénavant systématiquement exclues des sphères sociales, économiques et politiques dans tout le pays. La promotion et la protection des droits des femmes et des filles constituent donc, plus que jamais, une priorité que ce Conseil doit continuer de faire valoir. Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, selon l'OMS, à l'échelle mondiale, un enfant sur quatre est victime de violences psychologiques et jusqu'à un milliard d'enfants subissent chaque année des violences physiques, sexuelles ou émotionnelles. Dans le milieu scolaire, ces phénomènes se retrouvent amplifiés par l'utilisation massive des réseaux sociaux par les jeunes. Consciente de cette réalité, la Principauté a souhaité se doter des outils nécessaires pour prévenir ces dérives et les sanctionner le cas échéant. C'est ainsi qu'a été promulguée le 3 décembre 2021 la loi relative à la lutte contre le harcèlement et la violence en milieu scolaire qui fixe un cadre préventif basé notamment sur la formation des personnels éducatifs et la mise en place de plans de prévention, de procédures de signalement et de mesures d'encadrement et de soutien aux victimes, auteurs et témoins de harcèlement. Il s'agit là d'une preuve supplémentaire de l'engagement de la Principauté en faveur des droits des enfants, engagement qu'elle porte également sur la scène internationale depuis de nombreuses années. Et je puis vous assurer qu'elle continuera de le faire, notamment dans le cadre des travaux de ce Conseil. Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, L'an dernier, le Conseil des droits de l'homme a adopté une résolution historique, reconnaissant pour la première fois au niveau international le droit à un environnement sûr, propre, sain et durable. La Principauté, qui a elle-même inscrit ce droit dans son Code de l'environnement, promulgué en 2017, a soutenu cette démarche et continuera de le faire. En effet, il est aujourd'hui reconnu que la jouissance d'un environnement de qualité est déterminante dans la réalisation d'un certain nombre de droits fondamentaux, au premier rang desquels figure le droit à la vie. Il suffit pour s'en convaincre de rappeler que la pollution de l'air est responsable de plus de 7 millions de décès prématurés chaque année, selon les données publiées par l'OMS. Nous devons donc redoubler d'efforts dans ces domaines, alors que nous célébrons cette année le 50e anniversaire de la création du PNUE. Mon pays estime que le Conseil des droits de l'homme et ses mécanismes ont un rôle de premier ordre à jouer à cet égard. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous soutenons financièrement depuis plusieurs années le travail du rapporteur spécial sur les droits de l'homme et l'environnement. Cet appui s'ajoute aux contributions volontaires non affectées que le gouvernement princier alloue chaque année au Haut Commissariat. Nous savons en effet que les activités du Haut Commissariat reposent majoritairement sur les contributions extra-budgétaires en raison du sous-financement chronique du pilier droit de l'homme dans le cadre du budget ordinaire des Nations Unies. Cette situation est bien évidemment regrettable. Mais ce Conseil n'a pas d'autre choix que d'en tenir compte dans le cadre de ses travaux, ce qui suppose notamment de mener à bien l'effort de rationalisation entamé depuis plusieurs années. Excellences, Mesdames, Messieurs, je vous remercie de votre attention et souhaite que les travaux de notre Conseil soient couronnés de succès au cours de cette session. Je vous remercie. Uh, it's my honor uh, to invite uh, His Excellency Mr. Sameh Hassan Shokri Selim, Minister for Foreign Affairs of Egypt, for video message. Sayyid Rais Majlis Hukuk al Insan, Sayyid al Mufawwad al Samiya al Hukuk al Insan, Sayyidat wa Sada. Awad an atakadam bi tahniya ila Rasa al Argentinia al Haliya. 
للمجلس والى اعضاء هيئه المكتب الجدد متمنيا لهم جميعا التوفيق في مهامهم كما اعرب على التقدير للمندوبه الدائمه لفيجي لما بذلته من جهد لضمان استدامه وكفاءه عمل المجلس خلال فتره رئاستها له. سيدات والساده تنعقد دورة المجلس بالتوازي مع العديد من التطورات ذات الصلة بتعزيز حقوق الإنسان والحريات الأساسية التي تشهدها مصر ترجمة لما نص عليه الدستور المصري واتساقا مع التزاماتها الدولية وذلك من خلال شراكة حقيقية مع المجتمع المدني بهدف تأسيس جمهورية جديدة تعلي قيم الديمقراطية ومبادئ حقوق الإنسان وسيادة القانون يتمتع فيها الجميع بحقوقهم وحرياتهم الأساسية دون تمييز لقد تكللت هذه الجهود مؤخرا باطلاق اول استراتيجيه وطنيه لحقوق الانسان تحت رعايه السيد رئيس الجمهوريه بمبادره وطنيه خالصه وبعد مشاورات مكثفه وموسعه مع منظمات المجتمع المدني ويهمني الاشاره في هذا السياق الى ان تعزيز حقوق الانسان عمليه تراكميه ومتواصله لا يمكن لاي دوله الادعاء ببلوغ نهايتها او ادعاء تحقيقها الكمال كما انه لا يوجد نمط موحد يمكن للجميع اتباعه بل تحدد كل دوله اولوياتها وسبل التعامل مع اي تحديات تواجهها على ضوء اختلاف الواقع والظروف التي تجابهها سيدات والساده تتبنى مصر مقربة شاملة لتعزيز حقوق الإنسان والحريات الأساسية حيث استطاعت أن تحقق تقدما ملحوظا على صعيد تعزيز الحقوق المدنية والسياسية والحريات الأساسية استنادا إلى المبادئ والالتزامات الدستورية والدولية من خلال تطوير البنية التشريعية والمؤسسية ذات الصلة بما يضمن لجميع ممارسة حقوقهم بدون تمييز بما في ذلك الحق في المشاركة في الحياة السياسية والعامة والحق في حرية الرأي والتعبير والحق في الحرية والسلامة الجسدية كما شهد الحق في تكوين الجمعيات تطورا كبيرا في مصر خلال الفترة الماضية ويأتي إعلان السيد رئيس الجمهورية عام 2022 عاما للمجتمع المدني كدليل على أهمية التي توليها الدولة المصرية للمجتمع المدني باعتباره شريكا أساسيا في عملية التنمية وحرصا على مد جسور الثقة والتعاون بين الحكومة والمجتمع المدني تقدمت الحكومة المصرية إلى مجلس النواب بتعديل تشريعي لمد مهلة توفيق الأوضاع التي نص عليها قانون العمل الأهلي ولائحته التنفيذية لضمان استفادة جميع المنظمات من التسهيلات والامتيازات التي يتيحها القانون هذا وفي إطار الاستعدادات الجارية لاستضافة مصر لمؤتمر الدول الأطراف في اتفاقية تغيير المناخ في دورته السابعة والعشرين نتطلع إلى مشاركة فعالة لمنظمات المجتمع المدني المعنية في هذا الحدث المناخي الكبير كما تتقدم مصر بخطى ثابتة على صعيد تعزيز الحق في حرية الدين والمعتقد وتبذل الحكومة بالتعاون مع المؤسسات الدينية جهودا حثيثة لإعلاء قيم المواطنة والتسامح والحوار ومكافحة التحريض على العنف والتمييز ومواجهة التطرف ودعاوي الكراهية ويتيح قانون تنظيم بناء وترميم الكنائس تسهيل إجراءات بناء الكنائس الجديدة وتم بموجبه توفيق أوضاع ما يزيد عن 2162 كنيسة ومبنى خدميا فضلا عن 74 كنيسة جديدة وبالتوازي مع ذلك تبذل الحكومة قطاري جهدها لضمان تمتع المواطنين بحقوقهم الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والثقافية وذلك في إطار استراتيجية وطنية تنموية شاملة تجسدها رؤية مصر 2030 فخصصت الموارد والطاقات وأولت مزيد من الجهد من أجل توفير السكن الملائم والبنية الأساسية ومد تطوير شبكات المياه والصرف الصحي والكهرباء والطرق وتحسين منظومتي الصحه والتعليم وتقديم الخدمات الاجتماعيه الاساسيه وتوفير برامج الحمايه الاجتماعيه المتكامله والتمكين الاقتصادي للمواطنين دون تمييز من خلال طرح العديد من المبادرات الرئاسيه الهامه مثل مبادره حياه كريمه وتكافل وكرامه و100 مليون صحه وتنميه الريف المصري وذلك بالتوازي مع ايلاء العنايه الواجبه لاصحاب الهمم وذوي القدرات الخاصه فضلا عن تبني خطة متكاملة للتخفيف من الاثار الاقتصادية والاجتماعية جراء جائحة كورونا كما تدعو مصر إلى تطبيق معايير العدالة والإنصاف في تقاسم الموارد وتوزيع اللقاحات وخاصة في الدول الأقل نموا التي عانت بشكل أكبر بعد انتشار الجائحة
كما تم اتخاذ العديد من اجراءات وتطوير التشريعات التي تهدف لتمكين المراه في كافه مناحي الحياه وحمايتها من التمييز والجرائم العنف والتحرش وختان الاناث وذلك في ضوء الاهميه التي توليها الدوله المصريه لتعزيز حقوق المراه ومكافحه كافه اشكال العنف والتمييز ضدها كما تحرص مصر على تنفيذ التزاماتها الدوليه ذات الصله بحقوق الانسان بما في ذلك من خلال التعاون مع اليات التعهديه وغيرها من الاليات التابعه لمجلس حقوق الانسان حيث تقدمت مصر خلال الفتره الماضيه بعدد من تقاريرها الوطنيه للاليات التعهديه وناقشت التقرير الوطني امام لجنه القضاء على كافه اشكال التمييز ضد المراه كما شارفت على الانتهاء من تقرير نصف المده الطوعي حول ما تم انجازه تنفيذا لتوصيه المجلس ذات الصله سيدات والسادة إن العمل متعدد الأطراف وفي القلب منه مجال حقوق الإنسان يتعين أن يستند إلى التوافق والحوار والبعد عن التسييس والانتقائية من خلال تبادل الخبرات وأفضل الممارسات وتقديم المساعدة الفنية وفقا للأولويات الوطنية إننا أحوج ما نكون إلى النأي عن تصفية الحسابات السياسية وتبادل الاتهامات وفرض رؤى ومفاهيم خلافية تكبل العمل الحقوقي وتعرقل تحقيق أهدافه المرجوة كما نطالب بتوخي الدقة عند تناول قضايا حقوق الإنسان والابتعاد عن المعلومات التي تروج دون سند أو إثبات لتحقيق أهداف لا تمت بأي صلة لتعزيز حقوق الإنسان وإنما لتشويه الصورة وممارسة الضغوط السياسية سيدات والسادة ختاما إننا نتطلع لقيام هذا المجلس بدوره في مساعدة الدول على ضمان تمتع مواطنيها بجميع حقوق الإنسان دون تمييز وترسيخ التسامح والتعايش السلمي ونبذ التمييز والعنصرية وخطاب القرهية فلا يمكن تجزئة تلك الحقوق وإعلاء بعضها على البعض فالمقاربة الشاملة التي تستند إلى الحوار الموضوعي وإلى احترام الخصوصيات والاختلافات الدينية والثقافية والقيمية للمجتمعات دون استعلاء هي السبيل الأمثل للمضي قدما ومعا نحو مستقبل أفضل للجميع وشكرا على حسن المتابعة Now I have the honor to give the floor to Her Excellency Ms. Jan Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization. Excellency, you have the floor. Distinguished delegates, I have the privilege of addressing the Council at this critical moment on behalf of the only global intergovernmental organization exclusively devoted to promoting the rule of law. Over the past decade, we have seen a growing backlash against human rights, multilateralism, and international solidarity. The COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated these trends, further deepening inequalities, exacerbating fragilities, and exposing major trust deficits in governance. Just this week, the scourge of war returned to Europe as Ukraine joined the long and growing list of global crisis spots, including Afghanistan, Myanmar, and the Sahel. The International Development Law Organization works in all regions of the world, including the countries I mentioned. I am here today to share one simple message. If we want to protect human rights and promote peace and sustainable development, we must invest in the rule of law. Allow me to offer three reasons why. First, human rights and the rule of law have a symbiotic relationship. Neither can survive long without the other. The women and men who drafted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights understood that rights without remedies are little more than paper promises. In its preamble, the Universal Declaration calls for human rights to be protected by the rule of law. We see this truth in conflict zones and humanitarian crises around the world, where the rule of law is absent or has broken down, and where some of the most serious violations of human rights take place. At the same time, human rights provide the law with its moral content, helping distinguish the rule of law from rule by law. Without human rights, laws and institutions become mere instruments in the exercise of power. In a growing number of countries, justice institutions are being ignored, suborned, or undermined. Where the legal system should work to level the playing field and make even the least powerful 
feel that their voice is heard, it is instead used to promote the interests of the most powerful and influential, generating popular resentment and alienation. To help rebuild trust and ensure that rights are respected, Idealo's approach to the rule of law puts people and their human rights at the center. It incorporates both substantive justice and due process. We work from the bottom up to empower justice seekers and arm them with the knowledge they need to engage with laws and institutions that affect their lives. In the Sahel, for instance, we're working through community platforms called Cadre de 